whatsoever exists anywhere within mental phenomena. To comprehend the true nature of the Namakanthas, one must discover the fundamental principles underlying them and understand them deeply and clearly with wisdom. It's not enough that we anticipate results or speculate about their nature, as is the common tendency of most people, people who just prefer to do guesswork. A theoretical understanding, acquired from learning, differs from a genuine understanding based on wisdom, as the earth differs from the sky. People whose understanding is founded upon knowledge gained through memorization are very preoccupied with their own ideas, always assuming that they are highly intelligent. In truth, they are completely deluded. Consequently, they become overly conceited and are reluctant to accept help and advice from anyone. This arrogant tendency is quite apparent when a group of scholars discusses tamma, each one constantly trying to champion his own intellectual theories. These meetings usually degenerate into verbal sparring matches, spurred on by this common attitude of self-importance, until everyone, regardless of age, race, gender, or clan, forgets to observe the proper etiquette expected of such civilized people. Understanding, based on wisdom, is ready to uproot all types of speculative views that continually manifest our conceit. Wisdom is prepared to ferret out and expose these erroneous views, penetrating every niche until the whole edifice of these kilesas comes crashing down. There is not one kilesa that can successfully withstand the penetration of the highest degree of mindfulness and wisdom. In the Tamas arsenal, mindfulness and wisdom are the foremost weapons, Never have the Kilesas been intrepid enough to defeat them. The Lord Puta became the supreme teacher because of mindfulness and wisdom. His disciples became Arahants because of mindfulness and wisdom. Because of mindfulness and wisdom, they were able to see with insight into the true nature of things. They didn't uproot their Kilesas by using learning, supposition, or mere guesswork. In the initial stages of practice, concepts recalled from memory can be used to delineate the boundaries of the way forward. But one must exercise great caution, lest this kind of conjecture cause delusion appearing in the guise of genuine truth. When the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples proclaimed the truth of his teaching to the world, they were proclaiming the way of wisdom, the way that brings us to see the true nature of all phenomena. We practitioners of meditation must be extremely careful that the master of speculation doesn't sneak in and conjure up his tricks in place of wisdom. If we aren't, we will be led to mistake mere concepts for true understanding, without ever removing a single kilesa from our hearts. We may find ourselves inundated with knowledge about salvation, yet unable to save ourselves. This is exactly what the Lord put to meant when he advised the people of Galama not to believe in speculation or conjecture, and not to believe teachings handed down from the past or teachers who are considered to be reliable but to believe that the principles of truth can be discovered within themselves, by the wisdom within themselves. This is the surest kind of knowledge there is. The Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples didn't need anyone to validate the authenticity of their attainment, for Sandirtiko is right there within everyone who practices the Buddha's teaching in the right way. Atsariya Man said that when he came to this last level of advanced practice, he became so intrigued with it that he lost all sense of time. He completely forgot the time of day, forgot to sleep, and then forgot how tired he was. Fearless and unshakable, his chetta was constantly in position to oppose every type of kilesa, ready to excise them by their roots. From the time he left Wat Sidi Luang in Tsang Mai, he did not allow a single day to pass in vain, and before long he reached the point of ultimate understanding. At the moment he set off alone, his chitta began to express the dynamic characteristics of a daring thoroughbred stallion. It wanted to soar high and glide through the air, dive underground and then shoot up into the sky again. It felt inclined to venture out to experience the many countless variety of phenomena in the universe. He felt as if his chitta was about to dig up and remove all of the kilesas in a single instant. The adventurous nature of his mindfulness and wisdom had long been hemmed in by social obligations. They were unable to move freely about in their preferred domain. The observation and analysis of just those things Atariyaman had wanted to know about for such a long time. 
Now he was blessed, blessed with the opportunity of leaping away and vanishing, finally able to give mindfulness and wisdom the chance to display their considerable prowess as they explored throughout the three worlds of existence. Atariyaman investigated thoroughly, internally and externally. His mindfulness and wisdom penetrated all around, constantly moving in and out, up and down, all the while resolving issues, detaching himself, and then letting go as he cut, slashed, and pulverized every manner of falsehood with all the strength he could muster. Feeling unbound as a giant fish swimming happily in the ocean, he looked back on his entire past and saw only dark, obstructive times lurking there, fraught with all kinds of dangerous, inevitable consequences. His heart beat faster at the prospect of finding a way to save himself. Looking to the future, he saw before him only a majestic, empty expanse of brilliant illumination, a view that completely surpasses any conventional understanding and is utterly beyond all description, so much so that I find it difficult to elaborate any further for the benefit of the reader. I sincerely regret that I am unable to do justice to all the inspiring things Atsariyaman said. Atsariyaman sat in meditation late that night, not too long after supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom had reached the peak of their performance. Like a wheel of tamma, they moved in unison as they rotated non-stop around the chitta and everything related to it. He was residing at the base of a mountain, in a broad, open area, covered with enormous flat rocks. Clear, open space surrounded him as he sat at the foot of a solitary tree, the only tree in that entire area. This tree had abundant cool shade during the day, so he sometimes went to meditate under it. I regret that I cannot recall what type of tree it was or its exact location. As Atsariyaman described this amazing event, I was so thoroughly overwhelmed by the magnitude of his achievement that I failed to remember any of the pertinent details, what district and township he was in, or even the name of the mountain range. Hearing him talk of his great victory, I couldn't help thinking about myself. Was I going to simply waste my birth as a human being, carelessly throwing away the wonderful opportunity it gave me? Did I have enough spiritual potential to one day succeed in realizing that same supreme tamma, reflecting in this manner? I forgot everything else. I had no idea that, some day, I would be writing his biography. At dusk, Atsariyaman began walking meditation, focusing on Paticca Samuppada as the theme of primary relevance to this level of contemplation. Starting with Avidja Patsaya Sankara, he became so intrigued by the subject of dependent origination that he was soon investigating it to the exclusion of all else. By the time he sat down, at about nine o'clock, his mind was concentrated solely on scrutinizing Avidta, examining each of the interdependent conditions through to the logical conclusion, then reversing the order to arrive back at Avidta. Contemplating thus, he deliberated back and forth, over and over, inside the chitta, the focal point where birth, death, and kilesas converge with the principal cause, Avidta. Seated in meditation late that night, the crucial moment had arrived. The battle lines were drawn. Supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom, the razor-sharp weapons, against Avita, an enemy especially adroit at repulsing their advances and counter-attacking, leaving its opponents in total disarray. Since time immemorial, no one has dared to challenge its might, allowing Avidta to reign supreme and unopposed over the kingdom of birth and death inside the hearts of all living beings. But at 3 a.m., that night when Atsariyaman launched his final all-out assault, the result was the total destruction of the king's mighty throne and the complete overthrow of his reign in the kingdom of birth and death. Suddenly impotent and deprived of room to maneuver, the king could not maintain his sovereignty. At that moment, Avicca perished, victim to a lightning strike of magnificent brilliance. Atsariyaman described how that fateful moment was accompanied by a tremor that appeared to shake the entire universe. 
Celestial beings throughout this vast expanse immediately paid tribute to his supreme accomplishment, roaring an exclamation of approval that reverberated across the sentient universe and proclaimed the appearance of another disciple of the Tathagata in the world. Overjoyed to have witnessed this event, they were eager to offer their congratulations. Human beings, however, were unaware of the momentous event that had just taken place. Occupied with worldly pleasures, they were too oblivious to care that, only a moment before, the supreme Tamma had arisen in the heart of a fellow human being. When the awesome moment passed, what remained was Visuddhi Tamma, this pure Tamma, the true natural state of the citta, suffused Atsariya Man's body and mind and extended its light in all directions. The experience aroused an indescribable feeling of great awe and wonder. His customary compassion for the world virtually disappeared, and with it, his interest in teaching other people. He was convinced that this supreme tamma was far too profound and overwhelming in its greatness for people to ever truly understand. So he became disheartened in this respect, feeling disinclined to teach others. He felt it was enough to simply enjoy this wonderful tamma alone, while still living in the midst of the conventional world. Atsariyaman reflected at length that night on the beneficence of the Lord Buddha. This supreme teacher, having fully realized the truth, taught people who were receptive to his message so that they too could attain genuine deliverance. It was obvious that not a single falsehood was concealed anywhere within the Buddha's teaching. He spent the rest of that night tirelessly paying homage to the supreme virtues of the Lord Buddha. Atsariyaman had always been compassionate. He was deeply sympathetic to the spiritual state of fellow human beings. But his citta had just attained a clarity that was so extraordinary in its brilliance and purity that he felt he could not possibly explain the true nature of this tamma to others. Even if he tried, ordinary people with kilesas could never hope to attain this exalted state of mind. More than that, hearing him speak in such superlatives, they could accuse him of insanity for daring to teach the world something that no good, sane person would ever discuss. He believed it unlikely that there would be enough sympathetic people to generate his enthusiasm for teaching. He was free to live a life of solitude for the remainder of his years. It was sufficient that he had fully realized his lifelong ambition. He saw no reason to burden himself with difficult teaching responsibilities. It could end up being an example of good causes with bad effects. That is, his compassionate intentions could well turn into harmful results for contemptuous people. Such was Atsariyaman's frame of mind shortly after attaining the Supreme Tamma, a time when he had yet to focus on the wider picture. Eventually, his thoughts gathered on the Lord Buddha's guiding role in revealing the correct path of practice. Reviewing his attainment of Tamma and the path he took, he saw that he, too, was a human being in the world just like everyone else, and undistinguished from others by any special characteristic that would make him the only person capable of understanding this Tamma. Certainly, others with strong spiritual tendencies were capable of this understanding. By failing to broaden his perspective, his initial outlook had tended to disparage the spiritual tendencies of his fellow human beings, which was unfair. The Lord Buddha did not reveal the path of practice leading to Magga, Pala, and Nibbana for the benefit of only one individual. This revelation was a gift for the whole world, both his contemporaries and succeeding generations. In total, the number of those who have reached Magga, Pala, and Nibbana following the Buddha's teaching is enormous beyond reckoning. In this respect, Atsariyaman's achievement was definitely not unique, though he initially overlooked the capacity of others for similar achievement. Carefully reviewing all aspects of the Buddha's teaching, he saw its relevance for people the world over, and its accessibility to anyone willing to practice correctly. These thoughts gave him a renewed desire to help others. Once again, he felt comfortable with the idea of teaching people who came to him for guidance, provided they were receptive to his instructions. For in teaching Tamma, the teacher has an obligation to treat Tamma with respect by refusing to instruct anyone who is disrespectful or indifferent to what is being taught. Some people can't help making noise while listening to Tamma. 
They are obviously apathetic to the value of the tamma and the opportunity they have for hearing it. They appear oblivious to where they are or how they are expected to behave at that time. Such people see tamma as something quite ordinary. They have adopted a typically worldly attitude of being thoroughly indifferent to tamma, to the monastery, and to the monks. They see the whole lot as just commonplace. Under such circumstances, it is unconscionable to teach tamma. The teacher is then censurable, and the audience fails to gain any real benefit. Before he realized the supreme tamma and then made it available to others, Atsariyaman nearly gave up his life in the forests and mountains as he struggled relentlessly with every ounce of strength. After such heroic effort, the notion of bringing this precious tamma and having it simply dissipate in the ocean was inconceivable. When has that ever happened? After all, a monk is the type of person who considers everything scrupulously before he acts. Tamma exists in a class by itself, so special attention must be paid to when and how it is presented to a public audience. Should these considerations be neglected in the presentation of Tamma, the outcome might well prove harmful. Tamma is taught for the purpose of helping people in the world. Much like a doctor, desiring the well-being of his patients, prescribes medications to cure sickness and relieve pain. But when people are unwilling to accept help, why should a monk worry about teaching them? If he really has true tamma in his heart, he is perfectly content to live in solitude. It's unnecessary for him to seek students in order to alleviate the discomfort and stress caused by an irrepressible urge to teach others the way, an urge which merely adds to a person's sense of discontent anyway. Lacking sincerity in the tamma that the Lord put strove so earnestly to realize, such a person, though he calls himself a teacher, is one only in name. Atsariyaman said he had complete confidence that he was mentally and physically attuned to living alone because his heart was supremely tranquil, possessing genuine tamma. Tamma means tranquility. A heart filled with tamma is a heart whose serenity transcends everything. Atsariyaman naturally preferred living in forested mountain areas since these places were conducive to dwelling sublimely with tamma. He considered teaching others to be a special situation. It was an obligation he performed occasionally, and not an actual necessity, as was living by Tamma, an essential aspect of his life to the very end. Otherwise, he would not have enjoyed a convenient daily existence. When we possess Tamma, understand Tamma, and abide in Tamma, we are unperturbed by things in the world, and so do not go searching for Dukkha. Where Tamma abides, there is happiness and tranquility. According to natural principles, Tamma abides in the hearts of those who practice it, so happiness and tranquility arise in the hearts of those practitioners. It cannot arise in any other place. Atsariyaman was always extremely circumspect when teaching Tamma. He never taught indiscriminately, for Tamma itself is never indiscriminate. He never practiced Tamma in a random fashion, but always followed well-established principles, practicing within the confines of the noble tradition recorded in the Buddhist scriptures. Understanding did not arise in him in a random fashion either. It arose in progressive stages following the principles of truth. Atsariyaman advised practicing monks to guard against being indiscriminate by always keeping the strictures of the teaching and the discipline in mind, since they represent the Buddha and the path of practice he followed. He stressed that the monk who maintains magga and pala and maintains the teaching and discipline is one who is humble and unassuming, and always careful not to let his actions, his speech, or his thoughts go astray. Practicing thus, he will be able to stand on his own indefinitely. Having addressed the issue of teaching Tamma to others, Atsariyaman again turned his attention to the nature of his inner Tamma. He said that the moment of realization, when Tamma arises in all its glory within the Chitta, is a moment that's completely unimaginable. Tamma's true nature reveals itself in a totally unexpected manner, as it is inconceivable and impossible to speculate about beforehand. At that moment, he felt as though he had died and been born again into a new life, a uniquely amazing death and rebirth. The quality of awareness, intrinsic to this transformation, was a state of knowing that he had never before experienced, even though it had always been there unchanging. Suddenly, then, 
it became apparent, spectacular, and inconceivably amazing. It was this quintessential quality that caused Acharya Man to consider, somewhat unconventionally, that it would not be possible to teach others this tamma, because they would never be able to truly understand it. Since his early days of practice, Acharya Man always possessed a very dynamic character. That distinguishing characteristic was evident at the moment of his final attainment, which was so unforgettable for him that he would later tell this story to inspire his disciples. Once his chitta had completely overthrown the cycle of repeated birth and death, it appeared to make three revolutions circling around the newly arisen Vivarta Chitta. Upon conclusion of the first revolution, the Pali term Lopo, cutting off, arose together with its essential meaning. At that moment, the chitta had completed the function of totally excluding all vestiges of relative conventional reality. Upon conclusion of the second revolution, the Pali term Vimutti, absolute freedom, arose together with its essential meaning. At that moment, the chitta had completed the function of attaining total release. Upon conclusion of the third revolution, the Pali term Analeo, total detachment, arose together with its essential meaning. At that moment, the chitta had completed the function of wholly severing all attachments. Chitta and tamma were then one and the same. Eka chitta, eka tamma. The true nature of the chitta is synonymous with the true nature of tamma. Unlike relative conventional reality, there is no duality. This is vimutti tamma, pure and simple. It is absolute in its singularity and devoid of any trace of relative conventional reality within. This pure tamma is fully realized only once. It never requires further perfection. The Lord Putta and the Arahants become fully enlightened only once. The chitta and tamma being exactly of the same nature, they have no need to search further. The kantas that make up their conventional existence are then just kantas, pure and simple. They contain no defiling elements. The kantas of an arahant remain the same as before, for the attainment of nibbana does not alter them in any way. For example, those kantas responsible for thought processes continue to perform this function at the behest of their boss, the chitta. By nature, the release of vimutti is already freed of any intermingling with the kantas, the chitta and the kantas each existing as separate, distinct phenomena, each one true within its own natural state. They no longer seek to deceive or disrupt one another. Both sides exist peacefully in their distinct natural states, performing their specific functions until, at death, each constituent element goes its own separate way. When the body finally dies, the purified chitta attains yata dipo chanibbuto. Just as the flame in a lamp is extinguished when all of the fuel is exhausted, so too goes the chitta according to its true nature. Relative, conventional realities like the kantas are no longer involved with the purified chitta beyond that point. In truth, nothing of the relative, conventional world accompanies this chitta to create a cause for coming to birth in the future. Such was the essence of tamma that arose in Atsaryaman's chitta at the moment it completed the three revolutions expressing its dynamic character. That was the final occasion when the relative reality of the kantas and the absolute freedom of the chitta joined forces before finally separating to go their separate ways forever. Throughout the remainder of that night, Acharyaman considered with a sense of dismay how pathetically ignorant he had been in the past, being dragged endlessly from one existence to another, like a puppet. He wept as he thought of how he finally came upon a pool of crystal-clear, wondrous-tasting water. He had reached Nong Ao, that sparkling pool of pure tamma that the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples encountered and then proclaimed to the world over 2,500 years ago. Having at long last encountered it himself, he tirelessly paid heartfelt homage, prostrating himself over and over again to the Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha. 
Should people have seen him then, tears streaming down his face as he prostrated over and over again, surely they would have assumed that this monk was suffering immensely, shedding tears so profusely. They probably would have suspected him of beseeching the guardian spirits, living in all directions, to help ease his pain, or else of being on the verge of madness, for his behavior was extremely unusual. In fact, he had just arrived at the truth of the Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha with utmost clarity, as epitomized in the maxim, He who sees the Tamma sees the Tathagata, and thus abides in the presence of the Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha. Our Tsariyaman was simply engaged in the kind of conduct befitting someone who is overwhelmed by a sincere sense of gratitude. That night, celestial devas of all realms and terrestrial devas from every direction paid tribute in a resounding exclamation of approval that reverberated throughout the world systems and then gathered to listen to Atsariyaman expound the Tamma. But being still fully engaged in his immediate commitment to the supreme Tamma, he was not yet ready to receive visitors. So he signaled to the assembled devas that he was occupied, indicating that they should return on a later occasion. The day was then left, thoroughly delighted that they had seen a Visuddhi Deva on the very night when he attained Nibbana. At dawn, Atsariyaman rose from his meditation seat, reflecting still on the unforgettably amazing Tamma. Thinking back to the moment of final release, he recalled the three revolutions together with the profound subtlety of their essential meanings. He also reflected with appreciation on the tree that had sheltered him as he sat in meditation, and the local villagers who had always supported him with food and other basic needs. At first, Al-Tariyaman considered foregoing his morning alms round that day. He reckoned that the happiness he felt from his attainment was all that he needed for sustenance. But he could not help feeling compassion for the local villagers who had done so much for him. So, while he had no desire to eat, he nevertheless went on alms round. Entering the village that morning, he fixed his gaze firmly on the people, having paid little attention to them before. As he gazed intently at the people who came forward to put food in his bowl, and at those milling around the houses with children at play in the dirt, he experienced an extraordinary sense of love and compassion for them all. The whole village appeared to be especially bright and cheerful that day, with smiling faces beaming at him as people saw him come. Upon return at his mountain retreat, his heart felt replete with tamma, while his body felt fully satisfied, even though he had yet to eat. Neither body nor chitta was the least bit hungry. Nonetheless, he forced himself to eat for the body's sake, since it requires nourishment to sustain its life. The food, however, appeared to have no taste. The taste of tamma alone permeated the whole of his body and his heart. As the Buddha said, the taste of tamma surpasses all other tastes. Eager to hear tamma, all the devas came to visit Atsariyaman the following night. Both terrestrial devas and celestial devas arrived in groups, hailing from nearly every direction. Each group described the amazing radiance caused by the incredible power of his tamma the previous night. They compared it to a magnificent tremor that passed through all the celestial abodes in the vast realms of all the world systems. This tremor was accompanied by a fantastic incandescence that rendered the length and breadth of the upper and lower realms ineffably translucent. They told him, Those of us with intuitive knowledge were able to see unobstructed throughout the entire universe due to the luminous quality of the Tamma pouring forth from your person, Venerable Sir. Its brilliance was far more radiant than the light of a hundred or even a thousand suns, it is truly unbearable to think that there were those who missed seeing such a wonder. Only humans and animals, living futile earth-bound existences, could be so incredibly blind and unperceptive as to have been unaware of last night's splendor. Devas everywhere were so stunned, astonished, and utterly amazed that they let out an emphatic exclamation of approval to express their exultation at the perfection of your achievement. If it were not such an absolutely amazing achievement, how could knowledge of it have been so widespread? You, venerable sir, are a person of saintly virtue, majestic power, and vast influence. 
capable of being a refuge to a great number of beings in numerous realms of existence. All will be able to find blessed comfort in the shadow of your greatness. Beings of every class, be they humans, devas or brahmas, living underwater, on land or in the air, are rarely fortunate enough to encounter such perfection. We devas consider ourselves especially blessed to have met you, venerable sir, having the precious opportunity to pay our respects to you and to receive your beneficent teaching. We are grateful to you for expounding the tamma to brighten our hearts, leading us on the path of practice so that we can gradually become aware of how to improve ourselves. When the assemblies of devas finally returned to their respective realms, Atsariyaman began to reflect on the tremendous difficulties he had experienced in his effort to realize this tamma. Because his practice had entailed such exceptional hardship, he regarded it as tamma at the threshold of death. Had he not come so close to death while struggling to reach freedom from dukkha, then surely he would never have attained that freedom. The Spiritual Partner Sitting in meditation after his final attainment, Atsariyaman recalled a certain personal matter from his past, one which he had not taken much interest in before. Here I would like to tell a story relevant to Atsariyaman's past. I feel it would be a shame to leave out such an intriguing story, especially as this type of relationship may be following every one of you like a shadow, even though you are unaware of it. Should the story be deemed in any way unseemly, please blame the author for not being properly circumspect. As you may already have guessed, this is a private matter that was discussed only by Atsariyaman and his inner circle of disciples. I have tried to suppress the urge to write about it here, but the more I tried to suppress it, the stronger this urge became. So I finally gave in, and after writing it down, the urge gradually subsided. I must confess that I am at fault here, but I hope the reader forgives me. Hopefully, it will provide everyone caught in the perpetual cycle of birth and death something worthwhile to think about. This story concerns Atsariyaman's long-time spiritual partner. Atsariyaman said that in previous lives, he and his spiritual partner had both made a solemn vow to work together toward the attainment of Buddhahood. During the years prior to his final attainment, she occasionally came to visit him while he was in Samadhi. On those occasions, he gave her a brief tamma talk, then sent her away. She always appeared to him as a disembodied consciousness. Unlike beings from most realms of existence, she had no discernible form. When he inquired about her formless state, she replied that she was so worried about him, she had not yet decided to take up existence in any specific realm. She feared that he would forget their relationship, their mutual resolve to attain Buddhahood in the future. So out of concern and a sense of disappointment, she felt compelled to come and check on him from time to time. Atsariyaman told her then that he had already given up that vow, resolving instead to practice for Nibbana in this lifetime. He had no wish to be born again, which was equivalent to carrying all the misery he had suffered in past lives indefinitely into the future. Although she had never revealed her feelings, she remained worried about their relationship, and her longing for him never waned. So once in a long while she paid him a visit, but on this occasion it was Atsariyaman who thought of her, being concerned about her plight, since they had gone through so many hardships together in previous lives. Contemplating this affair after his attainment, it occurred to him that he would like to meet her so they could reach a new understanding. He wanted to explain matters to her, and thus remove any lingering doubts or anxieties regarding their former partnership. Late that very night, and soon after this thought occurred to him, his spiritual partner arrived in her familiar formless state. Atsariyaman began by asking her about her present realm of existence. He wanted to know why she had no discernible form like beings from other celestial realms, and what exactly was her present condition. The formless being answered that she lived in one of the minor ethereal states of being in the vast sentient universe. She reiterated that she was waiting in that realm because of anxiety concerning him. Having become aware of his desire to meet her, she came to him that night. Ordinarily, she didn't dare to visit him very often. 
Though sincerely wanting to meet him, she always felt shy and hesitant. In truth, her visits were in no way damaging to either of them, for they were not of such a nature as to be harmful. But still, her long-standing affection for him made her hesitant about coming. Atsaryaman had also told her not to visit too often, for although not harmful, such visits could nevertheless become an emotional impediment, thus slowing his progress. The heart being very sensitive by nature, it could well be affected by subtle emotional attachments, which could then interfere with the practice of meditation. Convinced that this was true, she seldom came to visit him. She was quite aware that he had severed his connection to birth and death, including former friends and relatives, and of course the spiritual partner who was counting on him, with no lingering regrets whatsoever. After all, it was an event that had a traumatic effect throughout the world systems. But rather than rejoice with delight, as she would have done in the past when they were together, this time she felt slighted, prompting an unorthodox reaction. She thought instead that he was being irresponsible, neglecting to consider the loyal spiritual companion who had shared his suffering, struggling together with him through so many lifetimes. She felt devastated now, left alone in misfortune, clutching Dukkha but unable to let go. He had already gone beyond Dukkha, leaving her behind to endure the burden of suffering. The more she thought about it, the more she felt like one bereft of wisdom who, nonetheless, wanted to reach up to touch the moon and the stars. In the end, she fell back to earth clutching her misery, unable to find a way out of such grievous misfortune. Despondent, hapless being that she was, and struggling to endure her misery, she pleaded with him for assistance. I am desperately disappointed. Where can I possibly find happiness? I so want to reach up and touch the moon and the stars in the sky. It's just terrible and so painful. You yourself are like the moon and the stars up in the sky, shining brightly in every direction. Having established yourself in Tamma, your existence is never bleak, never dreary. You're so completely content, and your aura radiates throughout every part of the universe. If I am still fortunate enough, please... Kindly show me the way of Tamma. Please help me bring forth the bright, pure knowledge of wisdom, releasing me quickly from the cycle of repeated birth and death, to follow you in the attainment of Nirvana, so that I will not have to endure this agony much longer. May this vow be strong enough to produce the results my heart desires, allowing me to attain the grace of enlightenment as soon as possible. Convulsed with sobs of anguish, such was the fervent plea of that sorrowful, formless being as she expressed her hopes of gaining enlightenment. Atsariyaman replied that his intention in wishing to see her was not to elicit regrets about the past. People who wish each other well should not think in that way. Haven't you practiced the four Brahma-viharas, Mitta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upekka? The formless spirit replied, I have practiced them for so long that I can't help thinking about the closeness we once shared practicing them together. When a person saves only himself, as you have, it is quite natural for those left behind to be disappointed. I am in misery because I have been abandoned without any concern for my welfare. I still can't see any possibility of easing my pain. He cautioned her, whether practicing on your own or in concert with others, Goodness is developed for the purpose of reducing anxiety and suffering within yourself, not for increasing them until, being agitated, you become all upset. Isn't that right? Yes, but the tendency of people with kilesas is to somehow muddle through, not knowing which path is the right one for a smooth, safe passage. We don't know if what we are doing is right or wrong, or whether the results will be happiness or suffering. We know the pain in our hearts but we don't know the way out of it. So we are left to fret about our misfortune, as you see me doing now. Atsariyaman said that the formless spirit was adamant in her complaints about him. She accused him of making his escape alone, showing no pity for her, she who for so long had struggled together with him to go beyond Dukkha. 
She complained that he had made no effort to assist her so that she too could gain release from suffering. He tried to console her. When two people eat food together at the same table, inevitably one will be full before the other. It's not possible for both to be fully satiated at the same moment. Take the case of the Lord Buddha and his former spouse, Yasodhara. Although for many ages they had jointly developed goodness of all kinds, the Lord Buddha was the first to transcend Dukkha, returning then to teach his former spouse, so that later she also crossed over to the other shore. You should consider this lesson carefully and learn from it, instead of complaining about the person who is right now trying his best to find a way to help you. I am earnestly searching for a means to help you cross over, yet you accuse me of being heartless and irresponsible. Such thoughts are very inappropriate. They will merely increase the discomfort for both of us. You should change your attitude, following the example of the Lord Putta's former spouse, an excellent example for everyone, and one giving rise to true happiness. My reason for meeting you is to assist you, not to drive you away. I have always supported your development in Tamma. To say that I have abandoned you and no longer care for your welfare is simply not true. My advice to you emanates from a heart whose loving kindness and compassion are absolutely pure. If you follow this advice, practicing it to the best of your ability, I will rejoice in your progress. And should you receive completely satisfactory results, I will rest contented in equanimity. Our original aspiration to achieve Buddhahood was made for the express purpose of crossing beyond the cycle of rebirth. My subsequent desire to attain the status of Sawaka instead was actually a desire aimed toward the same goal, a state free of gilesas and asava, free of all dukkha, the supreme happiness, nibbana. As I've followed the righteous path through many different lives, including my present status as a Buddhist monk, I have always done my utmost to keep in touch with you. Throughout this time, I have taught you as best I could with the immense loving compassion that I feel for you. Never was there a moment when I thought of forsaking you to seek only my own salvation. My thoughts were constantly full of concern, full of sympathy for you. I have always hoped to free you from the misery of birth and samsara, leading you in the direction of Nibbana. Your abnormal reaction, feeling offended because you suppose that I have abandoned you without any concern for your well-being, is of no benefit to either of us. From now on, you should refrain from such thinking. Don't allow these thoughts to arise and trample all over your heart, for they will bring only endless misery in their wake, a result incompatible with my objective, as I strive with heartfelt compassion to help you out. Escaping without a care? Where have I escaped to? And who is it I don't care about? At this moment I am doing my utmost to give you every possible assistance. Doesn't everything I've taught you arise solely out of such compassionate concern as I am showing you right now? The constant encouragement I have provided comes straight from a heart full to the brim with a compassion that exceeds all the water in the great oceans, a compassion that pours forth unsparingly, without concern that it might run dry. Please understand that helping you has always been my intention, and accept this Tamma teaching that I offer. If you just trust me, and practice accordingly, you will experience the fruits of inner happiness for yourself. From the day I first ordained as a monk, I have sincerely practiced the way of Tamma. Never for a moment have I thought ill of anyone. My motive in wanting to meet with you was not to deceive you or cause you harm, but to assist you as best I can with all my heart. If you refuse to trust me, it will be difficult for you to find anyone else so worthy of your complete faith. You said you were aware of the universe trembling that night. That trembling, do you think it was caused by the tumma of deception arising in the world? Is that why you're so hesitant about taking to heart the advice I have so graciously offered you? If you understand that tumma is indeed the tumma of truth, then you should consider the trembling of the universe that night as a decisive factor in your faith, and take comfort in the fact that you still have great resources of merit. You are still able to listen to a timely exposition of Tamma, even though your birth in that formless realm of existence should render such a thing impossible. I consider it my good fortune to be able to teach you now. You should feel proud of your own good fortune in having someone to come and rescue you from the hopeless gloom that your misguided thinking has caused. If you can think positively like this, I shall be very pleased.
Such thinking will not allow Dukkha to bind you so tightly that you can't find a way out. It won't allow Tamma to be seen as something mundane or compassionate concern to be seen as something malevolent. As she listened to Acharya Man present these reasoned arguments with such loving compassion, his spiritual partner felt as though she was being bathed in a stream of celestial water. Gradually, she regained her composure. Enchanted by his discourse, her mind soon became calm, her manner respectful. When he finished speaking, she admitted her mistake. My affection and my hopeless yearning for you have caused so much trouble. I believed that you had discarded me, going your own way, which left me feeling neglected. I became terribly disappointed. I couldn't stop thinking how useless and rejected I felt, with no one to turn to. But now that I have received the light of Tamma, my heart is cool and contented. I can now put down the burden of misery that I have been carrying, for your Tamma is like a divine nectar washing over my heart, cleansing it and making it bright. Please, forgive me whatever wrong I have done to you through my ignorance. I am determined to be more careful in the future. Never shall I make such a mistake again. When she finished speaking, Acharyaman advised her to take birth in a more appropriate realm of existence, telling her to cease worrying about the past. Respectfully, she promised to follow his advice, then made one final request. Once I have taken birth in a suitable realm, may I come and listen to your advice as before? Please give me your blessing for this. Once Atsaryaman had granted her request, she immediately vanished. The formless spirit having departed, Atsaryaman's chitta withdrew from Samati. It was nearly 5 a.m. and almost light. He had not rested the entire night. Having begun sitting in Samati at around 8 p.m., he had spoken with the formless spirit for many hours into the night. Not long afterwards, the same spirit came to visit him again. This time she came in the bodily form of a beautiful deva, although in deference to the especially revered monk she was visiting, she was not adorned in the ornamental style customary of the devas. Upon arriving, she explained to him her new situation. After listening to your explanation, which removed all my doubts and relieved me of the misery that was tormenting me, I came to birth in the Tawatingsa heavenly realm, a celestial sphere full of delightful pleasures, all of which I now enjoy as a result of the goodness we perform together as human beings. Although I experience this pleasant existence as a consequence of my own good deeds, I can't help remembering that you, Venerable Sir, were the one who initially encouraged me to do good. On my own, I would never have had the wisdom capable of accomplishing this to my complete satisfaction. Feeling fortunate enough to be reborn in heavenly splendor, I am wholly contented and no longer angry or resentful. As I reflect back on the immense kindness you've always shown me, it becomes apparent to me how important it is for us to choose discreetly in our lives, concerning everything from our work to our food to our friends and companions, both male and female. Such discretion is crucial for leading a smooth, untroubled existence. This is especially true when choosing a spouse to depend on, for better or for worse. Choosing a spouse merits special attention, for we share everything with that person, even our very breath. Every happiness and every sorrow along the way will necessarily affect both parties. Those who have a good partner, even though they may be inadequate in terms of their intelligence, their temperament, or their behavior, are still blessed to have someone who can guide and encourage them in dealing with all their affairs, both their secular affairs, which promote peace and stability in the family, and their spiritual affairs, which nourish the heart. All other matters will benefit as well, so they won't feel they are groping blindly in the dark, never certain how these matters will turn out. Each partner being a good person, they complement each other to create a virtual paradise within the family, allowing everyone to remain peaceful, contented, and free from strife at all times. Always cheerful, such a household is undisturbed by temperamental outbursts. All members continue in creating this atmosphere. Each is calm and composed, firmly established in the principles of reason, instead of just doing whatever they like, which is contrary to the very moral principles that ensure their continued peace and contentment. Married couples work together to construct their own future. Together they create good and bad gamma. They create happiness and misery, virtue and evil, heaven and hell, from the very beginning of their relationship onwards to the present and into the future.
an unbroken continuum. Being blessed with the chance to accompany you through many lives, I've come to realize this in my own situation. By your guidance, venerable sir, I have made goodness an integral part of my character. You have always steered me safely through every danger, never letting me stray in the direction of evil or disgrace. Consequently, I have remained a good person during all those lifetimes. I cannot tell you how deeply moved I am by all the kindness you've shown me. I now realize the harm caused by my past mistakes. Please kindly forgive my transgressions, so that no lingering animosity remains between us. Assenting to the day was request, al Tsariyaman forgave her. He then gave her an inspiring talk, encouraging her to perfect herself spiritually. When he had finished, she paid him her respects, moved off a short distance, and floated blissfully up into the sky. Some of the resentful comments she made when she was still a formless spirit were too strange to record here, so I've been unable to recount every detail of their conversation, and for that I ask your forgiveness. I am not really that satisfied with what has been written here either, but I feel that without it, a thought-provoking story would have been left out. The Most Exalted Appreciation on the nights subsequent to Atsariyaman's attainment of Vimutti, a number of Buddhas, accompanied by their Arahant disciples, came to congratulate him on his Vimutti Tamma. One night, a certain Buddha, accompanied by tens of thousands of Arahant disciples, came to visit. The next night, he was visited by another Buddha, who was accompanied by hundreds of thousands of Arahant disciples. Each night, a different Buddha came to express his appreciation, accompanied by a different number of Arahant disciples. Atsariyaman stated that the number of accompanying Arahant disciples varied according to each Buddha's relative accumulation of merit, a factor that differed from one Buddha to the next. The actual number of Arahant disciples accompanying each Buddha did not represent the total number of his Arahant disciples. They merely demonstrated the relative levels of accumulated merit and perfection that each individual Buddha possessed. Among the Arahant disciples accompanying each of those Buddhas were quite a few young novices. Atsariyaman was skeptical about this. So he reflected on it and realized that the term arahant does not apply exclusively to monks. Novices whose hearts are completely pure are also arahant disciples, so their presence did not raise issue with the term in any way. Most of the Buddhas who came to show their appreciation to Atsariyaman addressed him in much the following manner. I, the Tathagata, am aware that you have escaped from the harmful effects of that monstrous suffering which you endured in the prison of Sansara, so I have come to express my appreciation. This prison is enormous and quite impregnable. It is full of seductive temptations which so enslave those who are unwary that it is extremely difficult for anyone to break free. Of the vast number of people living in the world, hardly anyone is concerned enough to think of looking for a way out of Dukkha that perpetually torments their bodies and minds. They are like sick people who cannot be bothered to take medicine. Even though medicines are plentiful, they are of no use to a person who refuses to take them. But Tatamma is like medicine. Beings in Sangsara are afflicted with the painful, oppressive disease of Kilesis, which causes endless suffering. Inevitably, this disease can be cured only by the medicine of Tamma. Left uncured, it will drag living beings through an endless succession of births and deaths, all of them bound up with physical and mental pain. Although Tamma exists everywhere throughout the whole universe, those who are not really interested in properly availing themselves of its healing qualities are unable to take advantage of it. Tamma exists in its own natural way. Beings in samsara spin around like wheels through the pain and suffering of each successive life in the natural way of samsara. They have no real prospect of ever seeing an end to Dukkha and there is no way to help them unless they are willing to help themselves by holding firmly to the principles of Tamma, earnestly trying to put them into practice. No matter how many Buddhas become enlightened or how extensive their teachings are, only those willing to take the prescribed medicine will benefit. The Tamma taught by all the Buddhas is invariably the same, to renounce evil and do good. There exists no Tamma teaching more exceptional than this, for even the most exceptional kilesas in the hearts of living beings are not so exceptional that they can transcend the power of tamma taught by all the buddhas. This tamma in itself is sufficient to eradicate every kind of kilesa there is, 
unless, of course, those practicing it allow themselves to be defeated by their kilesas, and so conclude that tamma must be worthless. By nature, kilesas have always resisted the power of tamma. Consequently, people who defer to the kilesas are people who disregard tamma. They are unwilling to practice the way, for they view it as something difficult to do, a waste of the time they could otherwise spend enjoying themselves, despite the harm such pleasures cause them. A wise, far-sighted person should not retreat into a shell, like a turtle in a pot of boiling water. It is sure to die because it can't find a way to escape. The world is a cauldron, boiling with the consuming heat of the kilesas. Earthly beings of every description, everywhere, must endure this torment, for there is no safe place to hide, no way to elude this conflagration burning in their own hearts, right there where the dukkha is. You have seen the truly genuine Tathagata, haven't you? What is the genuine Tathagata? The genuine Tathagata is simply that purity of heart you have just realized. The bodily form in which I now appear is merely a manifestation of relative, conventional reality. This form does not represent the true Buddha or the true Arahant. It is just our conventional bodily appearance. Atsariyaman replied that he had no doubts about the true nature of the Buddha and the Arahants. What still puzzled him was, how could the Buddha and the Arahants, having attained Anupadisesa Nibbana, without any remaining trace of relative conventional reality, still appear in bodily form? The Buddha explained this matter to him. If those who have attained Anupadisesa Nibbana wish to interact with other Arahants who have purified their hearts but still possess a physical, mundane body, they must temporarily assume a mundane form in order to make contact. However, if all concerned have already attained Anupadises and Ibbana without any remaining trace of relative conventional reality, then the use of conventional constructs is completely unnecessary. So it is necessary to appear in a conventional form when dealing with conventional reality. But when the conventional world has been completely transcended, no such problem exists. All Buddhas know events concerning the past and the future through nimittas that symbolize for them the original conventional realities of the occurrences in question. For instance, when a Buddha wishes to know about the lives of the Buddhas who transcended him, when a Buddha wishes to know about the lives of the Buddhas who preceded him, he must take the nimitta of each Buddha and the particular circumstances in which he lived as a device leading directly to that knowledge. As a device leading directly to that knowledge. If something exists beyond the relative world of conventional reality, that being vimutti, then there can be no symbol representing it. Because of that, knowledge about past buddhas depends on mundane conventions to serve as a common basis for understanding, as my present visit illustrates. It is necessary that I and all of my arahant disciples appear in our original mundane forms so that others, like yourself, have a means of determining what our appearance was like. If we did not appear in this form, no one would be able to perceive us. On occasions when it is necessary to interact with conventional reality, vimutti must be made manifest by the use of suitable conventional means. In the case of pure vimutti, as when two purified chittas interact with one another, there exists only the essential quality of knowing, which is impossible to elaborate on in any way. So when we want to reveal the nature of complete purity, we have to bring in conventional devices to help us portray the experience of vimutti. We can say that Vimutti is a self-luminous state devoid of all nimittas representing the ultimate happiness, for instance, but these are just widely used conventional metaphors. One who clearly knows it in his heart cannot possibly have doubts about Vimutti. Since its true characteristics are impossible to convey, Vimutti is inconceivable in a relative conventional sense. Vimutti manifesting conventionally and Vimutti existing in its original state are, however, both known with absolute certainty by the Arahant. This includes both Vimutti manifesting itself by means of conventional constructs under certain circumstances, and Vimutti existing in its original unconditioned state. Did you ask me about this matter because you were in doubt, or simply as a point of conversation? I have no doubts about the conventional aspects of all the Buddhas or the unconditioned aspects. My inquiry was a conventional way of showing respect. Even without a visit from you and your Arahant disciples, I would have no doubts as to where the true Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha lie. It is my clear conviction that whoever sees the Tamma sees the Tathagata. This means that the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sankha 
each denote the very same natural state of absolute purity, completely free of conventional reality, collectively known as the Three Jewels. I, the Tathagata, did not ask you that question thinking you were in doubt, but rather as a friendly greeting. On those occasions when the Buddhas and their Arahant disciples came to visit, only the Buddhas addressed Atariya Man. None of the disciples accompanying them spoke a word as they sat quietly composed, listening in a manner worthy of the highest respect. Even the small novices, looking more adorable than venerable, showed the same quiet composure. Some of them were quite young, between the ages of nine and twelve, and Atariya Man found them truly endearing. Ordinarily, the average person would see only bright-eyed, adorable children. Being unaware that they were arahants, one would most probably be tempted to fool around, reaching out playfully to stroke their heads, without realizing the impertinence of doing so. When Atari Amun spoke about this, I thought mischievously that I would probably be the first to succumb to the urge to reach out and play with them, despite the consequences. Afterwards, I could always beg their forgiveness. Atari Amun said that, although they were young novices, their behavior was very mature. They were as calm, composed, and impressive to see as all the other Arahant disciples. In short, all the Arahant monks and novices who accompanied each Buddha exhibited impeccable behavior worthy of the highest respect. They were neat, orderly, and pleasing to the eye, like immaculately folded robes. Acharya Man had always been curious to know how walking and sitting meditation were practiced at the time of the Buddha. He also had questions about the proper etiquette to be used between junior and senior monks, and whether it was necessary for a monk to wear his formal robes while doing meditation. When such questions arose in his mind, invariably one of the Buddhas, or an Arhant disciple, appeared to him in Samadhi, and demonstrated how these practices were originally performed in the Buddha's day. For example, Atsariya Man was curious to know the correct manner of practicing walking meditation so as to show proper respect for Tamma. A Buddha or an Arahant then appeared, demonstrating in detail how to place the hands, how to walk, and how to remain self-composed. Sometimes these demonstrations included explicit instructions. At other times, the methods were demonstrated by example. They also showed him such things as the proper way to sit in samadhi, including the most suitable direction to face and the best seated posture to assume. Atsariya Man had some strange things to say about how junior and senior monks showed their respect for each other. Atsari Amman wanted to know how monks at the time of the Buddha conducted themselves with appropriate respect toward one another. Shortly after this thought arose, the vision of a Buddha and many Arahant disciples appeared to him. The Arahants were of all different ages. Some were young, others older, a few being so old that their hair had turned completely white. A considerable number of small novices of all ages accompanied them. However, the Buddha and his disciples did not arrive together. Each arahant arrived individually. Those arriving first sat in the front, while those arriving later sat further away, without regard for seniority. Even the novices who arrived earlier sat ahead of the monks who arrived later. Finally, the last monk, a very elderly man, arrived to take the last available seat, way in the back. But the others showed no sign of shame or embarrassment. Even the Buddha himself sat down in whichever seat was available at the time he arrived. Seeing this, Atsariya Man was somewhat incredulous. Could it be that the monks at the time of the Buddha did not respect seniority? It was definitely not an inspiring sight. How could the Buddha and his disciples proclaim the sasana and then expect people to have faith in it when the sasana's leader and his closest disciples behaved in such an indiscriminate fashion? Instantly, the answer arose in his heart without the Buddha and his disciples having offered any comment. This was an instance of pure vimutti tamma, devoid of any trace of relative conventional reality. So there was no fixed order of propriety. They were demonstrating the true nature of absolute purity, being perfectly equal for all, irrespective of conventional designations such as young and old or high and low. From the Lord Buddha on down to the youngest Arahant novice, all were equal with respect to their state of purity. What Acharya Man had witnessed was a conclusive indicator that all the Arahant monks and novices were equally pure. This having been made clear to him, he wondered how they deferred to each other in the conventional world. No sooner had this thought arisen than the vision of the Buddha and the Arahants seated before him changed. Whereas before they had been sitting together in no special order, now the Buddha sat at the head of the assembly, while the small novices, 
previously in the front, sat in the last seats. It was an impressive sight, worthy of the highest respect. At that moment, Atariyaman clearly understood that this image represented the traditional way in which monks at the time of the Buddha showed each other respect. Even arahants who were junior in rank were obliged to respect those of their seniors who were practicing correctly, but still had kilesas in their hearts. The Buddha then elaborated on this theme. The Tathagata's monks must live in mutual respect and friendship, as though they were all one single entity. This does not mean that they are friendly in a worldly way, but rather that they are friendly in the equal, unbiased way of tamma. When my monks live together, even in large numbers, they never quarrel or display arrogance. Monks who do not respect their fellows according to the principles of the teaching and the discipline of the Buddha are not worthy of being called the Tathagata's monks. Even though those monks may imitate the disciples of the Buddha, they are merely impostors making false claims. As long as monks respect each other according to the principles of the teaching and the discipline, which substitute for the Buddha himself, and never violate these principles, then wherever those monks live, whenever they were ordained, whatever their race, status, or nationality, they remain true disciples of the Tathagata. And whoever is a true follower of the Tathagata must surely see the end of Dukkha one day. The Buddha and all his disciples vanished instantly the moment he finished speaking. As for Atariyaman, all his doubts had vanished the moment that vision appeared to him so clearly. Concerning Atsariyaman's doubts about the necessity of wearing the formal robes when doing meditation, one of the Arahant disciples appeared to him, demonstrating how it was unnecessary to wear them every time. He personally demonstrated when and how sitting and walking meditation should be practiced while wearing the formal robes, as well as the instances when it was unnecessary to wear them. Every aspect of a monk's robes is made clear to him, including the correct color for a monk's three principal robes. He showed Atsariyaman ochre-colored robes that were dyed from the heartwood of the jackfruit tree in three different shades, light, medium, and dark brown. Careful consideration of these episodes is enough to convince us that Atsariyaman always had sound, acknowledged precedents for the way he practiced. He never jeopardized his vocation by merely guessing about things he was unsure of. Consequently, his practice was always smooth, consistent, and irreproachable from beginning to end. Certainly, it would be hard to find his equal nowadays. Those adopting his mode of practice are bound to exhibit a gracefulness befitting disciples of such a fine teacher, and their own practice is sure to progress very smoothly. However, those who prefer to flout conventions are like ghosts without a cemetery, or orphans without a family. Having forsaken their teacher, they may well modify the practice to suit their own opinions. Atsariyaman possessed a mysterious, ineffable inner compass to direct him in these matters, one which none of his disciples could ever match. Chapter 4 The Chiang Mai Years Venerable Atsariyaman wandered to Tunga in the northern province of Chiang Mai for many years, spending the annual rains retreat in a different location each year, he spent one rains retreat in each of the following places, Ban Chom Dang in the Mae Rim district, Ban Bong in the Mae Dang district, Ban Gloi in the Prao district, Ban Bo Praya in the Mae Swai district, and Mae Tong Tip in the Mae Sai district of Chiang Rai province. He also spent rains retreats at Wat Chiti Luang in the city of Chiang Mai, in the mountains of Mae Swai district, and in the neighboring province of Uttaradit. Outside of the retreat period, he wandered extensively through the provinces of Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai for a total of eleven years, making it impossible to give a strict chronological account of all the village communities he passed through on his travels. In the following account, I shall mention by name only those villages having a direct bearing on the story as it unfolds. Except for his stay at Wat Chedi Luang Monastery, Atsariyaman always wandered in solitude, staying in the wilderness, mountainous areas where danger was ever-present, it is the exceptional nature of his wandering to Tanga practice and the many insights into Tamma that arose along the way which make Atsariyaman's life story so significant. This strange and wonderful tale is unique among the stories of all the Tutanga monks who wandered alone. Ordinarily, such a lifestyle is believed to be bleak and lonely. Living in an inhospitable environment, oppressed by danger, and unable to eat or sleep normally, the sense of fear can be stifling. But Atsariyaman was perfectly content living a solitary existence. 
he found it conducive to his efforts to remove the gileses from his heart, having always relied on the method of striving in seclusion to accomplish that goal. It was only later that other monks began to seek him out. For example, Atarya Teth of Tabo district in the province of Nongkai, Atarya San, and Atarya Kao of Wat Tam Glong Pen Monastery lived with him for short periods of time. After training them for a while in the way of practice, he sent them off alone to find secluded places in sparsely populated forests where villages were far apart, perhaps at the foot of a mountain, perhaps on a mountain ridge. Villages in that region were quite small, some consisting of only four or five houses, others nine to ten houses, just enough to support an alms round from one day to the next. The Gumbatana monks who followed Atsadayaman during that period were extremely resolute fearless individuals. They constantly showed a willingness to put their lives on the line in their search for Tamma. Therefore, Acharyaman preferred to send them to live in places teeming with wild animals, such as tigers, for such places tended to automatically dispel complacency and stimulate mindfulness and wisdom, boosting the strength of the citta faster than could otherwise be expected. Atsaryaman himself thrived comfortably in the peace and quiet of these virtually unpopulated mountain regions. Though human contact was scarce, communication with devas, brahmas, nagas, and other spirits from various realms of existence was normal for him, much in the same way that a person knowing foreign languages regularly communicates with people from other countries. Due to his long-standing fluency in this type of communication, his time spent living in mountainous regions was of special benefit to celestial beings. It was also beneficial to the local hill tribes, who tended to be straightforward, honest, even-tempered people. Once they came to know his character and to appreciate his tamma, they revered him so much that they were willing to sacrifice their lives for him. Hill tribes and forest peoples, such as the Ekor, Kamu, Museur, and Hmong, are generally considered to be rather scruffy, unattractive, primitive people. But Atsariyaman found them to be handsome, clean-looking people who were courteous and well-behaved, always treating their elders and local leaders with great respect. They maintained a good community spirit, and there were hardly any troublemakers in their villages back then. They placed so much trust in their elders, especially the village headman, that when he spoke everyone paid attention and obediently complied with his wishes, and they were not opinionated, making them easy to teach. These so-called wild, uncivilized jungles were actually inhabited by good, honest, moral people. There, unlike in the jungles of human civilization, theft and robbery were virtually unknown. Jungles consisting of trees and wild animals aren't nearly so dangerous as the civilized jungles of human society, places teeming with all kinds of perilous gilesas where greed, hatred, and delusion are constantly on the assault. They inflict deep internal wounds, gradually eroding a person's physical and mental health until the damage becomes acute. Such wounds are extremely difficult to treat. In any case, most people can't even be bothered to look for suitable care. Though such gilesa inflicted wounds tend to fester menacingly, those who are afflicted usually neglect their injuries, hoping they will somehow heal by themselves. This sort of gilesa infested jungle exists in the hearts of all human beings, men, women, monks, and novices, without distinction. Atariyaman said that he used life in the wilds as a means of cutting back this wild inner jungle, which otherwise could be so savage and disturbing that the heart never experienced any peace and quiet. At least by living alone in the wilderness, he could quell the gilesas enough to feel comfortable and relaxed. He felt that this was the only sensible way to use our natural human intelligence, and thus not squander the good fortune inherent in human birth. Monks who sought out Atsariyaman in the wilderness tended to be especially courageous and self-sacrificing, so he trained them in ways that suited their uncompromising attitude and the harshness of their environment. Training methods that he found appropriate for himself were suitable for them as well. If necessary, they were willing to die to achieve their goal. As long as they lived, they were dedicated to the struggle for Tamma in order to transcend the world and end the perpetual cycle of birth and suffering. The training methods that Atsariyaman employed with the monks he encountered in Chiang Mai differed from those he previously used. They were far more rigorous and uncompromising. The monks who came to train under his guidance were mostly resolute individuals. They paid scrupulous attention to the kilesas arising within themselves in an attempt to reduce their strength and choke them off. 
they were not concerned that his admonitions might be too harsh or too intense. In fact, the intensity of his tone increased as the tamma under discussion became more profound. Those focusing on a certain level of tranquility were reinforced in that calm state, while those concentrating on investigative analysis followed every nuance of his reasoning to discover new techniques for developing wisdom. The discourses that Atsariya Man delivered to his students in Chiang Mai were especially profound, because his knowledge of Tamma was by then complete. Another factor was the high degree of understanding that the monks who sought his guidance already possessed. They were absolutely determined to strive for higher and higher levels of Tamma until they reached the ultimate goal. Besides his usual admonitions, Atsariya Man also had some very unusual techniques for thwarting the monks whose thoughts tended to go astray. He used these techniques to trap thieves and catch them in the act. But these were no ordinary thieves. The thieves that Atsariya Man caught lurked inside the hearts of monks whose thoughts liked to steal away to everything imaginable, in the usual way of the Gilesas. A strange incident occurred while Atsariya Man was staying in the mountains of Chiang Mai, an incident that should never have happened in the circle of Gammatana monks, I hope you will forgive me for recounting what I heard. I feel it may be a thought-provoking lesson for anyone who finds himself in a similar situation. This story was known exclusively within the inner circle of Atsariya Man's senior disciples, and Atsariya Man's own assessment of the whole matter was crucial. A certain senior monk living with him at the time related the story as follows. One afternoon, he and another monk went to bathe in a rock pool located near a path leading to the fields of the local village which was quite a long distance away. While they were bathing, a group of young women happened to pass by on their way to work in the fields, something that had never before occurred while they were bathing. When the other monk spied them walking past, his mind immediately wobbled, his mindfulness failing him as the fires of lust flared up and began smoldering inside him. Try as he might, he couldn't manage to reverse this situation. While fearful that Atsariya Man might become aware of his predicament, he was equally afraid that he might disgrace himself. From that moment on, his mind was constantly fluctuating as he desperately tried to come to grips with the problem. Nothing like this had ever happened to him before, and he felt miserable about it. That same night, Atsariya Man, investigating on his own, became aware that this monk had encountered something unexpected and was consequently very distraught caught between feelings of infatuation and apprehension. The monk struggled through a sleepless night, trying to resolve the dilemma. The next morning, Atsariya Man did not say anything about it, for he knew that the monk was already fearful of him. Confronting him would only make matters worse. When they met, the monk was so ashamed and apprehensive he was almost trembling. But Atsariya Man just smiled amicably as though he didn't know what had happened. When it came time to go on alms round, Atsariya Man found an excuse to address the monk. I can see how earnest you are in pressing on with your meditation practice, so you needn't go on alms round today. The rest of us will go, and we will share our food with you when we return. Providing food for one extra monk is hardly a problem. Go and continue your meditation practice so that the rest of us may share the merit you make as well. He said this without looking directly at the monk, for Atsariya Man understood the monk better than the monk understood himself. Atsariya Man then led the others on alms round, while the monk forced himself to do walking meditation. Since the problem arose due to a chance encounter, and not an intentional one, it had been impossible to prevent. Realizing that, Atsariya Man did what he could to assist him. He was well aware that the monk was doing his utmost to solve the problem, so he was obliged to find a clever means of helping him, without further upsetting his mental state. When they returned from alms round, the monks shared their food with the monk, each putting some in his bowl. Atsariya Man sent someone to inform the monk that he could take his meal with them or alone in his hut, whichever he preferred. Upon hearing this, the monk quickly went to eat with his fellow monks. Atsariya Man ignored him when he arrived, but later spoke gently to him in order to soothe his injured psyche and mitigate his sense of remorse. Although he sat with the other monks, he ate only a token amount of food, so as not to appear impolite. Later that day, the other monk, who had also bathed at the rock pool, the one who would later tell the story, became suspicious, being as yet unaware of the whole story. 
He wondered why Atariyaman treated that monk with a deference he had never seen before. He figured that since Atariyaman was being so supportive, his friend's meditation practice was undoubtedly very good. When he found the opportunity, he went to ask about his meditation. Acharya Mun said that you didn't have to go on alms round because you're intensifying your efforts, but he didn't indicate how good your meditation is. So, how is your meditation going? Please tell me about it. The monk gave a wry smile. <laughs> how could my meditation be good? Acharya Mun saw a poor, miserable soul, and he's just trying to help, using his own skillful methods. That's all. His friend persisted in attempting to get to the truth, but the monk continued to deflect his questions. Finally, his friend confronted him directly. He asked, What did you mean when you said that Atsariya Man saw a poor, miserable soul? And how is it that he's trying to help? Exasperated, the monk relented. There is no need to tell Atsariya Man about this. Anyway, he already knows me better than I know myself, so I feel fearful and ashamed in his presence. Did you notice anything unusual when we were bathing together at the rock pool yesterday? The other monk said that he hadn't noticed anything, except for a group of women passing by. So the monk confessed. That's just it. That's why I'm so miserable right now, and why Acharyaman wouldn't let me go on alms round this morning. He was afraid I would pass out and die right there in the village should I happen to see her again. How could my meditation be any good? Do you understand now how good the meditation of this miserable fellow is? The other monk was stunned. Oh, my gosh! What is it between you and those women? Nothing, answered the monk, except blindly falling in love with one of them and having my meditation go to pieces. What appeared in its place was a beautiful image, a crazy infatuation crushing down on my heart all night long. Even now this madness continues unabated, and I just don't know what to do about it. Please, can you do something to help me? You mean it still isn't any better? No. The monk's voice sounded wretchedly pathetic. In that case I have a suggestion. If you can't suppress this thing, then it is not prudent for you to stay here any longer. Things will only get worse. I think it's better that you move away from here and find another place to do your practice. If you don't feel up to asking Acharyaman about this, then I will speak to him for you. I'll inform him that you wish to go look for another secluded place because you don't feel so well here. I'm sure he will immediately give his permission because he is well aware of what's happening to you. He just hasn't said anything about it yet for fear of shaming you. The monk readily agreed. That evening his companion went to speak with Acharyaman, who immediately gave his consent. But there was a caustic element latent here. Atsariman said rather cryptically, A disease arising from karmic attraction is hard to cure. Contagions spread quickly when their original cause still remains. And that was all he would say on the matter. Even the monk who went to speak with him didn't understand his connotation. Everyone kept quiet about this matter. The monk never spoke directly to Atsariman about it. His friend never mentioned it to anyone else, and Acharyaman kept the whole thing to himself. Although fully aware of the truth of the matter, they all behaved as if nothing had happened. No one spoke openly about it. The next day the monk went to take leave of Acharyaman, who consented without mentioning the matter. The monk then left and went to stay near another village quite a distance away. Had this not been a true case of karmic attraction, as Acharyaman had hinted, then surely the monk would have been well out of danger there. But, alas, for the uncertainty of karmic consequences, things turned out exactly as Acharyaman had suggested. Shortly after the monk left Acharyaman, the young woman, who shared the same karmic connection, ended up moving to the other village by a fortuitous coincidence, and their paths crossed again. This itself is very interesting, since it was most unusual for hill-tribe women to stray so far from home. Later, after Acharyaman and his group of monks had departed from the first village, they heard that the monk had disrobed, returning to lay life because he couldn't put up with the constant strain. His gumma had come full circle. He married the pretty Museor woman and settled in that village. This was a genuine case of mutual gumma. 
Without such a garment connection, how could it have been possible? The monk who told this story insisted that his friend became infatuated the moment he saw the woman, having never seen or spoken with her before. This was confirmed by the other monks who were living there. They lived together in the monastery the whole time, never having any occasion to get involved with the villagers. Besides that, they were living without Tariya Mun in a place safe from such liaisons. There can be no doubt that an enduring garmic bond existed between them. The monk once told his friend that mere eye contact with her was enough to make him feel giddy and lose all presence of mind, and an irresistible passion gripped his heart so tightly he could scarcely breathe. Those powerful emotions plagued him relentlessly, leaving him in such an emotional quandary that he felt completely demoralized. Realizing his predicament, he tried to escape, but fate pursued him, again casting its spell over him, and that was it. He succumbed. Those who have never had such an experience may smile, but others who have know that we cannot all imitate the Arhan Sundara Samuddha by simply floating up and out to safety. Normally, hill tribe people are not overly familiar with monks, but if Gamma is involved, then such incidents can happen. No one is exempt from Gamma, for Gamma has jurisdiction over those who create it. Atsariya Man was fully aware of this truth. Although he tried using skillful means to help the monk, the outcome was probably inevitable. For this reason, he didn't make any direct attempt to intervene. In the final analysis, in a world where everyone lives under the authority of Gamma, matters must be allowed to take their natural course. I have included this story in the hope that it may serve as a timely reminder for anyone finding himself in a similar situation. As always, I trust you will forgive any indiscretion on my part. Previously, I mentioned Atsariyaman's special talent for catching thieves, a technique for reading minds and catching stray thoughts that kept his students watchful and alert. When a Gambartana monk with an especially bold, resolute character came to see him in Chiang Mai, Atsariyaman used this teaching technique to good advantage. Unlike those less earnestly committed, these monks were not apt to react in a negative way. Being fully dedicated to the cause of Tamma, as soon as Atsariyaman admonished them about their faults, they were willing to do their best to rectify them. No matter how pointedly he admonished them, they did not feel ashamed or apprehensive when their mistakes were exposed. Atsariyaman was a consummate teacher, and his message went straight to the heart of his listeners. Whether sharing his own personal knowledge or pointing out the shortcomings of his students, he was always frank and outspoken. He remained candid and impartial in his criticism, with the intention of giving as much help as he possibly could. His students were in no way contemptuous. They never refused to accept the truth, nor were they concerned about their own achievements, as often happens in a group of meditators. His tamma explanations were invariably adapted to the individual needs of his students, touching only on the points that were essential to the individual's level of practice. When he determined that a student was practicing correctly, he encouraged him to step up his efforts. But when he felt that someone's meditation was faulty or potentially dangerous, he pointed this out as a way of encouraging the student to abandon that practice. For monks who went to him with doubts or questions, his explanations were unerringly right to the point. And, as far as I know, his students were never disappointed. It's safe to say that everyone who went to him with a question about meditation practice could have expected to receive expert advice, for meditation was his field of greatest expertise. His knowledge and understanding of every aspect of meditation was unparalleled. Every facet of his Tamma teaching benefited from his lyrical presentation, captivating the listener and demonstrating an eloquence which no one today can equal. His comments on moral virtue were engrossing to his listeners, while his discourses on the different levels of samadhi and wisdom were exceptional. His audience became so absorbed that, being satiated in the tumma they heard, their feeling of satisfaction often lasted for days thereafter. During the period when Atsariyaman pushed himself relentlessly toward realization of the supreme tumma, he lived alone in mountain caves or forest retreats. As he waged an all-out assault on the Gilesas, his efforts were directed inward at all times. Only during hours of sleep did he relax this persistent introspection. 
Mindfulness and wisdom were his constant companions throughout that exhaustive investigation to uproot the Gilesas. He carried on a continuous dialogue with the Gilesas, mentally attacking and counter-attacking them with mindfulness and wisdom. His sheer determination to go beyond Tukka was the catalyst for these conversations, which were not rhetorical encounters. Rather, they were internal contemplations using mindfulness and wisdom to rebut the Gilesas. No matter how they tried to evade him, no matter what tricks they used to rebuff or entangle him, Atsariyaman used mindfulness and wisdom at each step of the way to follow their movements and to corner and crush them into submission, until finally he emerged victorious. Wherever he found the Gilesas still having the upper hand, he made an effort to upgrade his arsenal, mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and perseverance, increasing their strength with each new challenge until it exceeded that of his arch-enemy. Triumphant at last, as we already know, the world inside his heart shook. Magganyarna had destroyed the king of the Vartachitta. This was how Atsariyaman applied himself in the ultimate battle. He did not place any time constraints on his walking and sitting meditation as he strove day and night, wielding mindfulness and wisdom to secure victory. Having finally cleared through the dense jungle of Gilesas, supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom that were his weapons of choice in this campaign ceased to be meaningful or relevant. Mindfulness and wisdom became routine faculties to be engaged in normal mental processes. He used them to think about one of the many aspects of Tamma or to engage in other mental activities, letting them fade away when their services were no longer required. Previously, they needed to be in a constant state of alert to combat the Kilesas. Once victory was achieved, if nothing came along to stimulate his thoughts, he existed much as though he were mentally idle, a simpleton. Mindfulness and wisdom, which for so long had been caught up in the heat of intense struggle, were nowhere to be found. All that remained was a timeless tranquility that nothing could disturb, eclipsing everything else in his heart. Left totally to itself, free of all external influences, his heart did not think about affairs of the past or the future. It was as though everything had disappeared along with the Gilesas. Only emptiness remained. The Boxer When Atariyaman accepted a group of monks as his students, he held regular meetings where he instructed them in the way of practice. If he noticed that a monk's attitude was unbecoming or his behavior offensive, he took the opportunity to openly rebuke him. While in meditation, knowledge about the unseemly behavior of his students might arise in his mind as visual images, or else he might psychically read their errant thoughts. He then devised some cunning method to bring this to the culprit's attention, assuring that greater care and restraint was exercised in the future. The visual nimittas that arose in Atsariyaman's citta during meditation varied according to the overall situation of the person who was the principal cause of that vision. To give you an idea of the nature and the scope of his nimittas, there is the story of the monk who was a rather famous boxer as a layman. Giving up his profession to ordain as a monk, he developed a strong faith and decided to practice gammatana. Aware of Atsariyaman's excellent reputation as a revered meditation master, he set out to find the place where Atsariyaman was staying. But as he set off, he unwittingly carried in his bag ten pictures of boxers in various boxing poses. With these photos, he traveled from Bangkok to Chiang Mai, searching for Atsariyaman in that mountainous region. Finally arriving at Atsariyaman's wilderness retreat, he paid his respects and explained his reasons for coming. Atsariyaman accepted him without offering any comments. During the night, Atsariyaman must have thoroughly investigated this monk, for the following morning, when all the monks gathered to eat, he came in and immediately began speaking about the new arrival. This monk came here for the express purpose of learning about Tamma. Looking at his behavior, I can find nothing offensive. It's commendable. Why then did he exhibit such dreadful conduct last night? As I sat in meditation, he approached and stood right in front of me, just a few feet away. He then proceeded at some length to assume various boxing poses, before gradually backing away. As he slowly faded from my view, he continued to shadow box, kicking first right and then left as he went. 
What's the story with this monk? Was he a boxer before he ordained as a monk? Is that the reason he gave me a lengthy boxing exhibition? While he spoke, all the monks, including the former boxer, sat motionless in bewildered silence. Atariyaman turned to the former boxer, whose face had gone pale. What do you have to say for yourself? What did you have in mind, behaving in such a manner? At least you didn't take a punch at me. As it was time to go on alms round, Acharyaman said nothing more that morning, nor did he bring the matter up later when instructing the monks at the evening meeting. But during the night he was again confronted with the same problem, so he brought it up again the following morning. What's your real purpose for coming to me? Last night there you were again, displaying your boxing skills, jumping and kicking all over the place. It lasted nearly all night. Such behavior is not normal for someone whose intentions are noble. What did you have in mind before you came to see me, and what are your thoughts now that you are here? Please tell me the truth, or else I won't be able to let you stay on here. I've never experienced anything quite like the events of the last two nights. The monk sat trembling, his face ashen, as though he was ready to faint. One of the other monks, noticing his worsening condition, requested an opportunity to speak privately with him. Please, be forthcoming and tell Atsariyaman your true feelings about this matter. He's asking you about it only because he wants to ascertain the truth, not because he has any intention to hurt you. None of us who are living here with him are saints free from kilesas. We are bound to make mistakes and so must accept his admonitions. All of us live here as his disciples. Being our teacher, he's like a father and a mother to us. As a teacher, he has an obligation to reprimand anyone who does something noticeably wrong. A teacher must keep an eye on his students, for their own sake, educating them by questioning and criticizing them as circumstances require. I myself have been subjected to many such castigations, some even more severe than the one you received. Atsariyaman has even ordered some monks to leave the premises immediately, only to relent and allow them to stay on when they realized their faults and accepted the blame. Please think carefully about what he just said to you. My own feeling is that you shouldn't be unreasonably afraid. If you have anything on your mind, just express it truthfully. If you feel you have done something wrong, or you cannot recall where you made a mistake, tell him straight out that you cannot seem to recollect your past errors. Then put your fate in his hands, letting him take what action he sees fit, and accept the consequences. The matter will then resolve itself. When the other monk finished speaking, al Tsariyaman continued, So, what do you have to say for yourself? It's not that I want to find fault with you for no good reason, but as soon as I close my eyes, I have to watch your antics blocking my view for the rest of the night. Why would a monk behave like that? It dismays me to see it every night. I want to know what kind of sinister motives you may have for persisting in such conduct. Or do you think that my own intuition, which has always been reliable in the past, is now playing tricks on me and contaminating you in the process? I want you to tell me the truth. If it turns out that you're innocent, my intuition being at fault, then that means I'm just a crazy old monk who doesn't deserve to live with a group of students like this. I will only lead them astray. I'll have to run off and hide myself away like some lunatic, and immediately stop teaching others. Should I persist in teaching such crazy knowledge to the world, the consequences would be disastrous. The other monk again encouraged his friend to speak up. Finally... The former boxer moved to answer Atsariyaman. In a ghostly, trembling voice, he blurted out, I'm a, a, bo a boxer, and then fell silent. Atsariyaman sought confirmation. You're a boxer, is that right? Yes, and that was all he said. Right now you're a monk, so how can you also be a boxer? Do you mean you traveled here boxing for money along the way, or what? By this time, the monk's mind was in a daze. He could offer no coherent response to Atsariyaman's inquiries. The other monk took up the questioning in an effort to help him regain his mental focus. Don't you mean that you were a boxer in lay life, but now that you are a monk you no longer do that? Yes. As a layman I was a boxer, but after ordaining as a monk I stopped boxing. Atsariyaman saw that his condition didn't look very good, so he changed the subject, saying it was time to go on alms round. Later, 
He told the other monk to go and question him privately, since his fear of Atsariman prevented him from being coherent. After the meal, this monk found an opportunity to put his questions in private. He discovered that the new monk had previously been a well-known boxer in the Suan Gula boxing camp. Becoming disillusioned with lay life, he ordained as a monk and set off to find Atsariman. Once he had the whole story, the monk related it to Atsariman, who made no further comment. It was assumed that this would be the end of the matter, especially since Atsariman spoke directly to the former boxer during the evening meeting. But that wasn't to be the case. That night, Atsariman again investigated the matter for himself. In the morning, he confronted the former boxer once more in front of everyone. It's not merely that you were once a boxer. Something else is hidden there as well. You should go and carefully reconsider this whole affair. If it was simply a matter of being a boxer in lay life, the matter should have been settled by now. It should not keep recurring in this way. That was all he said. Later, the monk who had become familiar with the former boxer went to see him. After further questioning, he discovered that the new monk had the ten pictures of boxers in his possession. After looking at them, his friend became convinced that they were the cause of all the trouble. He advised him to either throw them away or burn them. The boxer monk agreed, and together they burned the whole lot. After that, everything returned to normal, and this matter never surfaced again. The former boxer was diligent in his practice, always conducting himself admirably. He lived contentedly with Atsariyaman from then on. Atsariyaman was always especially kind to him. Never again did he allude to his past. Afterwards, when the opportunity arose, his fellow monks teased him about that incident. Referring to his scolding from Atsariyaman, he said, I was half dead, and in such a daze I didn't know what was what. So I answered him like a half-dead idiot. Addressing the monk who helped him, he continued, If you hadn't been so kind... I'd probably have gone hopelessly mad. But Atsariyaman was remarkably clever. As soon as he saw I was losing my wits, he quickly put a stop to the whole affair, acting as though nothing had ever happened. This is an example of the type of visual nimitta that might arise in Atsariyaman's meditation. He regularly used the knowledge he gained from such visions to teach his students, a means no less significant than his ability to read the thoughts of others. Atsariyaman had more sensational experiences while living in Chiang Mai than during any other period of his life. Some of these phenomena appeared exclusively within his citta. Others surfaced in the world around him. They included many amazing, stimulating insights, knowledge of a kind never occurring to him before. Living alone in particular, he encountered a myriad of mysterious phenomena far too numerous to mention. The citta in its natural state of knowing is like that. Knowledge and understanding arise continuously, both during meditation and in engagement with normal daily activities. It's strange and truly wondrous, considering that the citta had previously been blind and ignorant, never imagining it possessed the ability to perceive the phenomena that arise each moment. It was as if such phenomena just came into being, even though they have actually existed since time immemorial. Only when the citta enters into a state of total calm do these functions cease. All manner of phenomena are excluded from the samadhi state, so nothing arises to affect the citta in any way. As the citta rests with tamma, tamma and the citta merge. The citta is tamma, tamma is the citta. This is a state of complete unity, where the citta and tamma are one and the same, without any trace of duality. Conceptual reality does not exist. All concepts of time and space are transcended. There is no awareness of the body or the mind, and concepts of pain and pleasure do not arise. As long as the citta remains there and doesn't withdraw from that state, whether it's for a period of days, months, years, or aeons, then conventional realities such as anitsa, dukkha, and anatta will not disturb it, for it is a state in which all duality ceases entirely. If, for instance, the mundane physical body were to break up and disintegrate while the citta remained quiescent in nirodha dhamma, meaning the cessation of conventional reality, the citta in that state would be completely unaware of what was happening. In truth, the state of nirodha is one in which the cessation of conceptual reality is only temporary. 
not lasting for years, as that is highly unlikely. It may be compared to a deep, dreamless sleep. During that time, the sleeper is completely unaware of body and mind. No matter how long he remains in deep, dreamless sleep, that condition stays the same. Only after waking up does one become aware of normal physical and mental sensations. Deep states of samadhi, including nirodha samapati, all exist within the realm of relative conventional reality, however. Only the vimutti citta has gone completely beyond it. And if the citta entering into these samadhi states is already liberated from every aspect of relative conventional reality, then that pure visuddhi citta is in no way affected by such conventional levels of attainment. It remains vimutti citta, free from all constraints of time and space, a galigo. It's absolutely impossible to conceptualize the nature of vimutti citta, so any attempt to speculate about its qualities is only a waste of time and effort. The citta that enters into a state of total quiescence, free from all conceptual reality, simply ceases to function, as those conditioned phenomena that would ordinarily be involved with the citta temporarily disappear. Later, when the citta has withdrawn from deep samadhi into upatara samadhi, or back into the normal state of visuddhi citta, it functions normally, receiving and processing sense data as it sees fit. Whether in upatara samadhi or in its normal waking state, Atsariya Man's citta was always receptive to a multitude of phenomena. The difference was in the depth, scope, and quality of the experience. If wishing to investigate something thoroughly, he would enter into Upatara Samadhi to get a more extensive view. Clairvoyance and clairaudience, for example, require a state of Upatara Samadhi. In this calm state, one can perceive whatever one wishes to know about the forms and sounds of people and animals, and much, much more. Fundamentally, it's no different from seeing with the physical eyes and hearing with the physical ears. Tigers in Disguise Atsari Aman said that, excepting the few who had visited large towns in the region, most of the hill tribe people in Chiang Mai had never seen monks before. Early in his travels, Atsari Aman and another monk went to live in the mountains about a mile and a half from a hill tribe village. They camped in the forest, taking shelter under the trees. In the morning, when they went to the village for alms food, the villagers asked why they had come. Atsari Aman said they had come to collect alms. Puzzled, the villagers asked him what that meant. Atsari Aman explained that they had come to collect offerings of rice. They asked him if he wanted cooked rice or uncooked rice. When he said cooked rice, they got some and put a little in each of their alms bowls. The two monks then returned to their camp and ate the plain rice. Lacking faith from the very beginning, the villagers were very suspicious of the monks. That evening, the village headman sounded the bamboo clapper to call everyone to a meeting. Referring to Atsari Aman and his disciple, he announced that there were now two tigers in disguise staying in the nearby forest. He said that he had yet to determine what kind of tigers they were, but they weren't to be trusted. He forbade the women and children to enter the forest in that area, and men who went were warned to go armed and in groups, lest they should be attacked by the two tigers. As it happened, Atsari Aman was beginning his evening meditation at precisely the time the announcement was made to the village community. So, Atsari Aman, who was the object of this warning, was also privy to the whole affair. He was deeply saddened by the senseless accusations, but, instead of feeling angry or discouraged, he felt only ineffable loving compassion for the local villagers. He was concerned that the majority might naively believe such slanderous talk, and therefore be burdened by its dreadful moral consequences until they died, at which time they might well be reborn as tigers. Early the next morning he informed his disciple of what he had seen. Last night the village headman assembled everyone and announced that we are tigers in disguise. We were both accused of being tigers who are disguised as monks in order to deceive them into trusting us so that we can then destroy both their persons and their properties. Because of this they have no faith in us at all. If we were to leave here now while they still harbor these negative thoughts, they may all be reborn as tigers when they die, a grievous gumma indeed. So for their benefit I think it's incumbent on us as monks to remain here and put up with the situation for a while. We must endure the ensuing hardships until they've changed their attitude before we move on to another location. Not only did the villagers distrust them, 
but groups of three or four armed men often came to keep an eye on them. Sometimes they stood watching from a distance. But at other times, seeing Atsari Aman walking meditation, they came closer and stared at him from the end of his walking path, or from the side of it, or even stood right in the middle of it. They glanced around, surveying the whole area for about ten to fifteen minutes, then left. This surveillance routine continued day after day for many weeks. The villagers showed no concern whatsoever about the personal welfare of these two tigers. They were not interested in whether or not they had enough food and other necessities to survive. Thus, the living condition of these two tigers were difficult in the extreme. The most they received on alms round was plain rice. On some days, it was just barely enough to satisfy them. On other days, it wasn't nearly enough, even though they drank a lot of water with it as well. Since there was no cave or cliff overhang in which they could take shelter, they lived and slept under the trees, putting up with exposure to the sun and the rain. When it rained in that area, it tended to rain all day. After the rain abated and things dried out a bit, they went looking for dry leaves and grasses to construct a makeshift thatched roof, giving them some limited protection against the weather. It provided enough cover to survive from day to day, albeit with much discomfort. When it rained heavily, they sheltered under their tent umbrellas, with the cloth sheeting hanging down around them as protection against the cold wind. Often the rain was accompanied by strong winds that came howling down out of the mountains, blowing their umbrellas, soaking their belongings, and leaving both monks drenched and shivering. If it happened during the daytime, they could at least see what they were doing while collecting their requisites to look for some cover. But when it occurred at night, the situation was extremely trying. They were unable to see, even as the rain poured down and the cold wind blasted through the trees, causing branches to break off and crash down around them. They were never sure of surviving this onslaught of rain, wind, cold, and loose debris flying at them from all directions. During such hardships, they just endured the best they could. They had to abide the heat, the cold, the hunger, the thirst, and the uncertainty of their existence while they waited for the villagers' mistrust to subside. Even though they received only plain rice, their supply was, at best, erratic. Drinking water was hard to come by, so they had to walk down to the foot of the mountain to fill their kettles, carrying the water back up to serve their daily needs. Despite such an impoverished existence, the villagers showed no sympathy for their plight. In spite of the hardships... Atsari Aman felt free of anxieties and responsibilities as his meditation practice progressed unhindered. He took great pleasure from listening to the calls of the various wild animals in the surrounding forest. Seated in meditation under the trees late at night, he constantly heard the sounds of tigers roaring close by. Curiously, those huge tigers rarely ventured into the area where he was seated. Occasionally, a tiger did approach Atsari Aman, Perhaps suspecting him to be wild game, it snuck in to have a look. But as soon as the tiger saw him make a move, it leapt off into the forest in alarm, and was never seen again. Nearly every afternoon, three or four men came to check them out. They stood around whispering among themselves without a word to Atsari Aman, who, in turn, ignored their presence. When they arrived, Atsari Aman focused his chitta on their thoughts. They, of course, never suspected that he knew what they were thinking or what they were whispering about. It's unlikely they even considered the possibility that someone could be privy to their thoughts, which they indulged in unrestrainedly. Atsari Aman focused his attention on everyone who came. As was to be expected of a reconnaissance party, he discovered that they were primarily looking to find fault with him in some way. Instead of taking precautions against such findings, Atsari Aman responded with great compassion. He knew that a majority of the villagers were subject to the corrupting influence of a small minority. Atsari Aman remained at this site for many months, yet the villagers persisted in trying to catch him at suspicious doings. Their sole purpose was to find him doing something that would confirm their worst fears. Although they were sincerely committed to this, they never tried to chase him away. They merely took turns spying on him. The villagers must have been surprised that despite many months of continuous surveillance, they still couldn't catch him doing anything wrong. One evening, while sitting in meditation, 
Atsariyaman became psychically aware that the villagers were assembled for a meeting concerning his case. He could hear the village headman questioning the others about the result of their surveillance. What had they been able to determine so far? Those who had taken turns observing the two monks said the same thing. They could find no evidence to confirm their suspicions. They were worried that their suspicious attitude might be doing them more harm than good. Why do you say that? the headman wanted to know. They replied, As far as we can tell, there's nothing in their conduct to confirm our assumptions about them. Whenever we go to check them out, either they are sitting still with their eyes closed, or they're calmly pacing back and forth, not looking here and there like most people do. People who are tigers in disguise, poised to attack their prey, would hardly behave like that. These two monks should have exhibited some sort of incriminating behavior by now, but we've seen nothing so far. If we keep treating them like this, we may suffer the consequences. The correct approach would be to speak with them to find out about their motives. Presuming their motives to be sinister may well reflect badly on us all. Good monks are hard to find. We have enough experience to tell good monks from bad ones. These monks deserve our respect. Let's not hastily accuse them of treachery. To find out the whole story, let's go speak with them. Let's ask them why they sit still with their eyes closed and why they pace back and forth. What are they searching for? A decision was reached at the meeting to send a representative to question the monks. In the morning, Atsariyaman spoke to his companion. The villagers are beginning to have a change of heart. Last night they held a meeting about their surveillance of us. They have decided to send someone here to question us about their suspicions. Just as Atsariyaman foresaw, a village representative arrived that very afternoon to question him. What are you searching for when you sit still with your eyes closed or pace back and forth? Atsariyaman replied, I've lost my butto. I'm searching for butto while sitting and walking. What is this butto? Can we help you find it? Butto is the most precious gem in the three worlds of existence, a jewel of all-pervading knowledge. If you help me find it, that'll be excellent. Then we will all see Butto quickly and easily. Has your Butto been missing long? Not long. With your help, we'll find it a lot faster than if I look for it alone. Is Butto something large? Neither large nor small. It's just the right size for all of us. Whoever finds Butto will become a superior person, able to perceive anything he wishes. Will we be able to see the heavens and the hills? Of course. Otherwise, how could we call it superior? What about our dead children and our dead spouses? Can they be seen? You can see anything you want once Butto is yours. Is it very bright? It's much brighter than hundreds, even thousands of suns. The sun is not able to illuminate heaven and hell, but Butto can penetrate everywhere, illuminating everything. Can women and children help search for it, too? Everyone can help. Men, women, young and old, all can join in the search. This superior Butto, can it protect us from ghosts? Butto is superior in countless ways. It is superior in the three worlds, Gamaloka, Ropaloka, Arupaloka. All three of them must pay homage to Butto. No being anywhere is greater than Butto. Ghosts are very afraid of Butto. They must bow down and worship it. Ghosts are frightened of people who search for Butto, too, even though they haven't found it yet. This Butto jewel, what color is it? It's a bright, sparkling jewel with countless colors. Butto is a special asset of the Lord Butta, a gleaming aggregate of knowledge, not a material thing. The Lord Butta bequeathed it to us many years ago, but since then it's gone missing and we no longer know how to find it. But its location is not so important. If you're trying to find it, what's important is to sit and walk thinking Butto, 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 exclusively within your heart. Keep your attention focused within your body, not letting it wander outside. Fix your awareness firmly on the repetition of Butto, Butto. If you can manage to do this, you may even come across Butto before I do. How long must we sit and walk searching for Butto before we find it? To begin with, sit or walk for about 15 to 20 minutes at a time. Butto doesn't want you to spend too much time searching for it yet. It's afraid you'll grow tired and so be unable to keep up with it. Losing interest, you will not want to search anymore. Then you'll miss it altogether. 
this is enough to get you started. If I elaborate any further, you won't remember it all, thus jeopardizing your chances of meeting Butto. With these instructions in mind, the villager returned home. He didn't take leave of Atariyaman in any special way, because that was not the hill tribe custom. Deciding that it was time to go, he simply got up and left. As soon as he arrived at the village, everyone gathered around to hear what had taken place. He explained why Atsariyaman sat still with his eyes closed and why he paced back and forth. He was searching for the precious Jembudto, and not, as they had presumed, because he was a tiger in disguise. He then explained Atsariyaman's brief instructions on how to find Butto. Once the villagers knew the method, everyone, from the headmen on down to the women and older children, began to practice, mentally repeating Butto. Several days later, something truly amazing happened. The Tamma of the Lord Putta arose clearly in the heart of one of the villagers. While mentally repeating the word Butto over and over again, as Atsariyaman had suggested, one man in the village found Tamma. His heart attained a state of peace and calm. A few days earlier, the man had dreamed that Atsariyaman was placing a very large, bright shining candle on top of his head. The moment Atsariyaman set the candle on his head, his whole body, from the head on down, was brightly illuminated. He felt overjoyed as the radiance spreading out around him illuminated the surrounding area as well. Soon after he attained this state of tranquility, he went to tell Atsariyaman about his achievement and about the amazing dream he had prior to it. Atsariyaman then gave him additional instructions on how to proceed with his practice. As it turned out, his progress was very quick. He was soon able to psychically know other people's thoughts. He informed Atsariyaman of this very matter-of-factly, in the forthright manner typical of forest people. Some time later, this man declared to Atsariyaman that he had examined Atsariyaman's chitta and had clearly seen its characteristics. Playfully, Atsariyaman asked if he could see much evil in his chitta. The man answered without hesitation, "'Your chitta has no focal point whatsoever.' only an absolutely incredible radiance shining within. Your preeminence is unrivaled anywhere in the world. I've never seen anything like it. You've been here about a year now. Why didn't you teach me about this right from the beginning? How could I teach you? You never came to ask me any questions. I didn't know you were a supreme master. Had I known, I'd have come for sure. Now we all know you're an extremely clever person, when we came asking you why you sat still with your eyes closed and what you were looking for as you paced back and forth, you told us your butto was lost and asked us to help you find it. When asked to describe it, you said butto is a bright, sparkling jewel. But in truth, the real butto is your heart. The missing butto was simply a clever ploy to persuade us to meditate on butto so that our hearts could become bright like yours. Now we realize that you're a supremely wise person whose only desire was for us to discover the supreme Butto in our own hearts, thus ensuring our long-term welfare and happiness. The news of this man's attainment of Tamma spread rapidly through the community, further arousing everyone's interest in Butto meditation so that even small children took it up. Their faith in Atsariya Man thus reinforced, their reverence for his teaching steadily increased. No one ever mentioned tigers in disguise again. From that time on, the man who had learned to meditate carried Atsariyaman's alms bowl back to his forest retreat every day after the alms round. After Atsariyaman finished eating, he would then seek advice on his practice. On the days when he had business to attend to, he told someone to inform Atsariyaman that he wouldn't be available to carry the alms bowl. Although quite a few men and women in the village learned to meditate, this first man was the most accomplished. When people are satisfied, everything else naturally falls into place. For instance, previously these people were not the least bit interested in how Atsariyaman ate or slept, or even whether he lived or died. But later, when faith and respect arose in them, those things that previously were scarce soon became plentiful. Without having to be asked, the villagers joined forces to make him a walking path. They also built him a hut and a platform on which to sit and have his meal. When they came to help, they disguised their praises of him in reproachful tones. Look at that walking meditation path. It's all overgrown with vegetation. You'd have to be a wild boar to penetrate that thicket. And yet you still insist on walking there. You're really weird, you know. When we ask you what the path is for, you say it's a place to search for butto. I've lost my butto. When asked why you sit still with your eyes closed, again you say you're looking for butto. 
Here you are, a supreme master, yet you don't tell anyone about it. You're the strangest person we've ever known, but we like you just the way you are. Your bed is a carpet of moldy-smelling leaves strewn over the ground. How could you stand it all these months? It looks like a pig's lair. Looking at it now, we feel so sorry for you we could cry. We were very stupid, all of us. We didn't realize what a wonderful person you are. Worse than that, a few of us accused you of having sinister motives, convincing the rest to dislike and distrust you. Finally, now the whole village trusts and reveres you. Acharya Man said that when hill tribe people decided to trust and respect someone, their belief was heartfelt and unequivocal. Their loyalty was unconditional. They would sacrifice their lives if they had to. They took what they were taught to heart, conducting themselves accordingly. As they became more familiar with the method and more proficient in their practice, Acharya Man taught them to steadily increase the amount of time they spent doing Bhutto meditation. Acharya Man stayed with those people for over a year, from February of one year to April of the following year, until he finally left. However, because of his great compassion for them, taking leave of them was very difficult for him. They were very reluctant to see him go. They assured him that, were he to remain there until he died, the whole community would arrange for his cremation. Those people were willing to put their complete trust in him out of a deep sense of love and devotion. Unmistakably, they had seen for themselves the good results of his teaching. And to their credit, they were smart enough to see their own faults as well. Once they came to know him as a truly virtuous, highly respected monk, they realized their mistake and so begged his forgiveness. He forgave them, later telling his disciple that their amends were complete. This meant that the two of them were then free to go somewhere else. But taking leave of them was no simple matter. Atsariya Man said that it was moving beyond description to witness their affection and deep devotion as they beseeched him to stay. Having heard that he was preparing to leave, the whole village came out, weeping and pleading with him until the entire forest was disturbed by the commotion. It sounded as though they were mourning the dead. While explaining his reasons for leaving, he tried to comfort them, assuring them that such distress was unwarranted. He counseled self-restraint, which is the way of Tamma. When they calmed down, seemingly resigned to his departure, he began to leave his forest retreat. Then something totally unexpected happened. All the villagers, including the children, ran after him. Surrounding him on the path, they proceeded to snatch away his requisites. Some grabbed his umbrella, his bowl, and his water kettle, while others clutched at the robes he wore or clung to his arms and legs, trying to pull him back again, acting just like children. They were determined to not let him go. Atsariya Man was obliged once again to explain his reasons for leaving, consoling them until they calmed down. Finally they agreed. But no sooner had he started walking off than the crying began and they rushed to drag him back again. Several hours passed before he eventually got away. Meanwhile, the whole forest was disturbed by noisy scenes of hysteria that were heartrending to watch. The initial epithet, tigers in disguise, meant nothing to them then. In its place had arisen deep reverence and attachment for a man of supreme virtue. In the end, these hill tribe people couldn't hold back their emotions. As they gathered around him crying and pleading, their many voices merged into a crescendo. Hurry back to visit us again. Please don't be gone long. We miss you so much already, it's breaking our hearts. Having arrived in the area surrounded by suspicion and dissatisfaction, Atsarayaman departed amid emotional scenes of affection and attachment. He had managed to turn something unseemly into something beautiful, so enhancing its value immensely as befits one ordained as a disciple of the Buddha. The Buddha's disciples never hold grudges or look to blame others. Should anyone dislike them, they will try to help that person with loving compassion. They never take offense at other people's misbehavior, nor do they harbor feelings of animosity that could lead to mutual recriminations. A heart full to overflowing with loving compassion inspires faith in those ablaze with gilesas by providing them with a peaceful, dependable refuge. A heart of such loving grace possesses virtuous qualities that are unparalleled in the world. Later, when listening to Atsariya Man tell this story, we couldn't help sympathizing with the hill tribe people. We formed in our minds a clear image of those chaotic scenes in the forest, as though we were watching a movie. 
we could imagine the villagers' potent faith, ready to sacrifice anything for this man of supreme virtue. All they asked was a chance to bask in his aura of loving kindness, thus continuing to enjoy a life of prosperity. So they cried and pleaded with him, clutching at his arms and legs, pulling on his robes and other requisites, until he returned to the small eating platform with a thatched roof that had been a source of such contentment. Though an incredibly moving occasion, the time had come for him to move on. No one can possibly negate the transient nature of the world. The driving principle of constant change keeps everything moving. Nothing can halt its progress. For this reason, when the right time came, Atsariyaman had to leave, though he fully understood the position of those faithful villagers who were so emotionally attached to him. Although Atsariyaman was once labelled a tiger in disguise by the hill tribe people, it is well known that he was, in truth, a pure one, who existed as an incomparable field of merit for the world. Atsariyaman left that mountain community in order to follow his natural inclination, to be of the most benefit to the greatest number of people. Buddhism is a priceless inheritance that has always been an integral part of our very existence. But perhaps it too could fall prey to insidious accusations of being a tiger in disguise, much in the same manner that Atsariyaman did. It could end up being severely damaged by people whose views are hostile to Buddhist principles and traditions. In truth, this process has already begun, so we should not be complacent. If we fail to fulfill our obligations, we may forfeit this inheritance, only to regret it later. Atsariyaman followed the way of Sukato. When living deep in the forests and mountains, he was constantly of service to the hill tribesmen, or else the devas, brahmas, ghosts, nagas, and garudas. He was always compassionately assisting the world in some way or another. In human society, he taught monks, novices, and lay people from all walks of life without exception. People everywhere sought him out to hear his instructions. They all gained an enormous benefit from his teachings, always delivered in a thorough, coherent manner that would be hard for anyone else to equal. While he lived in the mountains of Chiang Mai, the hill tribe people received great joy, listening to his tamma discourses in the late afternoons. Later at night he taught tamma to was from various levels of existence, always responding to their many inquiries. Teaching was was a heavy responsibility, since it was difficult to find another monk with the same psychic skills to stand in for him. Teaching people was a responsibility that could be delegated to others. At least the people listening would gain enough understanding to derive some benefit if they made the effort. Atsariyaman's relationship with Dewas of all realms was of primary importance to him. So his biography is interspersed with stories about them at different times and different places, right to the very end. Not so long ago, I went to pay my respects to a Vipassanaga Martana Atsariya of the highest caliber, a senior monk with an exceptionally kind, gentle disposition who is greatly revered by monks and lay people all over Thailand. When I arrived, he was discussing Tamma with several of his close disciples, so I took the opportunity to join them. We began by discussing various practical aspects of Tamma, eventually coming around to the subject of Atsariya Man, who had been his teacher. In the past, he lived under Atsariya Man's tutelage in the remote mountains of Chiang Mai, training with him at a forest retreat that was several days' walk from the nearest town. It's hard to find words to describe the many remarkable, amazing stories he told me that day. I shall relate the ones I feel are appropriate here, while the others I shall skip, for reasons I explained earlier. This Atsariya said that, besides his undoubted purity of heart, Atsariyaman also possessed many unique abilities that inspired awe in his students and assured their vigilance at all times. He said he couldn't possibly remember all of the strange, unusual stories he had heard from Atsariyaman. So I urged him to tell me what he could remember. His words would serve as a memorial, a source of inspiration for future generations. This is what he said. Atsariyaman knew everything I was thinking. What more can I say? I felt as though I were on a tight leash day and night. Such was the vigilance I applied to observing my mind. Despite my best efforts, he could still catch my errant thoughts, publicly exposing them for everyone to hear. 
My meditation was actually quite good while staying with him, but I couldn't always prevent stray thoughts from arising. We should never underestimate the mind's ability to think incessantly, day and night, non-stop. How many of us can catch up with our thoughts long enough to restrain them effectively? So I was constantly on guard, for he was better at catching my thoughts than I was. Sometimes he brought up thoughts that I'd forgotten having. Suddenly I was made to recall thoughts that had long since passed. I asked the Atsarya if Atsarya Mun had ever scolded him. He told me, Occasionally he did, but more often he read my thoughts than used them as a way of teaching me tamma. Sometimes other monks were listening as well, which really embarrassed me. Fortunately, if other monks sat listening, Atsarya Man never revealed the name of the offender. He merely spoke about the relative merits of the thoughts in question. I wanted to know why he thought Atsarya Man scolded him sometimes. He said, Do you know the word patujjana? It means a mind denser than a mountain of stone, careening out of control. It doesn't consider whether thoughts are good or bad, right or wrong, which was a sufficient reason for him to give a scolding. I asked him if he felt afraid when Atsariyaman scolded him. Why shouldn't I have been afraid? My body may not have been shaking, but my mind certainly was. I almost forgot to breathe at times. I have no doubt that Atsariyaman truly did know the minds of others. I experienced it myself. He could literally collect all my thoughts, then confront me with them later. For example, from time to time I rather foolishly thought about going off on my own. If such a thought occurred to me at night, early the next morning, as soon as I encountered him, Atsariyaman immediately started lecturing me. Just where do you think you're going? It's far better here than anywhere else. It's best that you stay here with me. And so on. He never let these thoughts pass undetected. It's more enjoyable here. Staying here and listening to the tamma is better than going off on your own. He never would consent to my going. I believe he was worried that my meditation practice might deteriorate, so he tried to keep me under his tutelage the whole time. The thing that terrified me about him was day or night. Whenever I decided to focus my chitta's attention on him, I saw him staring back at me. It seemed he never took a rest. There were nights when I didn't dare lie down, because I could visualize him sitting right in front of me, scrutinizing my every movement. Whenever I focused my chitta on external objects, I invariably found him there looking at me. Because of this, my mindfulness was constantly alert. As his students, we were forced to be mindful. Following him on alms round, we carefully kept our thoughts under control, restraining our minds from straying beyond the confines of our bodies. Were we careless... We could expect to hear about it, sometimes immediately. Consequently, we exerted mindfulness over our thoughts, at all times. Even then, he could usually find something to lecture us about, and always with good reason. Inevitably, at least one monk among us gave Atsariyaman cause to speak out. During the evening meeting, Atsariyaman might speak in a scolding tone about some rather strange affair that seemed to make no sense. As soon as the meeting adjourned, the monks would quietly ask around to find out whose thoughts he was censuring that day. Eventually, one of the monks confessed that, as strange as it might seem, he actually had been thinking such nonsense. Living with Acharyaman was a wonderful experience, for fear of him always promoted a mindful attitude within each of us. This Acharya told me that when he first arrived in Chiang Mai, he went to stay at one of the local monasteries. Having been there less than an hour, he saw a car pull into the monastery grounds and come to a stop right in front of the hut he had just moved into. When I looked out to see who had come, there was Atsariya Man. Hurrying down to receive him, I respectfully asked why he had come. He replied without hesitation that he came to pick me up. He said that he knew the night before that I would be coming. I asked if someone had informed him that I would be arriving in Chiang Mai. He replied that it was beside the point how he had learned of it. He knew about it and wanted to be here, so he just came on his own. Hearing that, I became apprehensive. And the more I considered the implications, the more apprehensive I grew. Later, when I was living with him, all my fears were confirmed. If our minds were free of conceited opinions when we received his tamma discourse, then we became pleasantly absorbed in listening. His entire discourse was tamma, pure and simple. 
and it engaged our full attention more than anything else we had ever heard. On the other hand, if a monk listened half-heartedly, burdened by the weight of worldly thoughts, then we soon perceived fire in his discourse, and the offending monk would promptly feel the heat. In giving a talk, Atsariyaman was not concerned about whose kilesas his words might disturb. His tamma rushed to confront the kilesas at just that point where they were most prolific. Occasionally he did identify a monk by name, confronting him directly. Why were you meditating like that last night? That's not the right way to meditate. You must do it this way. Or, why were you thinking like that this morning? If you want to avoid being ruined by such harmful thinking, then don't think like that again. Why don't you think and act in ways that the Lord Buddha has taught us? What's the matter with you? We're here to train ourselves in the way of Tamma in order to get rid of wrong attitudes and erroneous thinking. We are not here to indulge our thoughts, burning ourselves with them the way you've been doing. Those who wholeheartedly accepted the truth lived contentedly with him, and he didn't say much to them. But any furtiveness caused him deep misgivings, as though the offending thoughts were fire burning him, and he would suddenly make a surprising comment about it. If, however, the monk realized his mistake and changed his attitude, then nothing further was said, and the matter rested there. Powerful Magic One evening, a group of hill tribesmen from a village near Acharyaman's residence began wondering among themselves whether Acharyaman had any magic formulas to ward off and chase away ghosts. So they decided to go the next day to ask if he had anything he could give them. Early the next morning, Atsariyaman related this incident to the monks living with him. Last night, while sitting in meditation, I overheard a group of hill tribesmen in the village wondering if we monks might have some magic formulas for warding off and chasing away ghosts. They intend to come here today to ask us about it. Should they come, give them the formula Bhutto Tammo Sankho to meditate on. It's an excellent formula against ghosts, for the only thing that ghosts fear in this world are the Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sankha. Not a single ghost would dare stand against them. That morning, just as Atsariyaman had foreseen, the hill tribesmen came to request a magic formula against ghosts. Atsariyaman gave them the formula Buddha, Tammo, Sankho, as well as the method for using it. Assuring them that ghosts were terrified of this formula, he told them to mentally recite Bhutto, Tammo, or Sankho, whichever they preferred. With Atsariyaman's instructions fresh in their minds, they began what they thought to be a ritual for warding off ghosts, unaware that, in truth, he had given them a meditation subject. Using this method, they attained Samadhi before long. The next morning they rushed off to see Atsariyaman and told him what had happened. He assured them that they were practicing the formula correctly, and because of that, ghosts in the area were terrified and bound to run away. Now protected by the power of Tamma, they no longer had to fear ghosts. In fact, ghosts had already begun to fear even those people in the village who couldn't yet meditate. Being inherently good, honest folks, hill tribe people were easy to teach. When Atsariyaman instructed them to meditate each day, they took up the practice with such sincerity that before long some of them were getting exceptionally good results. Their hearts became brightly illuminated, and they were able to know the minds of other people, including those of the monks in the monastery, just like the man in the previous story about tigers in disguise. On visits to the monastery, they spoke to Atsariyaman about their meditation practice, describing their extraordinary perceptual abilities. Some of the monks were astonished and worried that these people might be able to read their thoughts. Though timid by nature, they nonetheless wanted to find out what the people knew. They couldn't resist the temptation of asking for specific information about their own thoughts. The hill tribesmen told them the truth. Still not convinced, the monks challenged them. Unfazed by a display of their own ignorance, they cross-examined the hill tribesmen closely to find out if they truly could read thoughts. It was as though they believed that their minds were tightly sealed by hundreds of impenetrable layers. The hill tribesmen answered with the customary frankness of forest people who are uninhibited by social formalities, answers which left the monks feeling very vulnerable. After that, they remained apprehensive that these people might have access to everything they were thinking. 
These same hill tribesmen casually informed Acharya Mun that they knew about the state of his chitta, having checked it out first, before checking on that of the other monks. What's my chitta like? Is it afraid of ghosts? Your chitta is devoid of all traces of conventional reality. All that's left is nibbana in a human body. Your chitta is absolutely supreme. It fears nothing. After that, the villagers made no further mention of ghosts. Those accomplished in meditation informed the others who gradually came to have faith in Atsariyaman and the Buddha thus losing interest in the business of ghosts. Every morning, they gathered together in the village center to offer alms to the monks. Having placed some food in each monk's bowl, they received a blessing from Atsariyaman. He taught them to show their appreciation by exclaiming Sadhu together in a loud voice, allowing the devas to rejoice in their offerings and receive a portion of the merit as well. Each day, the villagers responded faithfully by loudly calling out Sadhu. Atsariyaman had them exclaim Sadhu, for he knew from the devas, who came to hear his tamma talks every night, that this sound reached them in the realms where they lived. Hearing this sound, they knew that Atsariyaman was living in the area. Devas who visited Atsariyaman were invariably escorted by a leader who was in charge of the group. These groups represented many different realms of existence. Some were terrestrial devas from near and far. Many were from the various celestial realms mentioned in the Buddhist texts. When a group of devas intended to pay Atsariyaman a visit, he always knew their time of arrival in advance. If he knew, for instance, that a group intended to arrive at 2 or 3 a.m., he would take some rest beforehand, getting up to enter Samadhi only when the time approached to receive them. If, however, they were scheduled to arrive around midnight, he would first enter and then wait for them in Samadhi. This was accomplished in two stages. First, he practiced normal meditation until he attained a deep state of calm, where he rested for a while. Then, as the time approached, he withdrew to just the right meditative level to receive his intended visitors. There, he knew intuitively whether or not they had arrived, or whether they were still on their way. Having acknowledged their arrival, he then discussed with them whatever seemed appropriate for their particular circumstances. Had he remained in a deep state of samadhi, his visitors would not have been able to have access to him. In normal waking consciousness, on the other hand, one would have to be a very skilled person indeed to be able to acknowledge and interact with beings from other realms. Even were he able to acknowledge them, it would still be easier to accomplish this at the appropriate level of samadhi. For this reason, Upatsada Samadhi, the access gate, is a level suitable to nearly every eventuality. Atsariyaman became an expert in these matters during his sojourn at Tsarika cave many years before. At that time, he had been an ordained monk for twenty-two years. By the time he passed away, after spending a total of sixty years in the robes, he had become a true master of these matters. Everyone in the world has the same potential for perceiving such phenomena as Atsariyaman. They need only to develop it. But very few can develop his exceptional skills. However, even though they fell short of his total mastery, if people could develop at least some skill, it would be sufficient for witnessing such things. Instead, being unable to see them, people tend to believe that such phenomena do not actually exist in the world around them. It's difficult to convince people who lack sufficient knowledge of Tamma for endowing their hearts with a strong spiritual basis. Should our hearts develop the principles of Tamma, principles certifying the true nature of all phenomena, and gain the necessary skills, then no amount of denial could possibly negate what we clearly see for ourselves. Even if everyone on earth insisted on denying the existence of such things, it would merely be an empty denial. The true nature of what we perceive remains unchanged. Nothing can possibly alter it. Truth does not depend on beliefs or opinions of any kind. It is true according to immutable natural principles. Atsariyaman wandered far and wide throughout most of the remote and mountainous districts of Chiang Mai province, traveling more extensively there than in any other province. He remained in Chiang Mai much longer than he did in other places, largely because it was suitable for meditation. It was conducive to the many kinds of insights that were a unique feature of his practice. He claimed there were many reasons for his long sojourn there. First of all, the environment was suitable to meditation. Secondly, he felt sorry for the hill tribes people who needed his assistance and was reluctant to abandon them. 
Although it was sparsely populated, many extraordinary individuals lived in that area. They needed proper training and encouragement to ensure their steady progress and to avert disappointment and reversal to their old ways. And then there were all the Dewas whom he was determined to assist. Groups of Dewas and Nagas usually came to ask questions and listen to his discourses at least twice a month. He said that, at night, he was always busy receiving visitors from all over the celestial and terrestrial realms. Before speaking with Atsariya Man, the leader of each group would announce the approximate number of Dewas present on that occasion. For instance, ten or a hundred thousand celestial Dewas are here today, or one to ten thousand terrestrial Dewas, or five hundred to a thousand Nagas. Almost daily, when he walked meditation in the late afternoon, Atsariyaman would be informed of the hour of arrival of one group or another from these different realms. Occasionally, he received the information later on during seated meditation. There were nights when several different groups announced their impending visit, and he had to arrange specific times for each group so that their visits did not overlap. He did not have them come simultaneously, because relative spiritual development varied among the different realms, and his Dhamma teachings had to vary accordingly to be appropriate for each group. Since one group preferred hearing a certain aspect of Tamma, while another group preferred something different, Atsariyaman arranged separate visits to ensure that his discourse was suitable to everyone present. This was done for his own convenience, as well as that of his visitors. Such obligations were a major part of the reason for his long stay in Chiang Mai. As a matter of fact, the number of Dewas of all types who visited him there well exceeded the number of people, Nagas, Garudas, and other spirits combined. In reality, very few individuals can achieve telepathic communication with devas, which is essential for teaching them. Devas often complain to Atsariya Man that, unaware of the existence of devas, human beings have no understanding about devas and are not interested in knowing that devic existence is another state of sentient existence adhering to the principles of Gamma. Devic existence is irrelevant to most human beings, who fail to recognize that Dewas also have hopes and aspirations, just like everyone else. Rarely did Dewas encounter a man of supreme virtue, like Atsariya Man, a man who possessed the intuitive insight to realize that animals, humans, Dewas, and all other forms of existence are undeniably real, and should be honored as such. They could not help feeling an overwhelming sense of joy upon meeting him, they so enjoyed coming to pay him their respects, ask him questions, and listen to his teaching. They wanted to imbibe his exquisite tamma to nourish their hearts, thus increasing their happiness and well-being, and sustaining their whole existence. For this reason, devas everywhere venerate anyone possessing extremely high virtue. Relating that devas are just as important as all other living beings, Atsariyaman understood their intentions and sympathized with their meritorious aspirations. He stated that, intent on improving themselves, the Dewas who came to him for assistance greatly outnumbered the human beings who visited him. Still, they remain a mystery to people who lack the proper psychic skills. Though appearing on the surface to be an insoluble problem for human society, it need not be an insurmountable obstacle for a person wishing to truly know and understand these things. For those skilled in the ways of the citta, psychic communication is just as normal as any other aspect of human existence. Certainly, Atsariyaman considered it commonplace, allowing him to function effectively with Dewas throughout his life. Regardless of where he lived, he always remained in contact with Dewas requiring his assistance. This was especially true in Chiang Mai province, because such beings preferred to contact him when he was living in remote, isolated places, free from human congestion. The forests and mountains of Chiang Mai were ideal in this respect. Atsariyaman had few social obligations there, so he could devote more time to his Dewa visitors. A strange incident occurred while he was living among the Museor people, deep in the mountains, near Ikao village. A group of Dewas from Germany came to visit him. They wished to hear a discourse that would give them a victory formula. Focusing his citta on their request, an appropriate Tamma verse arose, Akgo Tena Jinego Tang. It means, conquer anger with lack of anger. Atsariyaman elaborated on this theme with the assembled Devas. Conquer anger with lack of anger. Remember this. For anyone hoping to achieve victory, this is the most important Tamma to practice. Consider it well. 
It is the main source of peace and happiness in the world. Love and kindness, these are an effective deterrence against an evil such as anger. By helping to reduce anger's power to destroy human and devic societies alike, loving kindness fosters peace and prosperity everywhere. Thus, this loving attitude is a prerequisite for social harmony, one we should all strive to develop. In a world lacking this victory formula, dissatisfaction and unrest will arise at the very least. At the extreme, the world will be consumed by mortal strife. Anger and resentment can never defeat our enemies, for they are evils that succeed only in indiscriminately destroying us and everyone close to us. The more anger is used, the more the world we live in becomes a sea of flames, burning uncontrollably toward total annihilation. Anger is actually a type of fire that's inherent in the nature of this world. Although it has no physical properties, it does succeed in creating havoc in its wake. So anyone desiring a stable, sensible world, a place worth living in, should realize the disastrous harm that the fires of anger and resentment can cause, and refrain from ever using them. Starting a fire like this merely causes oneself and everyone else to suffer. Mutual feelings of affection and loving-kindness among all living beings maintain the world in its proper equilibrium. Oppressive forces of unrestrained anger and selfish pride should never be allowed to run rampant, causing a never-ending cycle of destruction. With his acute wisdom, the Lord but to realize the indisputable harm caused by anger. He saw the value of loving-kindness as a gentle force that can spontaneously join all living beings in a sense of mutual harmony and goodwill, for all share a common desire for happiness and a common dislike of pain. For this reason, he taught that love and kindness were powerful means of maintaining peace and security in the world. So long as living beings still have loving kindness in their hearts, there's every chance that their desire for happiness will be fulfilled. But should their hearts become estranged from thoughts of loving kindness, then even with all the material comforts, their lives will still be devoid of genuine peace and happiness. Angry, hateful people tend to encounter only trouble feeling resentful and annoyed wherever they go. Once we know with certainty that tamma is something truly beneficial to us, we can clearly see that a heart full of brutality is like a blazing fire gradually destroying everything in its path. We must then urgently strive to overcome these dangers as best we can. You may never again get such a good opportunity, so take advantage of it now and avoid regrets in the future. The world is in a constant state of change, and that changing world is situated right here in the bodies and minds of us all. Such was the essence of the victory formula that Atsariyaman gave to the Devas from Germany. As soon as Atsariyaman finished speaking, they gave a thunderous sadhu in unison that echoed throughout the world systems. Atsariyaman asked how they knew where he was staying, since, in human terms, they lived so far away. They replied that they always knew precisely where he was staying. More than that, they was from Thailand regularly visit the Devas of Germany. In truth, Devas don't consider the distance between countries like Thailand and Germany to be very great, the way human beings do. They simply think of it as an area through which they can easily and naturally pass back and forth. Whereas humans travel by foot or by vehicle, Devas transport themselves by means of a supernormal power, that is equivalent to transferring consciousness to a particular destination. It arrives there instantly. So devas can move around much more easily than human beings. Atsariyaman said that the devas from Germany regularly came to listen to his tamma talks, much in the same way that terrestrial devas came from all over Thailand to hear him. Both celestial and terrestrial devas tended to show their respect for him in a similar fashion. If Atsariyaman was living with a group of monks, they was who came to see him never passed through the area where the monks had their living quarters. Besides that, they tended to arrive very late at night when all the monks were asleep. Upon arrival, they circumambulated Atsariyaman clockwise, three times, in a calm, composed manner. When they departed, again circumambulating him clockwise three times, they first withdrew to a respectful distance. When they reached the edge of his living area, they simply floated into the air like puffs of cotton. All types of devas demonstrated their respect for him in this fashion. 
Acharya Man found the mountains of Chiang Mai to be an ideal environment for meditation. Heart free and mind unencumbered, he lived a life of complete ease, abiding sublimely in Tamma. Tamma was the enduring source of comfort in his life. With no intrusions taking up his time, he was free to meditate whenever he wished. He lived a very healthy, contented life there. As for his teaching obligations, the devas, who came only at night, were beings of a refined nature, so they were hardly a burden. Sometimes in the afternoon or early evening he gave helpful advice to the local lay community. The monks living under his tutelage assembled for instruction in the evening, at about 7 p.m. Most of his students had already achieved a certain level of proficiency in the practice of samadhi and in the various stages of wisdom. Being wholly committed to the practice, they listened to his teaching, striving to attain magga, pala, and nibbana. When Acharya Man taught a group of monks whose individual levels of mental development varied, he always structured his discourses to encompass all levels of practice, from basic samadhi through the higher levels of wisdom to the most subtle level of all, the realization of nibbana. Monks skilled in meditation became so absorbed in the successive stages of his discourse that they lost all sense of time and place. Practicing monks were usually given a talk lasting for at least two hours, but the monks were less interested in the time than they were in the flow of his tamma discourse, as they were able to gradually increase their own understanding with each successive stage. Consequently, listening to tamma in an attentive, thoughtful manner is itself a valuable meditation practice, one that is equally as important as other methods. For his part, the teacher is determined that his audience realize the truth of what he teaches every step of the way. He points out the kind of thoughts that are truly harmful as well as those that are truly beneficial, so his students will understand which thinking is faulty and should be abandoned, and which has merit and should be developed further. More than at any comparable time, those focusing their undivided attention on the citta, the focal point of tamma, can expect to attain some degree of calm and samadhi, or receive various techniques for investigating with wisdom while they listen to the teacher discuss these topics. Thus, the diligent meditator can progress step by step while listening to his teacher's instructions, receiving an insight into one aspect of tamma today, another aspect of tamma tomorrow. Students manage to strengthen their mindfulness and wisdom every time they listen. Since the teacher has realized the truth of tamma within himself, he can point directly to that same truth existing within his students. Listening to his detailed explanations, they can progressively develop their skills in all aspects of samadhi and wisdom, allowing them to successfully pass through each level of meditation practice until they reach the highest tamma. Tutanga monks have always considered hearing tamma an essential part of their practice, one they seek to maintain as long as there is a skilled teacher to whom they can listen. For this reason, truly dedicated Tutanga monks like to search out a teacher who can guide them in their meditation practice. They cherish and revere a teacher in whom they feel they can put their complete trust. His advice is sincerely taken to heart, carefully contemplated, and wholeheartedly put into practice. They routinely consult with him, asking for specific advice on any doubtful points arising in their practice, then adjust their practice according to his recommendations. For this reason, Tutanga monks have always preferred to gather around eminently qualified meditation masters, such as Acharya Man and Acharya Sao. Both of those great teachers had unusually large numbers of disciples among the Dutanga monks of Thailand's northeast region. But in Acharya Man's case, once he moved to Chiang Mai, he resolved to avoid his fellow monks and practice deliberately on his own, without the added burden of responsibility that teaching entails. In the beginning, he wanted to accelerate his drive for the ultimate goal. Later, he found it conducive to living in comfort. All the same, he had to accept certain obligations to teach monks as well as lay people, and it's well known that he had many disciples all over Thailand. In the period before Acharya Man went off alone to make his decisive push in the wilds of Chiang Mai, he often mentioned that spiritually he still was not strong enough, either in his own practice or in his ability to teach others. So he resolved to go away and practice with the utmost diligence until no doubts of any kind remained in his heart. From that time on, he never mentioned anything about lacking sufficient strength. Big Brother Elephant Once Atarya Man was wandering to Thanga in the Chiang Mai Mountains with two other monks, Atarya Kao of Wat Tham Klong Pen Monastery in Udon Thani Province, and Atarya Maha Tongsak of Wat Sutawat Monastery in Zakon Nakon Province. 
As they reached a narrow gap in the path leading up the mountain, they chanced upon a large, solitary elephant whose owner had released it and then wandered off some place. All they could see there was a gigantic elephant with huge six-foot tusks searching for food. Quite a fearsome sight. They conferred among themselves about how to proceed. This was the only path up the mountain, and it allowed no room for going around the elephant. Atari Amun told Atari Akau to speak with the elephant, which was eating bamboo leaves at the side of the path. Standing about twenty yards away with its back to them, it had yet to notice their approach. Atari Akau addressed the elephant. "'Big Brother Elephant, we wish to speak with you.' At first the elephant didn't clearly hear his voice, but it did stop chewing the bamboo leaves. "'Big Brother Elephant, we wish to speak with you.' Clearly hearing this, the elephant suddenly swung around to face the monks. It stood stock still, its ears fully extended. "'Big Brother Elephant, we wish to speak with you.' You are so very big and strong. We're just a group of monks, so weak and so very frightened of you, Big Brother. We would like to walk past where you're standing. Would Big Brother please move over a bit so that we have room to pass by? If you keep standing there, it really frightens us, so we don't dare walk past. As soon as he finished speaking, the elephant immediately turned to the side and thrust its tusks into the middle of a clump of bamboo, signaling its intention to let them pass unharmed. Seeing it facing the clump of bamboo, Atsariyaman told the others that they could continue on as it would not bother them now. The two monks invited Atsariyaman to walk between them, Atsariyakao walking in front and Atsariyamahat Tongsak following behind. They walked past in single file only six feet from the elephant's rear end without incident. But as they were walking away, the hook on Atsariyamahat Tongsak's umbrella got tangled by chance in some bamboo just a few yards past the elephant. It defied all attempts to extricate it, so he was forced to struggle with it for quite some time. Terrified of the elephant, which was now looking right at him, he was soon drenched in sweat. Fighting desperately to disentangle the hook, he glanced up at the eyes of the elephant, which stood there like a huge stuffed animal. He could see that its eyes were bright and clear. In truth, its countenance inspired affection rather than fear, but at that moment his fear remained strong. When he finally did get free, his fear subsided, and he realized that this elephant was a very endearing animal. Seeing that they were all safely passed, Atsariya Kao turned to the elephant. Hey, big brother, we've all passed by now. Please relax and eat in peace. As soon as he finished speaking, the sound of crunching, breaking bamboo filled the air. Later, the monks praised this intelligent elephant, agreeing it was an animal that inspired affection and sympathy. The only faculty it lacked was the ability to speak. As they were discussing this, Atsariya Mahat Tongsak was curious to hear Atsariya Man's reaction. So he asked, Were you able to read that elephant's mind the whole time, from the moment we spoke to it until we passed clear of it? Since it was so endearing, I'd really like to know. When it first heard us call out, suddenly turning around to face us in an agitated fashion, I was sure it was about to charge and crush us to pieces right then and there. But as soon as it understood the situation, it had a change of heart, almost like a person in an animal's body, and quickly thrust its tusks into the middle of that clump of bamboo and stood very still. Clearly it seemed to be telling us, You little brothers can come now. Big Brother won't do anything. Big Brother has put away his weapons. Believe me, come along. Atsare Mahat Tongsak then teased Atsare Akao. Atsare Akao is really amazing, speaking with an animal as though it was just another human being. Big brother, your little brothers are frightened and dare not pass. Please make way, so that we can go by without fearing, big brother. As soon as it received this bit of flattery, it was so pleased that it immediately prepared to make way for us. But this little brother was really clumsy. I got past big brother, only to get my umbrella hook caught up in the bamboo. Try as I might, I couldn't get it free. It was determined to keep me there with big brother. My heart sank at that moment. I was afraid that big brother wouldn't play fair. Atsariya Man laughed heartily, hearing Atsariya Mahat Tongsak teasing Atsariya Kao about being clever enough to talk to an elephant. He assured them that he had been paying attention to the elephant's mental state. Of course I was focusing my attention there. I've read the minds of birds and monkeys with far less reason than this. This was a matter of life and death. How could I avoid it? Atsariya Mahat Tongsak wanted to know what the elephant was thinking when Atsariya Man focused on it. When it first heard us, it was startled. That's why it turned around so quickly. It thought only of preparing to fight. But seeing us dressed in yellow robes, it knew instinctively that we could be trusted, for it's quite used to seeing monks. 
Its owner has long since trained it not to endanger them. So when Atariakau addressed it in a pleasant tone, calling it Big Brother, it was hugely pleased and immediately got out of the way. Did it understand every word that Atariakau said to it? Of course it did. Otherwise, how could it be trained to haul logs down from the mountains? If it couldn't understand, it would probably have been disposed of as useless long ago. This kind of animal must be trained until it knows man's language well before it can be made to perform various tasks. This particular elephant is over a hundred years old. Look at its tusks. They're almost six feet long. It must have lived among people for a long time. Its owner is relatively young, yet he's still able to drive it to work. How could it not understand human speech? It's certain to have no problem. What was it thinking when it turned and stuck its tusks into the clump of bamboo? Well, it understood the situation, as I said, and so was giving way to us. It didn't think of doing anything else. Did you focus on its mind the whole time we were walking past it? What was it thinking just as we walked by? All I saw was the elephant giving way. It wasn't thinking about anything else. The reason I asked, I was worried that as we were walking past it might have thought it would like to attack us, just for sport, as animals sometimes do. You have an uncommonly prolific imagination, Maha Tongsak. If you enjoyed thinking and asking probing questions like this about matters of substance, then you could certainly expect to transcend Dukkha one day. But you're like most people. You insist on wasting your time thinking about inane matters instead of useful ones, and you probably don't care to change. Are you going to keep pondering this matter, asking about that elephant all night without the slightest regard for Tamma? With this warning, Atsareya Mahatongsak dropped the whole affair. He was afraid that pressing the matter further would result in an even more severe rebuke. Many monks were rebuked for speaking carelessly to Atsareya Man, or speaking without good reason. Some even went mad afterwards. One rather obtrusive monk lived with Atsareya Man for a short while. When Atsareya Man made a comment, this monk liked to chime in, expressing his own views. When he first arrived, Acharyaman frequently warned him to mind his own business. He advised him to keep a close watch on his thoughts and restrain the impulse to speak out. Monks dedicated to the practice must know how to properly conduct themselves. Those who are mindful will see the inadequacies of a mind that wants to flow out. But it seems that this monk was not as interested as he should have been in Acharyaman's teaching. Atsariyaman had a unique habit of taking the animals or the people that he encountered on alms round as objects of contemplation, using them to teach the monks walking behind him. He commented out loud on what he observed, as though speaking to no one in particular. One day, he spied a cute little calf playfully running around its mother. At first, it didn't see the monks approaching, but as they came abreast, it looked around startled and raced to its mother's side, nuzzling in under her neck then peering out to look at the monks with fear in its eyes. Seeing the calf run up to her, the cow quickly turned her head to look in the direction of the monks, then remained impassive, as animals do when they are accustomed to seeing monks daily. But the calf remained under her chin, staring out distrustfully. Observing them, Atsariyaman commented in a general way about the difference between the reaction of the calf and that of its mother. That cow is quite unperturbed, but its calf is so frightened it looks like it wants to pick her up and flee. As soon as it got a glimpse of us, it ran bawling to its mother for help. People are just the same. They rush to find a reliable refuge. If they are near their mother, they will run to her. If they are near their father, they will rush to him. People invariably lean on family and friends for support. Rarely do they think about relying on themselves. When we are young, we expect to rely on other people in one way. When we grow up, we expect to rely on them in another way, and when we grow old, we still expect to rely on others in yet a different way. Very few of us turn inward, looking for support within ourselves. By constantly looking for someone else to lean on, we tend to foster our own weakness, and so never allow ourselves to become truly self-reliant. We monks are the same as lay people. Having ordained, we become lazy about studying. Worrying that it will be painful and difficult, we become lazy about practicing the way. We never seem to finish what we start, for no sooner do we have a good idea and begin to put it into practice than laziness creeps in, blocking our progress. Lacking the ability to help ourselves, we have to look to others for support. Otherwise, we couldn't carry on in this life. The maxim, Atta hi atta no nato, 
oneself is one's own refuge, is meaningless for us if we cannot breathe through our own noses. Dotanga monks who are dedicated to the practice shouldn't always have to depend on others for life and breath. Listen to your teacher, think about what he teaches, and commit yourselves to attaining it. Don't let his teaching just slip through your grasp to no avail. Be persistent. Consider what he says and follow his example until you see the benefits within yourselves. Then you no longer need to lean on him for support. You'll be breathing through your own noses, meaning you will have developed the knowledge and wisdom needed to rid yourselves of dukkha. Gradually, you will become more confident, more self-reliant, until finally you become full-fledged, fully independent monks in your own right. Atsaryaman brought up this matter to give the monks on alms round with him something to contemplate. As he paused for a moment, the rather obtrusive monk began to prattle away on his own without considering the impropriety of such an intrusion. Perhaps this monk's idiocy struck a dissonant chord deep within Acharyaman, for he turned around and gave him a severe rebuke that took the other monks aback, making them all somewhat apprehensive. You must be mad! You're like a rabid dog that pounces and chews furiously on any old piece of wood tossed at it. Why don't you look inside yourself where this madness arises? You'll go crazy if you don't curtail this sort of mindless prattle. Atsaryaman then turned around and walked back to the monastery without another word. Arriving at the monastery, the monks noticed something peculiar about the obtrusive monk. He seemed stunned, eating very little. Seeing his odd behavior, the monks kept quiet, as if nothing had happened. They were afraid he would feel embarrassed. For the rest of the day, life in the monastery continued as normal, each monk applying himself to his meditation. But later, during the night, when all was quiet, they heard someone cry out in a deranged, incoherent voice. They immediately rushed over to find the monk lying in his hut, tossing deliriously about, mumbling something about being sorry for offending Atsaryaman so rudely. Shocked by this sight, some of them hurried off to get the local villagers to help take care of him. They brought some herbal remedies for him to take, then massaged his limbs for a while, until he finally calmed down and fell asleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, someone took him to a doctor for treatment. His condition soon improved, though he did have occasional relapses. When he was well enough to travel, they sent him home. There was no further news about his condition after that. Atsaryaman's reprimands varied with circumstances. A mild scolding was usually sufficient to promote mindfulness in the present and increase vigilance in the future. However, if someone did something that prompted a severe reprimand, but lacked the good judgment to make use of it, then it could well be damaging, as we have seen. So monks living with Atsaryaman tended to be exceedingly vigilant and always self-controlled. Just because they had lived with him for a long time didn't mean they could expect to get overly familiar with him, for he was the type of person who didn't readily countenance familiarity in anyone. His students could never afford to be complacent. Sometimes even the deer that's wary of hunters gets shot. Youthful Exuberance Occasionally, when the monks living with him were highly attained individuals, Atsariman conducted himself in a naturally easy-going and relaxed manner, as one would expect among people of equal status who are all well acquainted. He was not so stern and strict at such times, but his whole demeanor could change dramatically according to the situation. He behaved quite differently in one set of circumstances than he did in another, treating each individual as a separate case. His disciples were constantly amazed at the quickness and novelty of his responses to the situations that emerged around him. Atsaryaman used to tell the monks an amusing story about his youth that illustrates his dynamic character. I shall retell it here, for it demonstrates the incredible changes that a person can go through. Back in the days when Atsaryaman was still a young layman, he used to compete in local folk singing contests known as Maulam. One day he attended a large fair in a neighboring village where thousands of people had gathered. Suddenly, he felt emboldened to get up on stage and sing in competition with a talented young woman who was a renowned folk singer in those parts. Perhaps he thought it would be fun to have a go at her on stage, or perhaps he felt a little bit in love. Who knows? At any rate, jumping up on stage, he found the young woman quite willing to accept his challenge. By the time they sang through several sets of verses, it became clear that young Mun was losing the contest. As it happened, a savior appeared just in time. 
Zhao Kun Bali, who was then a young man several years older than young Mun, had come to the same fair and was in the audience of the competition. Obviously his friend was losing badly, and things were getting worse with each new set of verses. Continued much longer, the girl would probably have driven him off the stage in disgrace, for she was a seasoned performer and young Mun was a mere novice. Acting on a bold impulse, Mun had leapt up on the stage only to meet a ferocious tigress, her mouth full of fangs, while he was just a pup sporting a few baby teeth. Dun, as Tao Kunabali was called then, anxiously thought that if his friend persisted, she would skin him alive, then sell his hide. He thought to himself, Mun doesn't know a tiger when he sees one. He just sees a young lady. He doesn't realize he's about to get slaughtered. I'll have to do something now to save his hide. If I don't, it'll be on sale in the market for sure. Having thought this, Jun jumped up on the stage and began shouting, Damn it, Mun! I've been looking for you all over the place. Your mother fell from the top of the house. I'm not sure if she's still alive or not. I saw her lying there in a heap on the ground and tried to help, but she insisted I go look for you. I've been running around all day trying to find you. I haven't eaten a thing and I'm worn out. Both Mun and the young lady were stunned into silence by this ruse. Mun immediately asked about his mother's condition. Jan, how is my mother? Jan pretended to be so exhausted he could hardly speak. I think she's probably dead by now. I'm about to die myself now from hunger and exhaustion. With that, he grabbed Mun's arm, dragging him from the stage before a crowd of thousands of shocked onlookers, and ran with him as fast as possible. By the time they reached the village outskirts, Mun was desperate to find out more about his mother. What was my mother doing on the top of the house to make her fall? I don't really know what caused her to fall. Seeing her lying there on the ground, I rushed to help, but she sent me right off to look for you, so I came straight away. I didn't have a chance to get the full story. As far as you could tell, was my mother going to die? We're on our way now to find that out for ourselves. When they had walked sufficiently far from the village that Dunn reckoned that Mun wouldn't dare go back alone at such a late hour, his whole demeanor abruptly changed as he frankly told Mun that nothing had happened to his mother. I put on that act because I couldn't bear to see your old lady mop the floor with you. I was afraid she'd skin your hide and sell it in the market. That would have been humiliating for me, and for our whole village. She was about to emasculate you there just for the fun of it. So I tricked you both into believing this story, at the same time convincing the crowd that you had to flee the scene because of a real emergency, not because you'd lost the will to fight. I rushed you away before anyone had a chance to catch on to my ruse. Even that feisty old lady of yours couldn't help being overwhelmed by my ingenious scheme. Did you see how taken in she was? Alarmed by what I said, she watched us leave with heartfelt sympathy for you and your mother. I saved you from the hell she had in store for you. Now what do you think? Wasn't that an ingenious scheme? Ah, oh, no. What a shame. Damn you, Dunn. Look what you've done to me. I was having a great time chopping her to pieces. By dragging me away, you spoiled my fun. I never imagined you'd do this to me. I'd like to have another go at her right now. I'd be the one sending her high to the market. <laughs> you were being slaughtered, and I saved your life. And now you're bragging about how good you were. Maybe I should take you back right now so your old lady can put you on the chopping block again. Look, seeing she was a woman, I'd figure I'd go easy on her at first, hoping she'd get overconfident. When I had her where I wanted her, I planned to tie her up, throw her in a sack, and sell her to the highest bidder. You failed to understand my strategy. I was baiting her, like a tiger luring a monkey. If you're so smart, then how come you fell for my little sham to pull you away from her devilish clutches? You were so shocked, you almost started crying shamelessly right in front of your lady friend. Who'd have ever considered you capable of bagging the old girl? It was obvious she was about to tie you up and throw you off the stage in full view of thousands of people. Stop bragging so much, man. You should appreciate my brotherly efforts to save you from defeat at the hands of that woman. That night, Mun and Zan both ended up missing the fair they had so looked forward to attending. Although they were still in lay life at the time, such stories about these two sages' matching wits were fascinating to hear. Despite the worldly nature of the conversation, it demonstrates how clever people converse. Each new retort captures the imagination. When Atsari Amun related stories about the two of them, we became so absorbed listening that we could almost visualize them as they spoke. There are lots of stories about these two men matching wits, but a few examples should be enough to give the reader an idea of what I mean. The clever ploys they used as young men gave an early indication of their intelligence. Eventually entering the monkhood, both became great sages, 
Tau kūnu pāle gunūpa mātaria and ātaria manpūri tatatera are renowned throughout Thailand as present-day sages of the highest caliber. I have used the diminutives jan and man because that's how ātaria man himself told the story to his students during relaxed moments when there was a break in the usual tense, guarded atmosphere the monks felt when they were around him. I sincerely apologize to both of these esteemed venerables, and to the readers as well, if anything I've written is deemed inappropriate. Had I written the story in a more formal style, the meaning would have not come across so effectively. Such familiarity implies a mutual respect among peers and is commonly used between close friends of all ages. Moreover, I find it convenient to write the story the way I originally heard it. It allows us a glimpse of these two renowned elders as high-spirited youths having a good time, which we can then compare with our usual image of them as absolutely amazing monks who completely renounce the world. Although Atsariyaman preferred to keep to the present, rarely speaking about the past, he liked to sing the praises of Zhao Kun Upali's cleverness from time to time. On one occasion, when they were discussing the story of Lord Vesantara, he asked Zhao Kun Upali about the mother of Lady Madri, a character in the story. He hadn't seen her name mentioned in the scriptures, and thought perhaps he had missed it. Chao Kuan Upali's response was immediate. What? You've never seen or heard of Madri's mother? Everyone in town knows about her. Where have you been looking that you haven't come across her yet? Admitting that he hadn't come across her name in the scriptures, Atsariya Mun wondered where it was mentioned. Scriptures? What scriptures? What about that loudmouth Mrs. Orp who lives in the big house at the crossroads on the way to the monastery? Atsariyaman was puzzled. He couldn't recall any mention of a monastery in the story. Which crossroads and what monastery was he referring to? You know, Madri's mother, whose house is right next to yours. How could you not know Madri and her mother? How pitiful! Madri and her mother live in your own home village, and you don't even recognize them. Instead, you go searching in the scriptures. I feel embarrassed for you. The moment Tao Kun Upali said that Madri and her mother lived in his home village, Atsariyaman caught on and was able to recollect them. Prior to that, he was puzzled, for he kept thinking of the Vesandra Jataka story. He said that Tao Kun Upali was very clever at skillfully matching wits, using wordplay and riposte in unexpected ways to keep his listeners off balance, thus making them use their intelligence. Atsariyaman used to laugh when he told us about falling victim to Chao Kunupali's little artifice. Atsariyaman spent one rains retreat near the village of Ban Nam Mao in the Maebang district of Chiang Mai province. Sakka, the heavenly Deva Raza, frequently came to visit, bringing a large retinue with him. Even in the dry season, when he went off into the mountains alone and stayed in Dok Kham Cave, Sakka brought his followers to visit him there. Usually numbering well over 100,000 on those occasions, they came more often and in larger numbers than other groups of devas. If some in his retinue had never come before, Sakka first explained to them the proper way to listen to Tamma. Atsariyaman usually took Metta Appamanya Brahma Vihara as the theme of his discourse, because these devas were especially fond of that subject. Being very isolated, tranquil places, Ban Nam Mao and Dok Khan Cave brought more groups of Dewas from many different realms to visit Atariyaman than did any of his other locations. These beings showed great respect for Atariyaman and for the place where he lived. Upon entering the area, they were always careful to bypass his walking meditation path, which the villagers had smoothed out with sand. It was sacrosanct. Nagas, too, avoided passage across the path when arriving for a visit. On occasions when their leader had to pass through that area, he always circled around the head of the meditation path. Sometimes the Nagas sent a messenger to invite Atariyaman to attend a function, much as humans do when they invite monks to local functions. The messengers always avoided crossing his meditation path. Occasionally, when they were unable to avoid crossing over some of the sand that the villagers had scattered around that area, they would first sweep the sand away with their hands and then crawl across. Standing up again, they walked to Atariyaman's residence. Their behavior was always wonderfully composed. Atsariyaman believed that if human beings, the custodians of the sasana, have a true interest in tamma and a deeply rooted feeling of genuine self-respect, they should exhibit the same reverential behavior toward the sasana as devas and nagas do. Although we are unable to see for ourselves how these beings show their respect, the teachings of Buddhism address all such matters in full.
Unfortunately, we humans are not as interested in them as we should be. We seem more intent on creating a stifling, negligent attitude within ourselves, thus failing to experience the kind of happiness we could otherwise expect. In truth, the sasana is the wellspring of all virtuous conduct, which assures happiness to those adhering to the venerable principles of Buddhism. Atsariyaman continually emphasized that the heart is the most important thing in the world. A heart that is vulgar ends up vulgarizing everything with which it comes into contact. Much like a filthy body, it soils whatever it touches, no matter how nice and clean it may initially be, making it filthy too in the end. So Tamma cannot escape being tainted by a vulgar heart. Even though Tamma itself is perfectly pure, it becomes tarnished as soon as it's embraced by someone with a corrupt heart, like a clean cloth being rubbed in the dirt. For example, when a wicked person tries to impress others with his knowledge of the Buddhist scriptures, nothing good ever comes of it. Vulgar people who are stubborn and unyielding about religious matters are just the same, and no matter how extraordinary Buddhism is, they are unable to derive any of its benefits. They merely proclaim themselves to be Buddhists, but they never understand the real significance of Buddhism and how it applies to them personally. The actual truth about the sasana is this. We ourselves are the sasana. No matter how good or bad our actions are, whatever subsequent degree of happiness or suffering we experience, all directly affect the sasana. The word sasana means the correct way of living as practiced by each individual. If we think the sasana exists outside of ourselves, then our understanding is wrong, and so our practice too is bound to be wrong. Anything which is wrong is more or less useless. It can be made useful only at the expense of the righteousness, dignity, and integrity of each individual. Put simply and clearly, if we are wrong in our hearts, then whatever we do turns out wrong. For instance, calculations don't add up. Clothes don't fit properly. Traffic regulations are ignored. Married couples deviate from accepted norms, failing to honor their vows. Parents and children are at loggerheads. Wealth is ill-gotten, its distribution inequitable. The authorities flout the laws of the land which are designed to keep peace. Rulers and their constituents cannot seem to work together for the common good according to the law, and so become distrustful, behaving like enemies. Regardless of how we experience the harmful consequences, the disappointment and misfortune that result from wrong actions will inevitably arise right where they are committed in the heart. The cause being wrong, the effect is bound to be harmful. When we wrong someone, the harmful consequences from that action are unavoidable, even in cases where we are unaware of having wronged that person. The wrongdoer must necessarily receive the full results of his actions. It's no use thinking that we can somehow avoid the unpleasant consequences. Whatever they are, they will definitely manifest themselves some day. By remaining indifferent or negligent about wrongdoing, we face the clear prospect of personal misfortune here and now in this lifetime. Looking any further ahead than this would merely amount to grasping at shadows and missing the real issue. The sasana is not a shadowy specter deluding people into ignorance. It's a path that unerringly reveals the truth in all its many aspects. Followers of the sasana who deviate from the path and then unfairly accuse it of having failed them are inextricably compounding their own miserable predicament. The sasana, as always, remains pure and unperturbed. Atsariyaman always stressed that people who accept the truth embodied in Buddhist principles receive the blessings of tamma. Being cool and calm themselves, all their relationships tend to be the same as well. The world they live in is a peaceful place where they are unlikely to suffer the kind of contentious bickering that causes acrimony and engulfs both parties in heated recriminations. The reason people never experience the happiness they long for is that they allow a fiery, inflamed mentality to dictate their attitude in everything from business dealings to workplace, from legal proceedings to marketplace. Wherever they go, whatever they do, they are as hot as fire so they find it hard to maintain a balance in their lives. Such people never seem to consider dowsing the bonfire they constantly carry in their hearts so as to gain enough breathing room to relax, balance themselves, 
and find some measure of happiness. Atsaryaman said that during his whole life as a Buddhist monk, he enjoyed investigating the tamma taught by the Lord Buddha, whose incomparable breadth and depth are infinitely greater than those of the vast oceans. In all truth, the sasana is so inconceivably profound and subtle that it's virtually impossible to investigate every aspect of it, and the results attained from each successive stage of the practice are so amazing that they defy description. He insisted that only his concern that others would think him crazy kept him from continuously prostrating himself to the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha. He would consider it his occupation otherwise, performing it easily and joyfully, without ever experiencing fatigue or boredom. He was absolutely certain that, whatever happened, he would always be inseparable from the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha, a galigo. In stark contrast, the world of Anitta, Dukkha, and Anatta constantly smothers the hearts of living beings, leaving them forever distressed and resentful. The Mysterious Effects of Gamma Once while he was meditating, deep in the Chiang Mai Mountains, Atsariyaman saw a vision of a woman and a small novice walking back and forth through the area, nearly every night in the late hours. Becoming suspicious after a while, he asked why they were there. They told him that they were worried about the fate of an unfinished stupa, which they were building together when they died. The small novice was the woman's younger brother, and they had worked together to construct the stupa. Their concern about the stupa, and their regrets at having died before its completion, made them feel a strong, persistent obligation to it. Although reborn into a state of anxiety, they were not as tormented by it as might be expected. Still, they could not feel decisive about being reborn into another realm of existence. So Atsariyaman advised them, You should not be concerned about things that have already come and gone, for they are truly irredeemable. No matter how convinced you may be that you can turn back the clock, it's just not possible. Anyone supposing they can will experience nothing but frustration when their hopes fail to materialize. The future, having yet to come, shouldn't be clung to either. What has already happened should be let go of as being past. What has yet to arrive should be let go of as its time is not yet ripe. Only in the present is it possible to accomplish something meaningful. If your dream of building that stopa were meant to come true, then you would have had a chance to finish it first instead of dying unexpectedly. Now you are trying to deny death. Not only that, you still long to complete the stupa even though it is now wholly impossible. So now you have erred twice in your thinking. If you continue on hoping to fulfill this wish, you will compound your mistake yet a third time. Not only is your thinking affected by this, but your future state of birth and your well-being in that state will also be adversely affected. Such an unreasonable aspiration should not be allowed to continue. In building a stupa, we hope to acquire merit and goodness, not bricks and mortar. The value you obtain from building a stupa is the merit that you gain from this action, merit which results from your efforts and which rightly belongs to you. You shouldn't worry about gross material things like bricks and mortar that can never fulfill your desires anyway. People everywhere who gain merit by doing good deeds take with them only the merit they've thus acquired, not the material things they gave away as donations. For example, contributing to the construction of a monastery, a monk's residence, an assembly hall, a road, a water tank, a public building, or any other offering of material goods are simply the outward manifestations of the good intentions of those wishing to be generous. They are not the actual rewards of generosity, meaning that material offerings themselves are not merit, or goodness, or heaven, or nibbana, nor are they the recipient of such rewards. For over time all material things disintegrate and fall apart. The spiritual qualities that are gained from the effort and the generosity required to do charitable works are experienced internally as merit and goodness. The inspiration behind the good intentions to make such donations is the heart of each individual donor. The heart itself is virtuous. The heart itself is meritorious. It is the heart that exists as heaven or magga, pal and nibbana, and the heart that achieves these attainments. Nothing else could possibly achieve them. 
The unfinished stupa that you two were building lacked the conscious capacity to have good intentions for its own spiritual improvement. Your concern for it stems from a covetous mentality that is a hindrance to you, even though it is directed at holding on to something good. Clinging to it is not in your best interest. Your procrastination here is retarding your progress to a favorable rebirth. Instead of trying to take the whole thing with you, had you two been satisfied with the merit you made from working on that stupa, you would both have comfortably gone on to a favorable existence long ago. For merit is the mainstay of a good rebirth, and merit is never transformed into something bad. It remains virtuous forever, a galigo. It's a mistake to be unduly concerned for things past. There is no way you can possibly finish that stupa now, so you shouldn't set your hearts on such a hopeless endeavor. The power of the merit you have made impacts you here, in the present. So don't waste your time thinking about the past or the future, when now you should be reaping the good results of what you've already done. Correct your thinking, and soon you will be able to pass on free of anxiety. Turn your attention to the present. It contains all the virtues necessary for Magga, Pala, and Nibbana. The past and the future are impediments you must overcome without wasting any more time. I feel really sorry for you two. You've done some very meritorious work for the sake of a happy fortune, only to get so bogged down in your attachment to mere bricks and mortar that you can't freely move on. If you both make the effort to cut these attachments from your hearts, before long you will be free of all binding ties. The strength of your accumulated merit is ready and waiting to take you to the rebirth of your choice. Atariyaman then explained to them the essential meaning of the five moral precepts, a code of conduct applying equally to all living beings. First, every living being values its own life, so no one should destroy that intrinsic value by taking someone else's life. This results in very bad gamma. Second, all beings cherish their own possessions. Even if they don't appear to have much value, the owner values them nonetheless. Regardless of its worth, nothing belonging to another person should be debased by theft or robbery, for such actions debase not only their possessions but their hearts as well. Stealing is a terrible act, so never steal. Third, husbands and wives, children and grandchildren, all love each other dearly. They do not want to see anyone taking liberties with their loved ones. Their personal rights should be respected, and their private space should be off-limits to others. Spousal infringement is extremely damaging to people's hearts, and as such is an act of incalculable evil. Fourth, lies and prevarication destroy other people's trust, causing them to lose all respect. Even animals abhor deceit, so one should never hurt others by using false, deceitful language. Fifth, Alcohol is, by its very nature, intoxicating and immensely harmful. Drinking it can cause a perfectly normal person to go crazy and steadily waste away. Anyone wishing to remain a normal, sane human being should refrain from drinking any form of liquor because it damages physical and mental health, eventually destroying people and everyone else around them. Each of these five moral precepts has its own special benefits. By maintaining the first one, we can expect to enjoy good health and longevity. By the second, our wealth and property will be safe from criminal attack or other misfortune. By the third, family members will keep faith with each other and live contentedly without unwanted interference. With the fourth, we will be trusted because of our integrity. When our speech is charming and pleasant, humans and devas alike will respect and cherish us. Honest people pose no threat to themselves or anyone else. And by maintaining the fifth precept, we will be clever, intelligent people who are not easily misguided nor readily thrown into confusion. People who maintain moral virtue tend to reassure living beings everywhere by promoting a sense of satisfaction and mutual trust. Immoral people, on the other hand, cause untold suffering by harming people and animals all over the world. Those who value their own existence should understand that all people value themselves similarly and should, therefore, refrain from harming others in any manner. Due to the supportive, protective power of moral virtue, honest, virtuous people can expect to be reborn into an elevated heavenly existence. Thus it is vital to maintain high moral standards. The result will surely be a heavenly destination in the next life. Remember this Tamma teaching, practice it diligently, 
and your future prosperity is assured. By the time Ataryaman finished advising the small novice and his sister, both were delighted by his teaching and requested the five moral precepts from him, which he gave them. Having received the moral precepts, they respectfully took leave of Ataryaman and immediately vanished. The power of their accumulated merit and the goodness they cultivated from attending to his discourse and taking the five precepts led the two to be quickly reborn into the Dawa things a heavenly realm. They then regularly visited Ataryaman to hear his teaching. On their first visit, they thanked him for his kind assistance in illuminating the way out of the vicious cycle they were in, allowing them to finally enjoy the pleasure of the heavenly existence they had anticipated for so long. They told him that they now realized the great danger that attachments pose to the heart and the delay they can cause in moving on to a favorable birth. Having received his compassionate advice, they were able to transcend all their concerns and be reborn in a heavenly realm. Atsariyaman explained the nature of emotional attachments to them, pointing out that they are a hindrance in many different ways. The wise always teach us that at the moment of death we should be careful not to have emotional attachments to anything whatsoever. The danger is that we may recall then an infatuation of some kind, or even worse, angry, vengeful thoughts about a particular person. The moment when the chitta is about to leave the physical body is crucial. If at that moment the chitta latches onto a pernicious thought, it may get burned and end up being reborn into a realm of misery, such as one of the hells, or a world of demons, ghosts, or animals, all miserable, unfavorable existences. So when we are in a good position to train the chitta, when we are in human birth and fully cognizant of ourselves, we must take decisive advantage of it. As human beings, we can realize our shortcomings and quickly act to correct them, so that later, when our backs are against the wall, at the time of death, we will be fully prepared to fend for ourselves. We need not be worried about falling prey to the destructive forces of evil. The more we train ourselves to sever all emotional attachments, both good and bad, the better our position will be. The wise know that the heart is the most important thing in the whole universe, for material and spiritual welfare are dependent upon the heart. So they make a point of training their hearts in the correct way and then teach others to do the same. We live by means of the heart and experience contentment and dissatisfaction by means of the heart. When we die, we depart by means of the heart. We are then born again according to our gamma, with the heart as the sole cause. As it is the sole source of everything that befalls us, we should train our hearts in the right way so that we can conduct ourselves properly now and in the future. When Acharyaman finished speaking, the newly reborn Devas were overjoyed by his teaching. Praising it highly, they said they had never heard anything quite like it before. Upon their departure, they circumambulated him three times, then withdrew to the edge of his living area, before floating up into the air like wisps of cotton borne by the wind. Once, while living in a deep mountainous region of Jiang Mai, far from the nearest village, Atsariyaman saw an extraordinary nimitta arise in his meditation. The hour was 3 a.m., a time when the body elements are especially subtle. He had just awoken from sleep and was sitting in meditation when he noticed that his jitta wanted to rest in complete tranquility. So he entered into a deep state of samadhi, where he remained for about two hours. Then his jitta began withdrawing gradually from that state and paused at the level of upatsara samadhi instead of returning to normal waking consciousness. Immediately, he became aware of certain events. A huge elephant appeared. Walking up to Atsariyaman, it knelt before him, indicating that it wanted him to mount. Atsariyaman promptly climbed up onto its back and sat straddling its neck. Once he was settled on the elephant, he noticed two young monks following behind him, both riding on elephants. Their elephants were also very large, though slightly smaller than the one he was riding. The three elephants appeared very handsome and majestic, like royal elephants that possess human-like intelligence and know their master's wishes. When the two elephants reached him, he led them toward a mountain range that was visible directly ahead, about half a mile away. Atsariyaman felt the whole scene to be exceptionally majestic, as though he were escorting the two young monks away from the world of conventional reality forever. Upon reaching the mountain range, his elephant led them all to the entrance of a cave that was situated on a hill a short distance up the mountainside. As soon as they arrived, it turned around, placing its rear to the entrance. With Atsariyaman still straddling its neck, 
It backed into the cave until its rear was touching the back wall. The other two elephants, with the two young monks astride, walked forward into the cave and each took a place on either side of Atsariyaman's elephant, facing inward as he faced outward. Atsariyaman then spoke to the two monks, as if he were giving them his final parting instructions. I have reached my final hour of birth in a human body. Having been completely cut off, perpetual existence in the conventional world will soon cease altogether for me. Never again shall I return to the world of birth and death. I want you both to return and fully develop yourselves first. Then, before long, you will follow in my footsteps, departing this world in the same manner as I am preparing to do now. Escaping from the world, with its multitude of lingering attachments and all of its debilitating pain and suffering, is an extremely difficult task that demands unwavering commitment. You must exert yourselves and pour every ounce of energy into the struggle for this righteous cause, including crossing the very threshold of death, before you can expect to gain freedom from danger and anxiety. Once freed, you will never again have to deplore death and grasp at birth in the future. Having completely transcended every residual attachment, I shall depart this world unperturbed, much like a prisoner released from prison. I have absolutely no lingering regrets about losing this physical body, unlike most people, whose desperate clinging causes them immense suffering at the time of death, so you should not mourn my passing in any way, for nothing good will come of it. Such grief merely promotes the kilesas, so the wise have never encouraged it. When he finished speaking, Atsariman told the two young monks to back their elephants out of the cave. Both elephants had been standing perfectly still, one on either side, as though they too were listening to Atsariman's parting words and mourning his imminent departure. At that moment, all three elephants resembled real, living animals rather than mere psychic images. At his command, the two elephants carrying the young monks slowly backed out of the cave, facing Atsariman with an imperiously calm demeanor all the while. Then, as Atsariyaman sat astride its neck, the hind quarters of Atsariyaman's elephant began to bore its way into the cave wall. When half of the elephant's body had penetrated the wall of the cave, Atsariyaman's chitta began to withdraw from Samati. The nimitta ended at that point. Having never experienced such an unusual nimitta before, Atsariyaman analyzed it and understood its meaning as being twofold. Firstly, when he died, two young monks would attain Tamma after him, though he didn't specify who they were. Secondly, Samatha and Vipassana are valuable assets for an Arahant to have from the time of his initial attainment until the time he passes away. During this whole period, he must rely on Samatha and Vipassana to be his Tamma abodes, easing the discomfort that is experienced between the Chitta and the five Kantas, which remain interdependent until that moment, popularly known as death, when the mundane kantas and the transcendent chitta go their separate ways. At death, samatha and vipassana cease to function, disappearing like all other mundane phenomena. Following that, nothing further can be said. Most people would have been terrified to see the elephant they were riding bore its rear end into the wall of a cave, but in the event, Atsariyaman felt unperturbed. He simply allowed the elephant to complete its appointed task. At the same time, it was heartening for him to know that two young monks would realize Tamma around the time of his death, either just before or soon after. He said it was very strange that, in his parting instructions to them, he spoke about his own impending death as though his time had already come. Unfortunately, Atsariyama never revealed the names of those two monks. Hearing this story from him, I was so eager to find out their names that I completely neglected to consider my own shortcomings. I kept trying to imagine which of my fellow monks they might be. I've kept an eye on this matter ever since Atsariyaman passed away. But even as I write his biography, I still don't have a clue who these auspicious monks might be. The more I think about it, the more I see the folly of jumping to conclusions. No one has admitted to being one of those monks, which is understandable. Who would publicize their attainments like that? Such achievements are not rotten fish to be peddled about merely to attract a swarm of flies. Anyone attaining that level of tamma must possess a very high degree of intelligence and propriety. Would he then be so stupid as to broadcast his achievements so that fools could laugh at him or the wise deplore it? Only the gullible would get excited about such news, like those in the story of the panic-stricken rabbit who, hearing a loud thud, imagined the sky was caving in.
My own foolishness about this matter has eventually subsided, so I have written it down for your consideration. I deserve blame for any impropriety here, for such stories are usually shared only between a teacher and his inner circle of disciples, so that no one is adversely affected. I know I deserve the criticism, and I hope, as always, that you will be kind enough to forgive me. Hungry Ghosts Giving helpful advice to non-physical beings from many diverse realms of existence was a serious responsibility that Atsariyaman continued to fulfill right up to the time of his death. He was in constant communication with such beings wherever he lived, but more so in the mountain regions. There, in remote wilderness areas far from human habitation, one group or another visited with him almost every night. Even hungry ghosts, awaiting offerings of merit dedicated to them by their living relatives, came to seek his assistance. It was impossible to tell how long they had been dead, what family or nationality they had once belonged to, or even whether or not those ghosts had any living relatives left at all. In contacting Atariyaman, they hoped that, out of compassion, he would assist them by finding their living relatives and telling them to make donations, dedicating a portion of the merit to the dead to help lessen their torment and suffering and make their lives more bearable. Many of them had already suffered unspeakable miseries in hell for such a long time that it was impossible to calculate the length of their stay in terms of human existence. When they were finally able to rise clear of the hell realms, they still could not evade such misfortune sufficiently to experience some measure of comfort. Instead, their suffering continued unabated. For beings who are stuck with the consequences of their evil gamma, it matters little which state of existence they are born into, since very little changes to help alleviate their suffering. Hungry ghosts used to tell Atsariyaman they had no idea how long it would take them to work their way through the consequences of their evil deeds. They clung to one desperate hope. If he could kindly inform living relatives of their plight, those relatives might be willing to share the merit of their good deeds with them, allowing them to escape from such unbearable torment. When he questioned the hungry ghosts about their relatives, they talked about another world altogether, one that was incomprehensible to him. Having died and been reborn in one of the realms of hell, some had remained there for tens or even hundreds of thousands of years in non-physical existence before being released into another lesser state where they had to work through the remainder of their evil gamma. Their ghost-like existence then lasted another five hundred to a thousand non-physical years, so it was quite impossible to trace their family lineage. Such was the cruel irony of their karmic dilemma. By the time that the most severe consequences of their gamma were exhausted and only the lesser aspects remained, a state where they could finally receive assistance from their relatives, they had lost all track of their families. So they had no choice but to suffer that garmic misery indefinitely, without any idea when it would end. Such ghosts resembled stray animals who have no owners to care for them. Other hungry ghosts could be helped somewhat, for they died only recently and their gumma was not so severe, meaning that they were in a position to receive merit dedicated to them by their relatives. Since they had living relatives whose names and addresses they could recall, Atsariyaman was able to give them some assistance as long as their families lived in the vicinity where he was residing. Once he knew who they were, he looked for an opportunity to speak with them. He advised them to dedicate to their dead relatives, who awaited the merit they made by performing special religious functions, or more commonly, by daily offerings of food to the monks. Some ghosts were able to receive a portion of the merit made by generous people everywhere, even though it was not specifically dedicated to them. Therefore, Atsariyaman always made such dedications while extending loving-kindness to all living beings. According to the specific nature of their gamma, some ghosts can receive merit dedicated by anyone, while others can receive only the merit that is personally dedicated to them by their relatives. Atsariyaman said that ghosts live a very peculiar type of existence. From his extensive experience with them, he always found ghosts far more bothersome than any other class of non-physical beings. Having no recourse to merit of their own, ghosts depend on and always feel indebted to others for their survival. Should these others fail them, the ghosts are left completely destitute. Their dependence on others puts them in the extremely difficult position of never being able to stand on their own. 
generosity, and other forms of merit-making are vitally important as the key elements for laying a foundation of individual self-reliance in this and all future lives. All living beings are the product of their gamma. They themselves must take full responsibility for the consequences they encounter. No one else can accept that responsibility because no one can experience the gamma generated by another. Births, both good and bad, and the relative degrees of comfort and pain one experiences therein, are the sole responsibility of the individual who created the circumstances that produced these outcomes. No being can substitute for another in this regard. Even those who expect no benefit from their actions still receive the karmic credit for them. Atsaryaman was an expert in matters concerning ghosts, devas, brahmas, yakkas, nagas, and garudas. Although he did not always reveal the extent of his knowledge, he had the ability to explore endless varieties of phenomena within the many gross and refined non-physical states of existence that lie beyond the range of human perception. His stories about ghosts were quite hair-raising. Even those without fear of ghosts couldn't help but feel trepidation about the mysterious powers of gamma. He said that if only people could see their own and other people's good and bad gamma in the way they see substantive things, like water and fire, no one would dare do evil any more than they would dare walk into a blazing fire. Instead, they would be eager to do only good, which has the cool, refreshing quality of water. Trouble would gradually diminish in the world as each person worked to guard himself against the dangers of evil. Once, when Atsaryaman was explaining about heaven, hell, and the ghost realms to the monks, one of his senior disciples spoke up. Since people cannot actually see heaven and hell, or the various non-physical beings like ghosts, devas, garudas, and nagas, they can't fully understand the ultimate consequences of their actions. But you can see all those things. So, wouldn't it be a good idea for you to elucidate them for the benefit of people everywhere? All are natural phenomena which were clearly understood by the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples. No one has ever faulted the Buddha and his disciples for teaching people about them, so I don't see why anyone should object to your doing so. People are likely to show the same appreciation for your amazing talents as we, your disciples, do. Atsaryaman was adamant in his response. The kind of craziness that you suggest will destroy us both. I have never considered speaking out publicly about this matter. Should I do so, you and I and the rest of the monks sitting here would end up being a bunch of lunatics. And once the whole monastery has gone mad, what kind of monastic asylum do you think would accept us all? The sasana was proclaimed and taught with discretion. To be practiced, understood, and spoken about with discretion. This nonsense you suggest... Is it really a matter of discretion, or is it something foolhardy? Think about it. In my opinion, the very thought of it is crazy, let alone actually suggesting it. Even though people might survive listening to us talk about it, we ourselves would surely be doomed. So why bring it up? If you consider the tangible, visible things all around us, people everywhere are quite capable of dealing with them in an appropriate, reasonable manner. Although Tamma is the supreme truth, it still counts on the involvement of people in the world, so we should always work to harmonize the proprieties of society with the truth of Tamma. The Buddha was the first to clearly know and understand the true nature of all phenomena. He spoke about them with absolute assurance, but he was always impeccably discreet in the way he handled these issues. Speaking publicly about any of them, he invariably took the specific circumstances and the people he was addressing into consideration. He spoke then only with the utmost discernment and discretion. Knowledge and understanding about the diverse nature of non-physical phenomena is a prerogative of the one who has attained that kind of perception, but talking away indiscriminately about such knowledge is quite abnormal, so normal people are reluctant to listen. This is not intended to be a criticism of anyone. Rather, what's important to keep in mind here is that those who do possess such knowledge should act properly according to the principles of Tamma, for their own benefit and for the benefit of everyone associating with them. 
being convinced of the amazing nature of what we have perceived is not sufficient reason to speak out about things which may encourage others to go mad. Those people who are keen on listening to such talk simply because their religious conviction is dependent on hearing about amazing phenomena are already on the road to madness, so I don't approve of conviction and amazement of this kind. I'd prefer that the kind of discernment the Lord Buddha taught us be used by people in their convictions and in their sense of amazement. Even though we aren't all exceptionally wise, at least there's hope that enough good judgment will be shown to maintain the sasana, preserving it for the future. Let me ask you this. Suppose you had a certain amount of money which could be useful to you if you were clever, but harmful to you if you weren't. How would you handle it when going into a crowd of people to ensure that both you and your money were safe? The senior disciple replied, I take every reasonable precaution to look after my money. How exactly would you go about looking after it in a large crowd of people to avoid any possible danger? If I felt it was appropriate to spend some of my money there, I'd take care to count out and hand over the necessary amount without allowing anyone to see the larger amount that I still had with me. That amount I'd keep well hidden from view to avoid any possible danger. Atsariyaman then said, Okay, now, let's suppose that you possess a certain knowledge and understanding about ghosts and other non-physical beings. How would you handle that knowledge discreetly in relation to others so that it would be of some benefit to them without becoming an issue of widespread public notoriety, which could be harmful to both you and the sasana? I'd have to use the same kind of care in handling such knowledge that I'd use in handling my money. Just a moment ago, you implied that I should broadcast my knowledge about such phenomena to the general public without ever considering the consequences. Why was that? I figure that the average discriminating person would never suggest what you just did, and yet you spoke right up. If you don't even have the common sense of the average person, what will anyone find to admire in you? I fail to see anything at all admirable in your thinking. Should someone reproach you for lacking judgment, how would you defend yourself when confronted with the truth of this accusation? Think about it. Which are the greater in this world, the wise or the foolish? And how would anyone be able to reasonably maintain the sasana and preserve its continued welfare by following the suggestion you made to me just now? His disciple replied, Thinking about it now, I feel that what I suggested was totally wrong. I spoke up because hearing about such amazing things has so inspired me that I wanted to share this knowledge with people everywhere. I assumed they would probably be inspired as well and so benefit enormously from it. But I never considered the obvious adverse consequences that such a disclosure would have for the whole sasana. Please be kind enough to forgive me. I don't want to see this tendency to be indiscreet become ingrained in my character. I shall try to be more circumspect in the future, so that it doesn't happen again. If someone reproaches me for lacking judgment, I will gladly admit my mistake, for I clearly deserve the criticism. Until you asked me just now, I had never really considered whether or not the fools outnumber the wise. Now I realize that there must be many more fools in this world, since in our village communities there are very few wise people who care about moral issues. Mostly, people don't seem to know what they're here for and where they're going. They aren't very interested in thinking about why they do things, and whether they do right or wrong, good or bad. Being satisfied with whatever is easy and convenient at the moment, they simply let fate decide their future. I understand all this a lot better now. The people who are capable of reasonably maintaining the sasana and preserving its continued welfare must be wise and discerning people who lead others in an even, harmonious manner, so that everyone can benefit from their example. A wise, discerning teacher is the cornerstone of success in the same way that a capable leader is essential to all affairs in all walks of life. Atsariyaman took up the discussion at this point. Since you're capable of understanding that a wise person is essential to the success of every endeavor, why don't you think about what's important in your own endeavors as a practicing monk? Spiritual endeavors, being very subtle, are difficult to fully understand. 
For this reason, only clever, discerning people can uphold the sasana to perfection. Here, I am not referring to the kind of cleverness that causes destruction in the world and damage to the sasana, but cleverness that discriminates wisely, making decisions favorable to one's material and spiritual prosperity. It's this type of cleverness that's implicit in the first two factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, Zimma Dirte and Zimma Sangapo, right view and right thought. And these factors are personified by someone whose words and actions always follow the principles of wisdom. Even right samadhi is dependent on the analytical probing wisdom of right view to avoid becoming comatose samadhi. When the chitta converges into a state of calm, wisdom should always be there, playing a supportive role. Otherwise, how could those dedicated to understanding the true nature of all phenomena deal correctly with the knowledge arising within the chitta, or the external phenomena with which it comes into contact? If wisdom is not there to help, one is bound to make mistakes in judgment. The diversity of internal and external phenomena that can become involved with samadhi is limitless, the perception of them being limited only by each individual's natural inclinations. Those so inclined will naturally perceive such phenomena, and nothing can prevent them from doing so. But the key factor here is wisdom. Wisdom analyzes arising phenomena and then chooses the ones that are suitable to focus on so that the rest can be allowed to pass by without causing trouble. Those lacking wisdom will even have a hard time successfully getting through the samadhi practice. They will find themselves being pleased with this perception or displeased with that one, ecstatic about this, despondent about that. All are emotional reactions impinging on the heart, causing it to become attached. Unless wisdom is present to effectively deal with them, such disturbing emotional attachments can never be eliminated. Wisdom can be selective, ignoring what is superfluous to focus on what is essential, thus indicating the direction in which one's practice should proceed. Our purpose in being ordained as Buddhist monks is to search for knowledge and wisdom so that we can develop those virtuous qualities admired by people everywhere. We aren't here to parade our ineptitude in front of the Kilesas by succumbing to their devious tricks, but rather to develop clever tactics of our own to outmaneuver the Kilesas, thus countering their tricks. Living without an adequate means of protection, we leave ourselves in a very precarious position. The principles of Tamma and the monastic discipline are a monk's protective armor, while mindfulness and wisdom are his preferred weapons. If we want to remain steady in our practice and be constant in all situations, we must maintain mindfulness and wisdom in all our daily activities. Mindfulness and wisdom must permeate all that we think, say, and do, without exception. Only then can we be certain of our mode of practice. I'd really like to see all my students display uncompromising diligence in their efforts to transcend dukkha, using mindfulness and wisdom to oversee this work. You will thus make yourselves worthy recipients of the Buddha's outstanding teaching, which stresses the importance of using skillful means in all circumstances. I have no desire to see my students floundering foolishly in a state of confusion about emotional attachments, because complacency and laziness keep them from doing the work necessary to carry them beyond these dangers. So don't be indifferent to the work at hand. A practicing monk who is striving to cross beyond the world of samsara is engaged in the noblest form of endeavor. No other kind of work is more demanding than the task of lifting the heart beyond the pain and suffering experienced in samsara. It requires unstinting effort on all fronts, including a willingness to sacrifice your life. Entrust your life to your own diligent efforts as they attempt to pull you from the abyss of the gilesas. Unlike other types of work, there is no room for ambiguity here. If you want to realize the wondrous results that you have yet to experience, you must persist in putting your life on the line for the sake of tamma. No other method can be expected to achieve the right result. You must be willing to give your life to transcend the world of samsara. Only then will you be free of the burden of dukkha in future births. I myself never expected to survive and become a teacher, for my determination to transcend samsara was much stronger than my concern for staying alive. All my efforts in all circumstances were directed toward a goal beyond life. I never allowed regrets about losing my life to distract me from my purpose. The desire to maintain my course on the path to liberation kept me under constant pressure and directed my every move. I resolved that if my body could not withstand the pressure, 
I would just have to die. I had already died so many countless times in the past that I was fed up with dying already, but were I to live, I desired only to realize the same tamma that the Buddha had attained. I had no wish to achieve anything else, for I had had enough of every other type of accomplishment. At that time, my overriding desire was to avoid rebirth and being trapped once more in the cycle of birth and death. The effort that I put forth to attain tamma can be compared to a turbine rotating non-stop, or to a wheel of tamma whirling ceaselessly day and night as it cut its way through every last vestige of the kilesas. Only at sleep did I allow myself a temporary respite from this rigorous practice. As soon as I woke up, I was back at work, using mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and diligence to root out and destroy those persistent kilesas that still remained. I persevered in that pitched battle with the kilesas until mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and diligence had utterly destroyed them all. Only then could I finally relax. From that moment on, I knew for certain that the kilesas had been vanquished categorically never to return and cause trouble again. But the body, not having disintegrated along with the kilesas, remained alive. This is something you should all think about carefully. Do you want to advance fearlessly in the face of death and strive diligently to leave behind the misery that's been such a painful burden on your hearts for so long? Or do you want to persist in your regrets about having to die, and so be reborn into this miserable condition again? Hurry up and think about it. Don't allow yourselves to become trapped by Dukkha wasting this opportunity. You'll regret it for a long time to come. The battlefield for conquering the Kilesas exists within each individual who practices with wisdom, faith, and perseverance as weapons for fighting his way to freedom. It is very counterproductive to believe that you have plenty of time left since you're still young and in good health. Practicing monks should decisively reject such thinking. It is the heart alone that engenders all misjudgment and all wisdom, so you should not focus your attention outside of yourself. Since they are constantly active, pay close attention to your actions, speech, and thoughts to determine the kind of results they produce. Are they producing tamma, which is an antidote to the poisons of apathy and self-indulgence, or are they producing a tonic that nourishes the delusions that cause dukkha, giving them strength to extend the cycle of existence indefinitely? Whatever they are, the results of your actions, speech, and thoughts should be thoroughly examined in every detail, or else you'll encounter nothing but failure and never rise above the pain and misery that haunt this world. Atsariyaman's response to the monk, who suggested that he teach people indiscriminately about the unusual phenomena he experienced, was fierce and uncompromising. The gist of his reply makes for a remarkable tamma teaching, one that is seldom heard. It seems unlikely that the monk deserved a condemnation as strong as Atsariyaman's stirring rebuke might have suggested. Perhaps speaking up was his way of prompting Atsariyaman into giving us a talk. As far as I could tell, if nothing out of the ordinary happened to strike his heart and provoke a response, Atsariyaman preferred to speak in a smooth, easy manner, especially when the subject was very profound. At such times, however, his listeners often felt something missing, and were not fully satisfied with his teaching. But if someone started something by asking him a question, or if he became annoyed hearing some monks talk ambiguously about tamma, or if their discussion piqued his interest, then the tamma in his heart began to stir and stream forth, expressing itself in unusual ways that lent fire and excitement to our listening. Each time Atsariyaman delivered a declamation of this kind, his audience felt deeply moved in a way that's difficult to describe. I myself, having a rather rough temperament, always preferred listening to his fiery exhortations, since they fit so well with my natural disposition. For this reason, I reckon that those monks who employed various means to provoke Atsariyaman into fiery talks were in fact using their ingenuity to come up with clever provocations. Since they probably intended to benefit from his response, they were not entirely in the wrong. The resolute tamma expositions that inspired me the most invariably occurred when I asked him probing, prodding questions. His explanations then were bound to be directed personally at me, unlike the general explanations meant for all the monks. Once I had lived with him for some time, I came to know many different ways of eliciting his comments, 
without waiting for him to bring these matters up himself in a general monastic meeting. Once, Atsariyaman and three or four monks were living in a secluded cave in Changdao district. After passing three nights there, Atsariyaman told the monks that, in his meditation, he had seen a spacious, inviting cave situated high up a steep mountain slope in the area nearby. He told them that many Patsekabuttas had resided there in the past, but that nowadays monks couldn't live there. The ascent was too steep and the location too high for finding a place within walking distance where they could obtain alms food. He told the monks to climb up the mountain to look at the cave, and insisted they take a supply of food with them. Since there was no path leading up to the mountain, they would have to climb as best they could until they reached the summit. The cave was situated a short distance from the very top. Taking several lay people along, the monks made the climb to the summit, where they found a beautiful, spacious cave, exactly as Atsariyaman had predicted. The air was clear, and the ambiance pleasant and inviting. The monks were so pleased with their discovery that they didn't want to leave. They would have preferred to remain there indefinitely, practicing meditation. Unfortunately, the cave was so high up and so far from the nearest village that they had no place to go for alms round. When the food they brought was nearly exhausted, they had to come back down to the cave where Atsariyaman resided. Upon their return, he asked them about their impressions. Well, how was the cave? Nice and inviting? Seeing an image of it in my meditation, I felt it was so beautiful and spacious that I wanted you all to go up and take a look. I was sure you'd like it. When we first arrived, I didn't think to examine this mountain to see what's here. When investigating it a few days later, I discovered how many strange, amazing things it contains. That cave you went to is constantly protected by terrestrial dewas. Anyone acting improperly there can expect to feel the consequences. When I sent you up there, I forgot to mention that the cave is protected by devas, and to warn you to restrain yourselves and behave properly the whole time. I didn't want you to be loud and noisy, which is unacceptable behavior for a monk. I was afraid that if the devas protecting the cave were displeased, they might cause you discomfort by precipitating something unpleasant. The monks informed Acharyaman that they preferred to spend a longer time in the cave, but he insisted that, no matter how attractive the place was, it would not be possible to live there because no food was available. Atsariyaman spoke of the cave in a very matter-of-fact way, as though he had actually seen it many times. Of course, he had never gone up there, the climb being too steep and difficult. Nonetheless, he spoke about it with the assurance of someone who knew for certain that the knowledge arising in his meditation was no mere illusion. Atsariyaman constantly warned his monks to behave in a careful, restrained manner wherever they went, for the devas living in those remote places prefer everything to be orderly and very clean. When terrestrial devas witness such slovenly behavior as a monk sleeping carelessly, lying on his back spread-eagled like a corpse, tossing and mumbling in his sleep like an idiot, they feel quite disgusted, regardless of the fact that it's impossible for a sleeping person to control his actions. Devas often approached Atsariyaman to explain how they felt about this matter. Monks occupy positions of reverence and esteem in the hearts of minds and living beings everywhere, so their deportment should be guarded and restrained at all times, even while sleeping. As far as possible, a monk's appearance should be attractive and pleasing, never disagreeable or offensive. We hate to see monks behaving intemperately, like ordinary lay people showing little concern for the consequences especially since the circumspection needed to act with restraint is well within their capabilities. It's not our intention to be critical of all monks. Devas everywhere are grateful for the opportunity to pay homage to those monks exhibiting exemplary behavior, because we all appreciate virtue and dearly wish to uphold the sasana. We mention this to you so you can warn your disciples to conduct themselves in a restrained manner that's appealing to human beings and devas alike. Monks who are worthy of respect will cause devas of all realms to feel an even deeper reverence for the sasana. In response to what the devas told him, Atariman always cautioned his disciples to keep all their requisites in a neat, orderly fashion when staying in remote mountainous areas favored by terrestrial devas. Even the foot-wiping rags had to be neatly folded and not just tossed in a heap. His monks were required to relieve themselves in appropriate places, 
and latrines were dug only after careful consideration of the surrounding area. Sometimes Altariyaman explicitly told the monks not to make a latrine under a certain tree or in a certain area, because the devas residing there, or passing through on their way to visit him, would be displeased. Monks who were already well acquainted with the deva world needed no such caution, for they were fully aware of the correct way to behave. Many of Altariyaman's disciples do possess this capability. However, because their proficiency in such matters is developed in the wilds, they are reluctant to speak about it openly, fearing that learned people everywhere will make fun of them. But within the circle of Gamertana monks, it's easy to determine their identity simply by listening to their discussions about various devas who came to visit them and the nature of their conversations with these non-physical beings. At the same time, we can get an insight into each monk's level of spiritual attainment. The Hypercritical Naga at one point, Acharyaman spent some time living in Changdao Cave, not the long cave in the middle of the mountain that has become popular with tourists, but one higher up the mountain. This cave was home to a great Naga, who had kept guard over it for a very long time. Apparently this Naga was rather conceited, and had a tendency to be overly critical of monks. During his stay in the cave, Acharyaman became the object of this Naga's constant criticism, it found fault with nearly everything he did. It appeared incapable of accepting Atsariyaman's thoughts of loving-kindness, probably as a consequence of its long-standing enmity toward monks. At night, when Atsariyaman wore his sandals to do walking meditation, the Naga complained about the sound of his footsteps. "'What kind of a monk are you, stomping around like an unbridled racehorse? The sound of your sandals striking the earth shakes the whole mountain.' Did you ever think you might be annoying somebody with all that noise? It raised these complaints, despite Atariyaman's composed manner of pacing softly back and forth. Hearing the criticisms, he took care to walk even more softly than before, but still the Naga wasn't satisfied. What kind of a monk are you, walking meditation like somebody sneaking around hunting birds? Occasionally, Acharyaman's foot would stumble on a stone in the meditation path, causing a slight thumping sound which elicited another reproach. What kind of a monk are you, bucking up and down your meditation path like a chorus dancer? There were times when Acharyaman leveled out the surface of his meditation path to facilitate smooth, easy walking. As he moved stones around and put them neatly into place, the Naga complained, What kind of a monk are you, always moving things around? You're never satisfied. Don't you realize that all your fussing about gives others a splitting headache? Atsariyaman had to exercise special care with whatever he did at that cave. Even then, this opinionated Naga would find an excuse to criticize him. Should his body move slightly while he slept at night, he could sense psychically upon awakening that the Naga had been criticizing him for tossing, turning, wheezing, snoring, and so on. Focusing his attention on this angry, hypercritical Naga, Atsariyaman always found its head sticking out, peering at him intently, as though it never took its eyes off him. Vicious-looking and mean-spirited, it refused to accept any merit dedicated to it, and was determined to indulge in feelings of anger that burned like a fire inside its heart. Seeing that it compounded its evil gamma all the time, Atsariyaman felt truly sorry for the Naga. But as long as it showed no interest in reasonable discourse, it was impossible for him to help in any way. All it could think about was fault-finding. On one occasion, Atsariyaman explained the general principles underlying a monk's life, specifically mentioning his own purpose and intentions. My purpose for being here is not to cause trouble to somebody else, but rather to work as best I can for my own benefit and the benefit of others. So you should not entertain ignoble thoughts, thinking that I'm here to cause you harm or discomfort. I am here consciously trying to do good, so that I can share the merit of my actions with all living beings without exception. That includes you as well, so you needn't be upset thinking that I've come just to annoy you. Physical activity is a normal feature of people's everyday life. Comings and goings are part of living in this world. Only the dead cease to move about. Although as a monk I am always self-composed, I am not a corpse in repose. 
I have to inhale and exhale, and the force of my breathing varies from one posture to another. My breathing continues to function while I sleep, as does my whole body, so naturally there will be some sounds emitted. The same is true when I awaken and begin walking meditation, or perform chores. There is some sound, but always within the bounds of moderation. When have you ever seen a monk standing frozen stiff like a corpse, never moving a muscle? Human beings don't behave like that. I try hard to walk as carefully and softly as possible, but still you complain that I walk like a racehorse. In truth, an animal like a racehorse and a virtuous monk mindfully walking meditation could not be more different one from the other. You should avoid making such comparisons, otherwise you become a wretched individual aiming for a birth in hell. It's impossible for me to satisfy all your unreasonable whims. If, like everyone else, you expect to find happiness and prosperity, then consider your own faults for a while and stop lugging the fires of hell around in your heart all the time. Only then will you find a way out. Criticizing other people's faults, even when they really are wrong, merely serves to increase your own irritation and put you in a bad mood. My behavior here is in no way improper for a monk, yet you keep carping about it constantly. If you were a human being, you'd probably be incapable of living in normal society. You'd see the world as one big garbage dump and yourself as pure solid gold. Such feelings of alienation are due to emotional turmoil caused by your hypercritical attitude, which gives you no peace. The wise have always condemned unjustified criticism of others, saying that it brings terrible moral consequences. So why do you enjoy doing it with such a vengeance and such indifference to the painful consequences? I'm not the one who suffers from your criticism. It's your own emotional health that's adversely affected. Such ill effects are quite obvious, so how can you be unaware that your whole attitude is wrong? I am fully cognizant of everything you are thinking, and at the same time I have always forgiven you. You concentrate on doing terrible things that consume your mind and ravage your heart as though you can't get enough of doing evil. Were your condition a disease, it would be an untreatable one. I've been trying to change your mental attitude, just as I've long been trying to help many other living beings. Human beings, ghosts, devas, brahmas, yakkas, and even great nagas far more powerful than yourself have all accepted the truth of the Lord Putta's teaching on Gamma. None, except you, have angrily criticized the value of Tamma, which is revered throughout the world systems, and you are so peculiar that you won't accept the truth of anything at all. The only pleasure you take is in making derogatory remarks and angrily censuring people who have done nothing wrong. You devote yourself to these as though they were propitious actions, but the wise have never thought that such actions foster peace and security. When you finally slough off the skin of this ill-fated existence, you won't then encounter a pleasant, pain-free existence, unaffected by the evil consequences of your actions. I apologize for speaking so candidly about the principles of Tamma, but my intentions are good. Nothing malicious is intended in my remarks, regardless of what misconceptions you may have. Since the very beginning of my stay here, I have tried to do everything in a careful, restrained manner, for I know that this is your home, and I am concerned that my presence here may inconvenience you. Although I am well aware that you are an individual who delights in looking for things to criticize, I still can't seem to avoid being seen in a disparaging light. I myself experience genuine contentment, unaffected even by constant criticism. But I worry that the repercussions of your dogged pursuit of evil will be extremely unpleasant for you. I did not come here in search of wickedness or evil. Being quite sure that everything I do and say emanates from a pure heart, I have no fear that my actions will incur any unpleasant moral consequences. As soon as intelligent people begin to understand the difference between secular matters and spiritual ones, they tend to appreciate virtuous conduct, admiring all wholesome, meritorious actions performed for the sake of peace and happiness. From ages past, the wise have always taught living beings to feel good about being virtuous. So why do you adhere to the maverick notion that it's all right to strip yourself of virtue and wallow in evil? You seem to detest virtue so dreadfully much that you can't be bothered to reflect on your own vices. Although I won't be experiencing the dire consequences that await you, still I fear for you in that miserable state. You must stop thinking in ways that are harmful, for the mean intent behind your actions has the power to deprive you of all moral value. 
such undesirable consequences, bringing unimaginable torment, are what I fear more than anything else in the world. The whole world dreads old age, sickness, and death, but I don't fear them nearly so much as I fear evil and its attendant consequences. People with gileses tend to eschew spiritual principles, preferring instead the things that religious tenets proscribe. So ordaining as a Buddhist monk to practice the teaching and the discipline requires us to undergo an agonizing character transformation. Even though I knew how difficult it would be to oppose the gileses, I nonetheless felt compelled to join the monkhood and endure the severe hardship. The extreme discomfort caused by constantly opposing the gileses, that's what makes the practice so difficult. But if we desire to transcend gamma and the defiling gileses that create it, we must endure such torment, for gileses always steadfastly resist the teachings of the Lord Buddha. I've come here to practice, living in this cave like a worthless social outcast, solely because I fear evil and its consequences. I did not come here to harm or trouble anyone, nor do I feel contempt for any living being. I respect them all as friends, whose lives are also subject to the law of Gamma, and who are thus all of equal intrinsic value. I dedicate the merit of my actions equally to all beings, with the hope that they may live in contentment wherever they may be. I have never taken the arrogant attitude that I am a human being ordained as a Buddhist monk, and therefore superior to my companions in birth, aging, sickness, and death. You too exist within the sphere of Gamma, so you ought to humbly reflect on how your own faults affect you. Criticizing others without proper consideration will never bring you good results. It merely piles up the ill effects of bad Gamma, which then linger on indefinitely. You should feel dismayed by your errant behavior and drop this dangerous practice. Only then can you hope to become a good individual with a chance for a better, happier birth in the future. Then your mean, angry heart will soften, and you can avoid being engulfed in misery forever. All living beings in the universe, from humans and animals to devas, brahmas, and yakkas, cherish happiness and loathe suffering. They do not have an aversion for tamma simply because they can't yet put it into practice. Tamma has always been the quintessential nature of the universe. Those beings who are in a position to practice tamma find great satisfaction in it. For instance, human beings. Their state of birth makes them well suited to the practice of tamma. You yourself are a living being who is fully capable of distinguishing between good and bad and thus choosing what's most beneficial for you. So why do you do just the opposite? I am puzzled that you seem content to revel in those things which the wise abhor while scorning those which the wise applaud. You know about dukkha and you hate it, yet you strive to produce the very causes that bring you great unhappiness and discomfort. The wise tell us that our efforts to find fault with others produce consequences that cause greater and greater unhappiness, exactly what you shamelessly do all the time. You may not be interested, but although I am fully aware of your despicable thoughts, I have always forgiven you. I am not angry or offended, but I do feel sorry for you. Thus I have decided to tell you the plain truth. Should it prove useful to you, I shall be pleased for your sake. I receive no unpleasant consequences from your thoughts, for I am not the one who engages in them. All I experience are peace, serenity, and loving compassion that have long been my heart's abode. The Naga didn't make any comment as Atariyaman explained these various aspects of Tamma but it did experience the rise of some salutary thoughts while listening. This monk talks a lot of sense, but right now I'm unable to do as he says, being still too content with my old ways. Perhaps I'll have more interest in my next existence. This monk has many awesome qualities. He even perceives things that should be unknowable. How can he know my private thoughts? I live in a hidden world, yet somehow he sees me. Over the years, many monks have come to stay in this cave, but none have known about my existence, much less my thoughts. I've even forced some of them to flee because I couldn't stand having them around. But this monk knows everything, including my thoughts. Even while sleeping, he remains aware, 
Later, he can tell me exactly what I was thinking as if he hadn't been asleep at all. Why am I so opinionated that I can't take what he teaches to heart and put it into practice? Like he said, I must surely have some very grave gumma. Despite knowing the despicable nature of my mind, he still makes an effort to explain how his daily activities are not intended to bother me. My present state of existence is certainly unfortunate. He's right when he says that I'm quite capable of distinguishing between good and bad, yet I'm hampered by my wretched conceit, meaning that my next life will probably be just as unfortunate as this one, and so on indefinitely. After a short pause, Atsariyaman asked the Naga if it had managed to understand any of his explanations on Tamma. The Naga replied, I understand everything you so kindly explained to me. But unfortunately I'm burdened by some very grave gumma, and I've yet to grow weary of my wretched condition. I'm still debating this matter with myself, and I haven't come to any definite conclusions. My heart tends to gravitate toward a state of degradation, as it always has, so it balks at listening to the tamma you are teaching. Atsariyaman asked the Naga what it meant by saying that its heart liked to gravitate toward a state of degradation. The Naga answered, My heart enjoys finding fault with you all the time, even though you've done nothing wrong. That's just the way my heart is. I don't know how to convince myself of the harmful effects of this tendency, so that I can correct it and practice the way of virtue from now on. Atsariyaman offered some encouragement. Careful consideration will convince you that such bad tendencies are truly harmful. Once you are persuaded, then evil will naturally begin to fade from your heart, ceasing to be so conspicuous in the future. But by assuming that these tendencies are beneficial, and then encouraging them, you will naturally tend to think in an endless variety of ways that are detrimental to you. Unless you hurry to improve things now, you'll keep on doing evil until you are completely beyond help. I cannot do this job for you. I can give some guidance, but it's up to you to make the necessary adjustments in your character. The onus is on you to press ahead, trying to accomplish this as best you can. Once you do, you will see the dangerous aspects of your character gradually diminish as beneficial qualities develop, displacing them until all that's left is pure, simple virtue, untainted by any form of evil. By placing your faith in the Tamma of the Lord Buddha, which has always helped living beings to transcend Dukkha, you will always be contented living under its protective influence. Never feeling distraught, never disturbed, you will remain even-tempered in every situation. You won't be moved to praise one thing as good or criticize another as bad, and so suffer the resulting consequences, conduct that's contrary to the way of the wise. At the conclusion of these remarks, the Naga promised to make an effort to follow Atsariyaman's advice. In the days that followed, Atsariyaman kept an eye on it as he continued with his, kept an eye on it as he continued with his own practice. He noticed some improvement, as the Naga was able to restrict its hypercritical tendencies by exercising some measure of control over them. But he also noticed that this effort caused the Naga much consternation. So, finding some excuse to leave the cave, he moved on, which pleased the Naga. His association with it ended there. From that time on, Atsariyaman alluded to the story of this Naga as a means of elaborating on various aspects of human nature for the personal benefit of those listening. The gist of what he said is worth repeating here, hopefully so that the reader can learn some valuable lessons from his teaching. Atsariyaman explained that good and evil do not arise on their own, but are dependent on habitual ways of behaving that gradually become part of one's character. If our tendency is to do evil, it is very difficult to remedy because everything we do tends to flow in that direction. If it is our tendency to do good, we become more and more skillful and assertive as we progress in that direction. For this reason, clever parents will try to train their children in the way of goodness from a very early age, before it becomes too late. When necessary, they will entrust them to the care of someone who is suitably supportive so that their children's upbringing is not simply left to chance. Children begin to learn about basic common principles from a very tender age. But unlike learning in the classroom, this learning process is not interrupted by time or season. 
Such basic common principles are more firmly implanted in children's characters than any of their school subjects, for these things exist all around them, at home, in school, and everywhere else. Children are constantly taking lessons from what they see, hear, taste, smell, and touch in the world, remembering well what they have learned. A child's senses are its natural blackboard. The impressions imprinted there are pregnant with moral significance, that is, matters of good and evil. They constantly pick up impressions from their playmates and the adults in their lives, as well as from movies and other entertainment that is normally available to them. Such everyday impressions are a child's true teachers, and children are all too willing to learn new ideas that are constantly conveyed to them. Contact with evil affairs can definitely induce a child to follow evil ways, while good influences can definitely induce a child to go the way of virtue. Children naturally take the things they see and hear as examples to emulate, and over time this establishes a pattern of behavior that defines a child's character. Once these patterns have become ingrained, the children will speak and act according to the good or evil orientation thus established. The fact that some people readily take satisfaction in doing evil and are unwilling to change, while others just as readily take satisfaction in doing good and cherish moral virtue all their lives, indicates the fundamental importance of character development. Those left to their own devices easily abandon the effort to resist their bad tendencies, even before they have seen enough satisfactory results to encourage perseverance. Consequently, basic character development is absolutely essential for all people. This means that nothing should be done carelessly or thoughtlessly, for once such tendencies become habitual, they are difficult to correct. The importance of this principle becomes apparent as we strive to develop positive character traits until they become part of our very nature. For instance, being reasonable about how and where we travel, being reasonable about how to spend our money so that everyone in the family benefits, and being reasonable in our eating and sleeping habits so that we do not overindulge in them. All such exemplary behavior patterns should be enthusiastically developed until they become instinctive. The inner resistance we meet in the early stages of training will naturally give way to a smooth, easy character transformation. This transformation itself is sufficient proof that character training is well within our capabilities, but we must be willing to persevere in the beginning. Training is required to make any kind of work successful. Just as we must undergo training in order to succeed in our professions, so the heart and mind must be trained in order to obtain optimum results. Only after death are we beyond the need for training. Wishing to gain proficiency in something, we must work at it, practicing until we are well skilled in it. Character training develops a skill which is synonymous with virtue. Take this message to heart, consider it well, and put it into practice. Your efforts will surely be rewarded with a wealth of personal virtue. Such was the gist of Atariyaman's teaching on character training. I have included it here to help those who are developing tamma in this way. The Death of the Arahant While Atsariyaman lived in Changdao Cave, numerous nimittas appeared in his meditation, some of them quite extraordinary. Here I shall mention only a few. In the late hours of almost every night he received a wide range of Dewa visitors from the upper and lower celestial realms, who arrived in groups of varying sizes at appointed times. Arahants also came regularly, to hold inspirational conversations on Tamma with Atsariyaman. Each Arahant showed him the manner in which his passing away into total Nibbana had occurred. Some were Arahants who had passed away in the Changdao cave, while others had attained total Nibbana elsewhere. Such demonstrations were accompanied by an inspiring explanation of the sequence of events that had taken place. Hearing Atsariyaman talk about those Arahants, I felt dismayed and somewhat discouraged by my own unfortunate circumstances. There I was, a human being with eyes, ears, and mental faculties, just like Atsariyaman, yet I couldn't accomplish the things that he did. On the one hand, I was elated to hear his stories. On the other, I felt disheartened. I found myself laughing and crying at the same time, but I kept my tears to myself, for fear that my fellow monks would think I was mad. In fact, at that time, deep inside, I really was a bit mad. The inspirational conversations that Atsariyaman had with the Arahants were so captivating that it's hard to find anything else in the world that compares with them. I shall try to faithfully recreate the essence of those conversations here, though I fear I may not do them proper justice. 
Here is the gist of what the Arahants said to Atariyaman. All Arahants possess superb qualities within their hearts that are most amazing, intrinsic virtues unsurpassed in the human and Deva worlds. Each Arahant who appears in the world following the Lord Putta does so only with the greatest of difficulty. Each is like a gold mine cropping up spontaneously in the middle of an emperor's imperial city, a very rare occurrence indeed. An Arahant's lifestyle contrasts sharply with worldly lifestyles, because an Arahant's life is invigorated by Tamma. Although his body is composed of the same physical elements as those of everyone else, the heart maintaining that body is pure, and such purity of heart invigorates every aspect of the physical element. You yourself have now completed the task of filtering from your heart all possible causes of existence, thus becoming one of the Arahants. Being one whose heart will never again give rise to birth and existence, you have become another incomparable source of merit for the world to venerate. So we've come to visit you now, to show our appreciation for your achievement, which, because of its enormous difficulty, is seldom accomplished. Although many people desire to attain what you have, very few succeed when they are faced with the difficulties. People born into this world instinctively cling to their parents and relatives for support. Hardly any of them realize the importance of relying on their own hearts as their mainstay. The vast majority of people just drift aimlessly, accomplishing nothing of real value. Their numbers are beyond reckoning. So the appearance in the world of a fully enlightened Arahant is a remarkable event that benefits living beings throughout all the world systems. Your attainment of purity has made you an enormous boon for humans, devas, and brahmas alike. You are also well versed in the universal language of the heart, which is far more important than any other form of communication. All the Buddhas, and certain categories of Arahants, use the language of the heart when giving assistance to living beings, for it is the universal language of sentient beings throughout the universe. Contacting and teaching non-physical beings is achieved exclusively by means of this universal form of communication. Those communicating in the language of the heart can understand each other much more quickly and easily than would normally be the case. After concluding his inspirational conversation with Atsariya Man, each Arahant would then demonstrate the manner in which he had passed away into total Nibbana. Nearly every Arahant who came allowed him to observe the posture in which this was achieved. Some Arahants demonstrated how they had died and passed into total Nibbana while sitting cross-legged in Samadhi. Some demonstrated how they were reclining on their right side in the lion's posture at that time. Others showed him how they were standing still in the middle of the meditation path. Still others revealed how they were pacing back and forth in meditation at the time of their total nibbana. The sitting and reclining postures were the most common. Relatively few arahants passed into nibbana while walking or standing. Their deaths were demonstrated in a precise manner, showing every detail right up to the final moment. As a seated arahant passed away, he slumped over gently like soft cotton, while his body ceased to function and became perfectly still. It was more difficult to discern the exact moment when an arahant reclining in the lion's posture passed away. His breathing was the only visible sign of life, and that became ever more refined as he lay quietly, as if asleep, without the slightest movement in any part of his body, until his breathing gradually ceased altogether. Those arahants who demonstrated death in a standing posture stood erect, assuming a reflective pose with the right hand placed on the left hand, head slightly bowed, and eyes firmly closed. They appeared to reflect momentarily, before slowly slumping into a heap on the ground, first in a sitting position, then slumping gradually further, until, softly like cotton wool, they lay on the ground. Arahants who died while walking in meditation paced back and forth about six or seven times before gently slumping to the ground where they lay perfectly still. When giving these demonstrations, the Arahants came to within six feet of Atariyaman so he could clearly view every aspect of their passing away, which created a lasting impression in his heart. Listening to him recount those episodes, I felt the urge to shed tears. I had to turn my face to the wall as this strange feeling overcame me. Otherwise, I might have created a stir, which could have become an embarrassing epilogue to this story. 
the total nibbana of those arhants was accomplished with a serene gracefulness that stands in marked contrast to the distress typically suffered by most people at the time of death. I was so moved by hearing how each arahant passed away that I simply couldn't hold back my tears. Those amazing individuals were taking final leave of the world of conventional reality, with all its chaos and confusion, which is an amazing thing to contemplate. I am sure that anyone else who listened would have been deeply affected in the same way. Three arahants attained total nibbana at the cave in Changdao, two while reclining in the lion's posture, and one while walking meditation. Prior to giving Atsariyaman a visual demonstration of how his death had occurred, each arahant gave him a detailed explanation of why he had chosen to pass away in that posture. Very few died while standing or walking. Many more did so while sitting, but the majority passed away while reclining. On the basis of what he had seen, Atsariyaman came to the conclusion that over the centuries many arahants had passed away in Thailand. As far as I can remember, they included the three arahants at the cave in Changdao, one in the Wong Prachan Mountains, one at Pago Cave in Lopburi Province, one at Khao Yai in the Khon Nayok Province, and one at Wat Tato Luang Monastery of Go Ka District in Lambang Province. There were others as well, but unfortunately I can no longer recall them. Nibbana is a term used exclusively with reference to Buddhas, Bhattaka Buddhas, and Arahants, all of whom have expunged from their hearts every trace of the Gilesas leading to future birth. It is not a term associated with living beings who still have Gilesas, for those beings continue to accumulate the seeds of future births in their hearts constantly, thus making the designation Nibbana entirely inappropriate for them. Having died here, they are reborn there. Dying there, they are reborn somewhere else. Negligent human beings who have made no effort to develop virtuous qualities in this life so as to enhance their future lives may well be reborn as animals after they die. The opportunities for birth as an animal are more numerous than those for birth in the much higher human Deva and Brahma realms. So those who prefer making bad gamma may be on one of the many paths to rebirth in the animal kingdom, which is far more diverse and extensive than the higher realms. But animals, humans, and devas all have one thing in common, the burden of emotional attachments that cause them to be reborn over and over again, indefinitely. Consequently, the term Nibbana does not apply to them. The only ones who deserve the designation Nibbana are those individuals who have completely eradicated the Kilesas from their hearts, extinguishing them forever, even while they are physically alive. At the moment of passing away, they have no lingering attachments that could bind them to the round of Sangsara, not even to the body that's starting to decompose. Absolutely no attachment or concern for anything anywhere exists in their hearts. Thus they bid final farewell to the world with no trepidation, having no expectations of experiencing karmic consequences in another realm of existence, a source of endless frustration. The heart that has attained absolute freedom is constant, unchanging, and wholly contented. It harbors no expectations at all concerning conventional realities such as the body. Therefore, not even an atom of the conventional world could enter and affect the heart's state of total purity. The word Nibbana refers to the total purity of one who is never agitated or melancholy, neither sorrowful in life nor regretful at death, but always imperturbably unchanging throughout. Nibbana is a special term used with reference to a special type of individual. No one who has yet to purify his heart would dare assume this title. Nibbana is not a kind of personal property, like an orchard or a farm, which can be taken over by powerful interests even without the owner's consent. Whoever wants to take possession of Nibbana must make the effort to develop it within the heart. There is no hope for those who merely lie around waiting for it to appear. Atariyaman, the subject of this biography, received inspirational tamma from many arahants. He has received national acclaim and respect from faithful Buddhists everywhere. He achieved this renown by faithfully practicing the tamma until he realized the truth in his own heart, where nothing false existed. He was able to understand that things like organic life are inherently false, and as such, he let go of them, so they no longer burdened his heart. The true Atariyaman, no longer subject to change, 
was the truth of the tamma he realized. That tamma remains true forever. Unlike all other things which are inherently unstable and so of limited duration, the passage of time has no effect whatsoever on it. The Spiritual Warrior Atsariyaman became seriously ill on many occasions while living deep in the wilderness areas of Chiang Mai. Sometimes he came very close to death. Had he been like most people, totally dependent on doctors and their medicines, he would probably have succumbed long before. But Atsariyaman was able to survive by using the curative powers of Tamma to treat himself. He said that as soon as the symptoms of illness began to appear, the therapeutic qualities of Tamma immediately arose in response and began to effect a cure. Such was his temperament that normally he showed little interest in conventional medicines. Even in old age, when his vitality was steadily declining, he continued to prefer the therapeutic qualities of Tamma to maintain well-being in his body elements. Atsariyaman once stayed with several other monks in a mountainous area full of malaria. One of the monks happened to contract the disease, but not a single medicine was available to treat it. When the fever was at its worst, it raged continuously all day. Atsariyaman visited the monk every morning and evening to instruct him in the use of investigative techniques for reducing fever, meditation methods he himself always used with good results. But since their levels of spiritual attainment were so different, this monk was incapable of investigating in the same way as Atsariyaman could. Each time his fever intensified, he had to simply wait for it to abate on its own. He had developed no effective methods for bringing it down himself. Eventually becoming rather exasperated, Atsariyaman scolded him. It seems you're a maha in name only, since the knowledge you have learned is obviously of no help when you really need it. What's the point of studying to be a maha if you're just going to waste a lot of paper and then come away empty-handed? The knowledge gained from studying should benefit you in some way, so I cannot figure out what you've been learning that's so completely useless. Here you are virtually dying of fever, but your learning can't help alleviate your condition even a little bit. What's the purpose of all that learning anyway? It doesn't make sense to me. I can't figure it out. I haven't learned any grade of Bali studies, not one. I have learned only the five Gummertana that my preceptor gave me at my ordination, which I still have with me today. They are all I need to take care of myself. They don't make me weak like you. You're as weak as you are educated. In fact, you are weaker than a woman with no education at all. You're a man and a maha, so why all this weakness? When you get sick, you exhibit no manly characteristics, nor any indication of the tamma you learned. You should take all your masculine equipment and exchange it for a woman's, thus completing your metamorphosis. Maybe then the fever will abate a bit. Seeing that you're a woman, the fever may be reluctant to torture you so much. Instead of seeing some reassuring signs of defiance and courage when I visit you, all I see is a weak display of self-pity. Why don't you investigate those gammatana in the Bali studies you've learned? What does Dukkang Ariyasachang mean to you? Does it mean weakness? When having a fever, just cry and long for your parents. Is that what it means? If you cannot bear even the painful feelings arising from a fever, in a truly life-threatening crisis, you'll be overwhelmed and unable to cope. Even now you can't manage. So how can you ever hope to understand the true nature of the noble truth of Dukkha? Anyone wanting to transcend the mundane world must realize unequivocally the truth inherent in each of the noble truths. But as soon as the truth of Dukkha awakens and begins to become a little active, you lie down and admit defeat. What do you expect to gain from that? Having given this fiery piece of advice to probe the monk's character, Atsariyaman paused quietly for a moment. He then noticed that the monk was sobbing, tears streaming down his face. So Atsariyaman quickly found an excuse to leave and return to his hut, telling the monk not to worry. He would soon get better. He assured him that he had only pretended to give him a hard time. Reconsidering the matter that night, Atsariyaman decided to try a different type of medicine, since the remedy he had just prescribed was probably too harsh for the patient. He just was not strong enough to take it. From the next morning onward, he changed his approach completely, 
never again displaying any fierceness with that monk. From then on, he assumed a sympathetic, comforting attitude, pampering the monk in a way that was very uncharacteristic of him. His speech was sweet and gentle, like large quantities of molasses being poured out every morning and evening, until the whole area seemed sweet and fragrant, suiting that monk's outbreak of weakness perfectly. He watched over his patient's progress, giving him these sugar-coated pills every morning and evening, until it was clear that both the patient and his fellow monks were contented. The patient continued to improve with each passing day, until finally he made a complete recovery, a process that lasted many months. Obviously, this particular medicine was effective beyond all expectations. Such are the therapies of a clever doctor who always has the intelligence to adjust his treatments according to the circumstances and then administer them appropriately. Consequently, he is an excellent example for the rest of us who are searching for wisdom, which is why I have included the preceding incident. Those who are interested should be able to gain some benefit from reading it, for it concerns the skillful means of a clever man whose wisdom was so sharp that he was never stymied by any turn of events. Rather than remaining passive in a critical situation, Atsaryaman instinctively preferred to analyze the crisis with mindfulness and wisdom. When he was sick, or when his investigations uncovered some particularly insidious gilesis that he found to be especially obstructive, these constituted critical situations. Instead of feeling resigned, his chitta responded by circling the problem day and night until he found an ingenious method to deal with the crisis, allowing him to overcome it gradually and move on unhindered. From the beginning stages of his practice to the very end, he invariably experienced good results from this approach. When the monks living with him became ill, he usually advised them to develop meditative techniques for relieving the symptoms, so they would not become overly dependent on medications. At the same time, he wanted them to develop those techniques into methods for investigating tamma. Atsaryaman believed that physical and mental pain are direct manifestations of the truth of dukkha, and as such, they should be investigated until that truth is understood. He did not expect his monks to simply succumb to pain, as though they had never before received training in tamma. Acharyaman acquired many techniques from the illnesses he suffered. He never let the pain of his illness subdue him without probing into the nature of that pain as best he could. At such times, he believed it imperative to investigate pain to the very limit of one's ability in order to determine whether or not mindfulness and wisdom can cope with the task at hand. When found to be deficient, they could be modified and improved until their performance is deemed satisfactory. When the highly trained forces of mindfulness and wisdom enter into combat with feelings of severe pain, the heart will not be apprehensive as it confronts the truth of dukkha, which is a genuine truth. Mindfulness and wisdom are then fully up to the task. They remain unshakable while being buffeted on all sides by an onslaught of pain coming from every conceivable direction. In the midst of this intense pain, they are able to narrow down the scope of their investigation until it focuses sharply on the very principles of truth. Such mental training employs the factors of mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and effort, instilling them with greater strength and courage. For precisely this reason, Atsaryaman liked to emphasize the investigation of painful feelings to his disciples. When the moment of truth arrives and the body is about to break up, one should experience no fear of the agonizing pain that emerges at that moment. Investigating as prescribed, the meditator clearly perceives the true nature of both body and feelings, meaning that he lives in comfort and dies triumphant. Such is the path of the warrior who emerges truly victorious to become a superior individual. He conquers himself, becomes superior within himself, and is fully contented. Atsaryaman was an exemplary teacher in every aspect of his practice. His persistence, fortitude, courage, frugality, and all-round ingenuity were outstanding qualities that put him in a class of his own in the present day and age. It would be very difficult for any of his disciples to surpass him. He possessed celestial hearing and celestial sight, as well as Bharachitta the ability to communicate psychically with beings as diverse as animals, humans, ghosts, devas, brahmas, yamas, and nagas. He could see not only animals and humans with their gross physical bodies, but also the subtle non-physical forms of ghosts and devas. He knew the intimate joys and sorrows of human beings, 
and could read their innermost thoughts. Monks who lacked mindfulness to supervise their thoughts, letting their minds wander constantly, often became aware of those thoughts only when they heard Atsariyaman give voice to them. Some of the more pathetic ones were so bemused that they did not realize Atsariyaman was referring to them. It wasn't necessary to be in his presence. Just living together with him in the same monastic community was sufficient reason for caution. Any monk mindlessly giving rein to wild thoughts was sure to hear something unusual from Atsariyaman when eventually they met. But especially at risk were those who dared to let their minds wander in his presence. It didn't matter what he was doing at the time. He might be instructing the monks, or having a conversation, or whatever. He would give the culprit a tongue-lashing, or use some unusual ploy to get his attention. Only when he felt disinclined to respond did he allow such thoughts to pass unchallenged. According to the accounts of many senior disciples who lived with him in Chiang Mai, Atsariyaman's mastery of such faculties as celestial hearing, celestial seeing, and thought-reading was so amazing it could be frightening. His ability to read thoughts was so lightning-quick that those entertaining unwholesome thoughts almost invariably heard about it. Consequently, monks who lived with him needed to guard their sense faculties very carefully. If not, they certainly got caught, for they could not elude his penetrating genius and find a safe way to hide. Once, due to his fear of Atsariyaman, a monk thought about the ferocity of Atsariyaman's admonitions. When the monk next saw him, Atsariyaman immediately addressed the question. Almost everything we use, from our food to our requisites to the robes we wear, must pass through various stages of preparation before being turned into useful items. Rice must be planted, harvested, and cooked. Wood must be cut, sawed, and planed. And cloth must be woven and sewn into robes. Isn't that right? These things don't become finished products ready for use or consumption unless a lot of work is done on them. Food and shelter are the product of man's labor. They do not simply materialize from nowhere. Only corpses are totally inactive, lying lifeless and having no need to provide for their own livelihood. With no reason to adjust their behavior, they have no need for a teacher to scold them and give instructions. But you are alive and still seeking a teacher's guidance. Yet you're unreasonably afraid of your teacher, citing his fierce admonitions as a rationale. Then again, if your teacher simply kept his mouth shut, you would probably accuse him of failing to teach you, and thus be even more upset. In the final analysis, nothing quite suits you. Your thoughts jump around like a monkey, jumping up and down in the trees. If it keeps jumping about long enough, it will jump on a rotten branch and end up in a heap on the ground. Which do you want to be? Do you want to be a monkey jumping on a rotten branch, or a monk with a teacher to guide you? Sometimes he confronted the culprit directly, motivating him to become more mindfully aware of his own thoughts. At other times he simply made some oblique, sarcastic reference to a monk's thoughts. The objective in either case was to warn a student that his thoughts had not passed into oblivion, but could return again to haunt him. He was made aware of his mistakes so that in the future he could exercise more restraint in his thinking. Sometimes, in order to inspire his disciples in their practice, Atsariyaman gave a fiery discourse in which he offered himself as living proof of what could be achieved through perseverance and courage in the face of death. If you allow the fear of death to stop you from practicing meditation with uncompromising diligence, you will be obliged to come back and die time and time again in future births. Those who can overcome their fear of death will be able to reduce the number of future births until eventually they transcend birth and death altogether. Never again will they return to bear the burden of Dukkha. While persevering unflinchingly in the face of excruciating pain, I myself passed out three times, yet I did not die. I managed to survive and become your teacher. None of you have ever persisted in your efforts to the point where you passed out unconscious. So what makes you so afraid of dying? If you don't actually experience what it's like to die, it is unlikely you'll ever see the wonders of Tamma. Whether you believe it or not, this is the method I use to realize Tamma. So there is no way I can teach you to merely take it easy. Eat a lot, sleep a lot, and be lazy. Then the Kilesas will take fright. I cannot teach that because that's not the way to instill fear in the Kilesas. Such an attitude will only amuse the Kilesas. 
We thought these monks had come to be diligent, so why are they lying around like breathing corpses? These breathing dead are hardly worthy of admiration. After Acharyaman finished speaking, a certain monk in the audience thought to himself that persevering to the point of passing out was excessive. If I have to reach the point where I pass out unconscious, I don't want to go to Nibbana yet. I'll just put up with the pain and suffering of this world like everyone else. I've got lots of company. If going to Nibbana means pushing oneself to the extent of passing out, then whoever wants to go is welcome to do so, but I'm not going, that's for sure. Life in the world is surely painful, but not nearly as painful as being rendered unconscious. Besides, if we have to pass out before we can attain Nibbana, that means there's not much difference between Nibbana and a drug-induced coma. Who wants that? I certainly don't. I have no desire to pass out. Just seeing someone else faint scares me to death, let alone having it happen to me. Before long, Atsariyaman began speaking again this time in heated tones that penetrated forcibly into the monk's reverie. You don't believe me, huh? Do you think I'm lying to you just for fun, or what? If you do not trust me, please leave. Why stay here being a burden on this monastery? I did not invite you to come here. You came on your own, so you should leave on your own. Don't wait to be thrown out. It's useless for you to stay here anyway. The Buddha's teaching wasn't proclaimed for idiots like you. Your way of thinking is entirely inappropriate for a monk wearing the yellow robes. A Buddhist monk is one who puts his faith in Tamma. But since your ideas contradict the Lord Buddha's path to liberation, it is obvious that you don't trust me or the Tamma. You are welcome to go anywhere to eat and sleep in comfort without having to trouble yourself with meditation practice. If you come to realize the truth of Tamma using this method, please come back and have mercy on this stupid old monk. I shall raise my clasped hands to the heavens to honor your gracious majesty's benediction. I teach the truth when I say that anyone expecting to transcend Dukkha must be fearless when facing death. But you don't believe it's true. You figure it is better to die and be reborn in this world so you can continue carrying your burden of misery wherever you go. If you want to go on like this, that's your business, but don't come here and contradict the teaching of the Lord Buddha. If you do, you will be a thorn in the Buddha's side and an obstacle blocking the path of those truly wishing to follow him. Opinions like yours are not only wrong, but should you decide to give voice to them, you will become an enemy of Buddhism and religious people everywhere. I assumed that you came here to develop yourself spiritually and so uphold the sasana. I never imagined you were going to ruin yourself and then destroy the sasana and devoted followers of the Lord Buddha as well. But now I realize that you have come like an executioner to destroy everything. You'd better change your attitude right away. Otherwise, you will certainly ruin yourself and take a lot of other people with you. And that would be a terrible shame. The Lord Buddha is said to have passed unconscious three times as he strived to attain enlightenment. Don't you believe it is true? If you don't, perhaps you suppose the Buddha was lying to us. A person like you who ordains as a Dutanga monk but still refuses to trust the Buddha and his Dhamma, is someone devoid of intrinsic human value. Your opinions make you no different than a breathing corpse, a living, stinking corpse that somehow manages to keep breathing from one day to the next. What do you say? Which path are you going to choose for your own safe passage? I have no better path to offer you than the one I have already specified. It is the path that the Lord Buddha and all the Arahants have taken. There is no easier, more esoteric path. I have followed this path from the time of my ordination up to the present, and it is the source of the Tamma that I teach to all my disciples. This was one of the most impassioned declamations ever given by Atsariyaman right to the point, and full of fireworks. What I have recreated here is merely a sample, not the full substance of what he said by any means. Those listening were so shaken and intimidated they nearly sank through the floor. Never in their lives had they heard anything like it. By going straight to the point, these fiery expositions caused his audience to see the truth of his words and thus submit to it even as they felt frightened to death of him. 
Realizing the truth of what he heard, the monk, whose thoughts provoked this barrage, gradually acquiesced until he accepted it totally and without reservations. As that happened, the intensity in Atari Amun's voice gradually subsided until he sounded quite conciliatory. When he was convinced that the monk had accepted the truth, he finished speaking and adjourned the meeting. As it disbanded, there was a stir of excitement. The monks asked one another who had dared entertain thoughts so perverse to have elicited such a fierce response from Atari Amun that his voice raged furiously, like thunder and lightning. There must have been some provocation. Otherwise, he would never have given a blazing admonition like that. Those thoughts must have affected him so acutely that he couldn't resist unleashing the full force of his reason. Eventually, the monk in question owned up to the thoughts that I have mentioned before. Normally, Tutanga monks did not conceal their thoughts and opinions from one another. If their thoughts became the subject of Atsariamun's rebuke, they invariably admitted their lapses in judgment when they were questioned later. Although the monks usually found it amusing when a fellow monk was roasted by Acharyamun, they also became conscious of their own shortcomings. Such shortcomings could be easily exposed on alms round, or on some other errand outside the monastery, where a monk encountered an emotionally stimulating object that stuck in his mind and became a preoccupation. Such indiscretion was likely to elicit the kind of fierce response that frightened everyone within earshot and prompted nervous glances all around. Terrified of Atsariyaman, ashamed in front of his friends, the culprit was usually shaking as he sat, rooted to his seat, with his head bowed and not daring to look up. When the meeting was over, the monks would ask around and find out that, as always, there was indeed one in their group whose thoughts caused Atsariyaman's rebuke. It was rather a pity, for those monks had no intention of offending Atsariyaman. Like people everywhere with Gilesis, they were emotionally susceptible to things in their environment. Their mindfulness was simply too slow in catching up with the lightning quickness of their minds. Thus, Atsariyaman's frequent scoldings. Atsariyaman was extremely quick at reading other people's thoughts. Monks who lived with him had no doubts whatsoever about this. He was able to read our errant thoughts and then caution us about them with unerring accuracy. Only on occasions, when he could not be bothered to say anything, did he remain quiet. Though his rebukes were frequent, he did relax occasionally to let us catch our breath. Otherwise, we'd probably have suffocated to death. Because of my incurable restlessness, I myself was chastised more often than most. But those of us who endured and lived patiently with him over a long period of time were usually energized in our meditation practice. We developed a firm anchor in our hearts as a result of his exhortations which constantly forged, tempered, and beat our practice into shape. Constant vigilance, and the restraint it fostered, made it possible to cultivate the mindfulness and wisdom necessary to resist incidental temptations. In the context of the art of magic, it can be compared to learning the necessary skills and then testing them out against the teacher until one is impervious to attack. Calm and secure in the knowledge that their harmful potential has been neutralized, one can withstand guns and swords unperturbed. In the context of Tamma practice, it means one can stand firm in the face of evocative emotions and temptations that normally arouse desire, without fear of being influenced or seduced. In other words, remaining unperturbed in all situations. The trouble is, most people react to talk about Nibbana by feeling oddly dejected and dismayed, it doesn't put them in a good mood, as does talk about worldly matters. Having no personal experience of Nibbana, they probably think that it's not as enjoyable as the humdrum things they are accustomed to. Not only has the present generation lost interest in Nibbana, even our parents and grandparents were not much interested, nor did they encourage others to take an interest. At most, they may have encouraged their family to go to the local monastery from time to time to take the precepts and hear Tamma. Perhaps they sometimes encourage their families to do meditation practice to calm them down a bit and keep their behavior within acceptable limits. Of course, one way or another, they did manage to advise their family and friends to do just about everything else. Until fed up with hearing their advice, most people no longer bothered to take it. Undoubtedly, most people have already decided that Nibbana must be a very silent place, there being no music or entertainment, and no one to indulge them in their favorite pastimes. They probably see it as a place devoid of anything stimulating or exciting, and therefore they don't want to go there. 
They fear dropping into a still, silent hell, without a soul in sight. There would be no family, no friends, and no sounds, ever, of birds and cars, or laughter and crying. It appears to be a rather bleak, undesirable place to go in every way. So people who still harbor ambitions do not want to go to Nibbana, and even if they did, they would be unable to go, for their ambitions would hold them back and make them hesitate. People who can truly attain Nibbana are those who have absolutely no worldly ambitions or involvements, being neither passionate nor impassive, neither relaxed nor tense, but remaining perfectly balanced. They are naturally centered in the middle way, having no desires, no expectations, and no longings. They take no enjoyment from worldly pleasures, which merely agitate the heart and cause frustration. Always imperturbable, they experience only an exquisite, serene happiness that contrasts sharply with the happiness of those whose hearts are corrupted by worldly concerns. Such mundane happiness, being ambiguous and fluctuating, is always fleeting and unreliable. It resembles murky, muddy water. It's like food that's spicy, sour, bland, and salty all at once. Besides causing indigestion and uncomfortable drowsiness, it is not very appetizing. So people should carefully examine the things they encounter every day, and test them to discover which ones are advantageous and which are not. Then they can filter out the unwholesome elements and prevent them from piling up in their hearts until their numbers overwhelm and there is no room to store them all. Otherwise, wherever they look, they will see only this accumulation of misery that they've collected. When it comes to self-discipline, the wise are much more clever than we are. Everything they do, say, or think is directed precisely toward achieving their intended objective. They are not at odds with the truth, nor arrogant and conceited about their achievements. When cautioned, they quickly take the warning to heart as a useful lesson, which is quite different from the way the rest of us react. By following the example of the wise, we will become reasonable, moderate people who refuse to follow those desires that have ruled over our hearts for so long. Our efforts to overcome those desires will thus transform our hearts in a way that definitely results in a degree of contentment that's clearly evident to us. Even without millions in the bank, our own exemplary conduct, plus what little wealth we do possess, will be sufficient to keep us happy. Clever people manage their lives in a way that is conducive to peace and security. They don't feel the need to rush around trying to make vast sums of money in order to maintain a sense of happiness in their lives. Wealth may bring a measure of happiness, but those who enjoy a moderate amount of wealth righteously acquired will inevitably be far more contented than those who acquire their wealth by unscrupulous means. Though its actual ownership is not disputed, dubious wealth doesn't really belong to its owner in any genuine sense. For under the laws of true justice, Gamma condemns such gains, bestowing fruits of misery as just rewards for the future. Wise people view this prospect with great trepidation, but we, of lesser intelligence, still prefer to scramble headlong after our desires, selfishly indulging in pleasures that come along without ever getting enough to satisfy our appetites. No matter how hard we try, we never seem to experience the kind of contentment that we long for. During his years in Chiang Mai, Atsariyaman received numerous letters from Chao Kun Tammachedi of Wat Bodhisampon Monastery in the Don Thani province. In his letters, Chao Kun Tammachedi, who had been a disciple of Atsariyaman since his youth, always invited him to return to Don Thani. Atsariyaman never replied to those letters, nor did he accept the invitation. Then, in the year 1940, Chao Kun Tammachedi traveled from Don Thani all the way to the isolated region where Atsariyaman lived to invite him personally and thus gave him a chance to answer all the correspondence he had received. He told Chao Kun Tamachedi that he had read all his letters, but he reckoned they were small and insignificant compared to the big letter that had just arrived, so now he was ready to reply. That said, both monks laughed heartily. At the first opportunity, Chao Kun Tamachedi personally invited Atariyaman to return to the province of Udontani, where he once lived so many years before. Chao Kun Tamachedi informed him that his disciples in Udon Thani, missing him very much, had asked him to invite Acharyaman on their behalf. This time he could not object. He had to accept. Chao Kun Tamachedi suggested they work out a timetable for picking up Acharyaman and escorting him back to Udon Thani. They decided on the beginning of May 1940. 
As his departure from the mountain retreat became imminent, large groups of terrestrial bay was pleaded with him to stay. Being very reluctant to see him leave, they told him that bay was from all realms experienced peace and contentment while he lived there, due to the power of loving-kindness which emanated from him and issued in all directions, day and night. Feeling very happy in his presence, they all greatly revered him. They were unwilling to have him leave, for they knew that their sense of contentment from his presence would soon fade. Even their social cohesion could be affected as a result. Atariyaman told them that, having given his word, he must leave. He must honor his promise. He couldn't possibly renege on it. Unlike most people, a monk's word is a solemn covenant. A monk is a man of virtue, so he must remain true to his word. If he goes back on a promise, his virtue immediately disappears and his worth as a monk is then devalued. So a monk must preserve his moral integrity. When May arrived, Atsariyaman and the monks accompanying him to Adwantani left their mountain retreat and began the long trek to the city of Chiang Mai, where they stayed at Wat Chedi Luang Monastery. Atsariya Un, of Wat Tipayaratananimit Monastery, arrived with some lay supporters at about the same time to receive Atsariyaman and to escort him to Adwantani. Atsariyaman remained at Wat Chedi Luang Monastery for about one week. During that time, a large group of his local devotees came to persuade him to extend his stay in Chiang Mai, for the benefit of everyone there, but having accepted the invitation to Udon Tani, he could not delay his departure. Before he left, Tsao Kun Rajagawi asked him to give a special talk on the occasion of Isaka Puza, to serve as a remembrance for his many devotees. At that time, I had just myself arrived in Chiang Mai, and so listened to this discourse with great interest. He spoke for exactly three hours that day, and what he said was so impressive that I have never forgotten it. Here is the essence of what he said. Today is Visakapuza. It celebrates the day the Lord Buddha was born, the day he attained enlightenment, and the day he passed away into Parinibbana. The birth of a Buddha stands in marked contrast to the births of all other beings. In being born, the Buddha did not succumb to worldly illusions about birth, life, or death. More than that, through the power of his all-encompassing wisdom, he was able to realize the true nature of birth, life, and death, attaining what we call enlightenment. At the appropriate time, he bid farewell to his kantas, which were the tools he relied on to develop virtue to perfection, and then passed away, sugato, as befits a world teacher who is absolutely beyond reproach. Before departing his physical body, which had reached the end of its natural life, he bequeathed the Dhamma to the world, intending that it represent him and fulfill the role of teacher in his stead. Such a gift is worthy of our complete faith and worthy of any sacrifice. As you know, we are born as human beings because we possess sufficient inherent goodness to make it possible. But we shouldn't take ourselves and our inherent goodness for granted by neglecting to develop virtuous qualities in this life to enhance our future lives. Otherwise, the human status we enjoy may disappear to be irrevocably eclipsed by a low, undesirable birth. Be it high status or low status, with happiness of every possible degree up to the ultimate happiness, or pain and suffering of every possible degree down to the most excruciating, we ourselves are responsible for our own life circumstances. Don't think that only those presently affected by adverse circumstances experience such things. As potential life situations, they are shared in common by everyone, becoming our own personal heritage if and when we create the conditions for them. For this reason, the Buddha taught that we should never look down on other people, holding them in contempt. Seeing someone living in misery or abject poverty, we should reflect on the possibility that one day we could also find ourselves in such a position, or one even worse. At the moment of reckoning, none of us has the power to avoid the consequences of our actions. All of us share the same capacity to make good and bad gumma, so it's possible that some day we will be in their position and they will be in ours. The sasana is a doctrine that we can use to examine ourselves and others, enabling us to correctly choose the best possible way forward. In this respect, it has no equal. Throughout my many years as a monk, I have remained firmly committed to the practice of examining myself, striving always to discriminate between the good and the bad things arising within me from moment to moment. I now clearly realize that the heart is the principal instigator in the creation of gamma, in other words, our hearts are the source of all gamma, gamma that belongs solely to the one who makes it. 
There should be no doubt about this. Those doubting the existence of gamma, and so disbelieving of its effects, blindly take their own situation for granted until they're beyond redemption. Although they've been born and raised by their parents, such people fail to see the value of the mother and father who gave them life and sustenance. They look no further than their own selfish existence, unaware of how awful it really is, for they care little that they were born and raised by parents who supported their growth and development in every way. A child's body is nourished by the food and drink its parents provide, allowing it to grow up strong and healthy. If such actions are not gamma, what then should they be called? And if the nourishment the body receives in this way is not the fruit of gamma, then what else in truth could it be? Obviously there is a root cause for all the goodness and evil, all the happiness and suffering experienced by people everywhere in the world. When someone's reckless thinking leads him to commit suicide, there's a reason behind it. The root cause, gamma, manifesting itself within the heart, can have such an impact on a person that he actually takes his own life without realizing that the gamma he has already created is playing a role. What is that but total blindness? Gamma exists as a part of our very being. We create gamma every moment, just as the results of our previous gamma arise to affect us every moment. If you insist on doubting the existence of gamma and its results, then you are stuck at a dead end. Gamma is not something that follows us like a dog following its master. On the contrary, our very thoughts, speech, and actions are gamma. The true results of gamma are the degrees of happiness and suffering experienced by all beings in the world, including those beings who live out their lives unaware of gamma. Such ignorance is also a karmic consequence. I myself listened to this talk with heartfelt satisfaction, as I had long been keenly interested in Atariyaman. I experienced such a deep sense of joy about him and his tamma that I felt as if I were floating on air. I felt that I simply couldn't hear enough. I have given you the gist of what he said so that all of you, who had no opportunity to hear him speak, may understand something about the nature of your gamma. Gamma being something common to us all, it is possible you may recognize your own gamma in his words. When he finished speaking, Acharyaman rose from his seat and prostrated himself in front of the main Buddha image. Chao Kun Rajagawi told him how much everyone had enjoyed the outstanding discourse he had just delivered. Acharyaman replied that it might well be his final encore, since he probably wouldn't return to give another talk due to his declining years. This was his way of telling everyone present that he would not return to Chiang Mai again before he died. As it turned out, this was true. Atariyaman never again returned to Chiang Mai. After remaining several more days at Wat Chedi Luang Monastery, Atariyaman finally left, heading first for Bangkok. Somdet Pra Mahawirawang and the other senior monks, together with scores of lay supporters, escorted him from the monastery to the train station. Also present was a host of Dewas. Atariyaman said that Dewas filled the sky around him in every direction as they too came to escort him to the station. They remained, hovering in the sky, even after he reached the station, waiting to send him off before returning to their respective realms. A chaotic scene ensued as he had to greet the scores of monks and lay people who were gathered there, while he simultaneously tried to psychically bestow his blessing upon all the dewas who hovered in the air for a final blessing from him. In the end, he was able to turn his undivided attention to the Dewas and bestow his final blessing only after he had finished speaking to all the people and the train began pulling out of the station. He said he truly felt sorry for those Dewas who held him in such high esteem that they were reluctant to see him leave. They showed all the same signs of distress and disappointment that human beings do. Some even continued to hover behind the train as it sped down the tracks, until finally Acharyaman felt it necessary to tell them to return to their respective realms. They departed reluctantly, wondering if he would ever come back to assist them again. In the end they were to be disappointed, for he never did return. He never mentioned whether the terrestrial devas of Chiang Mai came to visit him later on when he lived in the provinces of Udon Thani and Sagon Nakon. Chapter 5 Unusual Questions Enlightening Answers Upon arriving in Bangkok, Atsariyaman went to stay at Wat Baramaniwat Monastery, following the instructions telegram from Somdat Pra Mahawirawang. 
Before he departed for Udon Thani, many people came to see him at Wat Boramaniwat with questions. Some of these questions were rather unusual, so I have decided to include them. Question. I understand that you maintain only one rule instead of the full 227 monastic rules that all other monks keep. Is that true? Atsariya Mun. Yes. I maintain only the one rule. Question. Which one do you maintain? Atsariya Mun. My mind. Question. So you don't maintain all 227 rules? Atsariya Mun. I maintain my mind by not allowing any wrong thoughts, speech, or actions that would violate the prohibitions laid down by the Buddha, be they 227 in number or even more than that. Those who doubt whether or not I maintain the 227 monastic rules can think and say what they please. As for me, from the day of my ordination I have always maintained strict control over my mind, as it is the master of body and speech. Question. You mean we have to maintain our minds in order to maintain the moral precepts? Atsariyaman, what else would you maintain to develop good moral virtue if not your mind? Only the dead have no need to look after their minds, much less their actions and speech. The wise have never claimed that dead people have a moral bias, it being impossible for corpses to show willful intent. If corpses did have morality, then it would be a dead and useless one. But I am not a corpse, so I cannot maintain a dead man's morality. I must do what befits one fully endowed with both good and evil tendencies. I must maintain my mind in moral virtue. Question. I've heard it said that keeping our actions and speech in good order is called morality, which led me to understand that it's not really necessary to look after the mind. That's why I asked. Atsariyaman. It is quite true that morality entails keeping our actions and speech in good order, but before we can put our actions and speech in good moral order, we must consider the source of moral virtue. It originates with the master of body and speech, the mind, which makes them behave properly. Once we have established that the mind is the determining factor, we must ascertain how it relates to action and speech so that they may stay in good moral order that is a source of comfort to us and others alike. It's not only moral virtue that the mind must deal with. The mind supervises the performance of every activity we engage in, making sure that it's done in a proper, orderly fashion to produce excellent results each time. Treating an illness requires diagnosing its cause, then devising an effective cure before it develops into a chronic condition. Taking care of morality requires the mind to be in effective control. Otherwise, the result will be a tarnished morality that's patchy and full of holes. Such splintered, inconsistent virtue is truly pitiful. It moves people to live an aimless existence and inevitably causes an adverse effect on the entire religion. Besides that, it's not a source of comfort to the person practicing it, nor is it admired by his peers. I have never done much studying. After I ordained, my teacher took me as a wandering monk into the mountains and forests. I learned tamma from the trees and grasses, the rivers and the streams, the cliffs and the caves. I learned it from the sounds of birds and wild animals, from the natural environment around me. I didn't study the scriptures long enough to become well versed in the teaching on moral virtue, and my answers to your questions tend to reflect that primitive education. I feel rather inadequate for my inability to provide answers that would be suitably eloquent for your edification. Question. What is the nature of morality, and what constitutes genuine moral virtue? Atsariyaman. Being mindfully aware of our thoughts, knowing which things are appropriate to think about and which are not, taking care how we express ourselves by way of body, speech, and mind, controlling these three factors so that they remain within the confines of what is morally acceptable. By properly adhering to these conditions, we can be confident that the moral nature of our behavior is exemplary, and we are never unruly or offensive. Apart from such exemplary conduct in body, speech, and mind, it's difficult to say what genuine moral virtue is, since it's impossible to separate its practice from the person who maintains it. They are not distinct entities like a house and its owner, the house on one hand, the owner on another. Trying to distinguish between moral virtue and the person who maintains it is very problematic, so I wouldn't want to do it. Even the peace of mind resulting from the practice of moral virtue cannot actually be separated from that moral virtue. If morality could be isolated in this manner, it would probably have been on sale in the stores long ago. 
In such a case, people's moral virtue would probably become a lucrative target for thieves to steal and sell off to the highest bidder, leaving many people totally deprived. Like all other possessions, moral virtue would then become a source of anxiety. It would cause Buddhists to become weary of striving for it, and insecure about holding on to their acquisition. Consequently, the inability to know what precisely constitutes genuine moral virtue is a way to avoid the dangers arising from moral issues, thus allowing virtuous individuals a clever way to gain peace of mind. Being very wary of the inherent dangers, I have never thought of separating myself from the moral virtue that I practice. Those unwilling to make this separation remain content wherever they go, whatever they do, for they never have to worry about losing their moral virtue. Those who see it as something separate from themselves might worry so much that they end up coming back as ghosts after death to anxiously watch over their store of accumulated virtue. It would be like dying people who fret about their wealth, and therefore get stuck in a frame of mind where they return as ghosts to keep anxious watch over their accumulated riches. Complete Self-Assurance One day, a prominent elder of what Boromani what invited Atsariyaman for a private conversation with him. He began with a question. When you were living alone in the mountains and forests, preferring not to be bothered by monks or lay people, whom do you consult for solutions when a problem arises in your practice? Even though I live in the capital, which is full of learned scholars who can help me clear up my doubts, still, there are times when I find myself so completely baffled that no one is able to help me resolve those dilemmas. I know that you usually live alone. So, when questions arise, who do you consult, or how do you deal with them? Please, explain this to me. Boldly, Acharyaman replied, Please allow me to answer you with complete self-assurance, which I gained from studying fundamental natural principles. I consult Tamma, listening to it both day and night in all my daily activities, except in sleep. As soon as I wake up, my heart is immediately in contact with Tamma. As for problems, my heart carries on a constant debate with them. As old problems are resolved, new ones arise. In resolving one problem, some of the kilesas are destroyed, while another that emerges starts another battle with the kilesas that remain. Every conceivable type of problem, from the grossest to the subtlest, from the most circumscribed to the most comprehensive, all of them arise and are fought within the heart. Consequently, the heart is the battleground where kilesas are confronted and then eliminated each time a problem is resolved. I am not so interested in thinking about whom I would consult if problems arise in the future. I am much more interested in attacking the immediate ones that set the stage for the kilesas lurking in the background. By demolishing them at every turn, I gradually eliminate the kilesas from my heart. So I do not concern myself with consulting other monks to help solve my problems and rid my kilesas, for it's much quicker to rely on the mindfulness and wisdom that arise continuously in my heart. Each time I'm faced with a problem, I am clearly conscious of the maxim atahi atano nato, oneself is one's own refuge. So I use methods I devise from my own mindfulness and wisdom to immediately solve that problem. Instead of trying to glean answers from the scriptures, I depend on tamma, in the form of mindfulness and wisdom that arise within me, to accept the challenge and find a solution that allows me to proceed unimpeded. Although some problems are so profound and complex they require a sustained, meticulous investigative effort, they are no match for the proven effectiveness of mindfulness and wisdom in the end. So they too dissolve away. I have no desire to seek the companionship of my fellow monks just so they can help me solve my problems. I much prefer to live alone. Living all alone, solitary in body and mind, means contentment for me. When the time comes for me to die, I shall pass away unencumbered by concerns for the past or the future. At the moment my breath ceases, all other matters will cease with it. I apologize for answering your question so unintelligently. I am afraid my reasoning wasn't very eloquent. The elder, who had listened attentively, was so wholeheartedly convinced by what he heard that he complimented Atsariyaman. You are an exceptional person, as befits one who truly likes living alone in the mountains and forests. The tamba that you have presented here cannot be found in the scriptures, because the tamba recorded in the texts, and the natural principles of tamma arising in the heart, are really quite different. To the extent that the tamma in the text was recorded directly from the mouth of the Lord Buddha by those possessing a level of purity equal to his, to that extent it is pure and unadulterated. But transcribers of the texts in later generations may not have been so genuinely pure as the original ones. 
so the overall excellence of the tamma as subsequently recorded may have been moderated by its transcribers. For this reason, it is understandable that tamma arising fresh from the heart would be different from what is recorded in the scriptures, even though they are both within the scope of what we consider tamma. I have no more doubts concerning the question I rather stupidly asked you. Still, such stupidity does have its own benefits, for had I not made a stupid inquiry, I would not have heard your sagacious reply. Not only have I sold my stupidity today, but I have also bought a load of wisdom. You might also say that I've discharged a load of ignorance to acquire a wealth of wisdom. I do have one other question, though. After the Lord Buddha's disciples took leave of him to go out and practice on their own, they returned to ask his advice when problems arose in the course of their practice. Once he helped clear up their doubts, they again returned to their respective locations. What was the nature of those problems that the Buddha's disciples sought his advice on? Acharya Man replied, When someone is available for help with quick, timely results, people, who by their nature prefer to depend on others, will opt for the shortcut, certain that it is better than trying to go it alone, except, of course, when the distances involved make travelling there and back entirely impractical. Then they are obliged to struggle as best they can, relying on the strength of their own mindfulness and wisdom, even if this does mean slower results. Being omniscient, the Lord Buddha could help solve people's problems and resolve their doubts much more clearly and quickly than they could expect to do on their own. Consequently, disciples of his who experienced problems or had doubts felt obliged to seek his advice in order to resolve them as quickly and decisively as possible. If the Lord Buddha were alive today and I was in a position to visit him, I too would go to ask him questions that I have never been able to resolve to my satisfaction. In that way I could avoid having to trudge along laboriously, wasting precious time as I've done in the past. Still, reaching definite conclusions on our own, while practicing alone, is a laborious task that we must all undertake, for, as I've mentioned, we must ultimately depend on ourselves. But having a teacher who elucidates the correct way of practice and then recommends the right methods to follow helps us see practical results quickly and easily. This contrasts sharply with results we achieve from guesswork when we are practicing alone. I have seen the disadvantages of such uncertainty in my own practice, but it was an unavoidable situation, as I did not have a teacher to instruct me in those days. I had to make my way tentatively, stumbling and picking myself up, making numerous mistakes along the way. The crucial factor was my resolve, which remained single-minded and unyielding. Because it never lapsed, never waned, I was able to smooth out the rough patches in my practice, little by little, until I gradually achieved a true sense of satisfaction. That contentment gave me the opportunity to get my balance on the path of practice, and this, in turn, allowed me to look deeply into the nature of the world and the nature of Tamma in the way I've already mentioned. The elder asked many more questions of Acharyaman, but having covered the most important ones, I shall pass over the rest. While staying in Bangkok, Acharyaman was regularly invited out to eat in private homes, but he declined, for he found it difficult to take care of bodily necessities after he finished eating. When he felt the time was appropriate, Atsariyaman left Bangkok and headed for Korat, where he had been invited to stay by devotees in Akon Rachasima. Staying at Wat Pa Salawan Monastery, he received numerous visitors who came to ask him questions. There was one which was especially interesting that Atsariyaman himself recounted to me, one which I have never forgotten, even though I tend to be forgetful. Perhaps, I suspected, it would one day form part of his biography. This question was asked as a means of discovering the true nature of Atsariyaman's attainment, and whether he was actually worthy of the popular acclaim he received. The questioner was an ardent student of the way of Gammatana, who earnestly sought the truth. Question. When you accepted the invitation to come to Korat, was it simply because you want to help your devotees here, or have you also come hoping to strive for the attainment of Magga, Pala and Nibbana. Atsariyaman. Being neither hungry nor deluded, I am not searching for anything that would create dukkha and cause me trouble. Hungry people are never content as they are, so they run around searching here and there, latching on to whatever they find without considering if their behavior is right or not. In the end, their acquisitiveness scorches them like a blazing fire. Deluded people are always searching for something, but I have no delusion, so I am not searching. Those who are not deluded have no need to search. Everything is already perfect within their hearts. So why should they bother? Why should they get excited and grasp at shadows when they know perfectly well that shadows are not genuine truths? 
genuine truths are the four noble truths, and they are already present within the minds and bodies of all living beings. Having fully understood these truths, I am no longer deluded. So what else would you have me seek? I am still alive, and people need my help, so I assist them. It's as simple as that. It's much easier to find precious stones than it is to find good people with tumma in their hearts. One virtuous person is more valuable than all the money in the world, because all that money cannot bring the world the kind of genuine peace and happiness that a beneficent person can. Just one such individual is capable of bringing so much enduring peace and happiness to the world. The Lord Putta and the Arahants are excellent examples of this. Each virtuous person is more precious than any amount of wealth, and each realizes that good deeds have far greater value than money. As long as they remain virtuous and people around them are contented, they don't care if they are poor. But fools, preferring money over virtue and virtuous people, will do anything to get money. They can't be bothered about the consequences of their actions, no matter how wicked and depraved they may be. Even the devil is so disgusted and so fearful they will wreak havoc among the denizens of hell that he's reluctant to accept them as inmates. But such fools care about only one thing getting their hands on some money, no matter how ill-gotten. Let evil settle the accounts, and to hell with the devil! Virtuous people versus wicked people, material wealth versus the virtues of Tumma, this is how they differ. Sensible people should think about them right now, before it's too late to choose the correct path. Ultimately, the varying results that we experience depend on the gamma we make. We have no choice but to accept the consequences dictated by our gamma. Remonstrations are of no avail. It's for this very reason that living beings differ so widely in everything from the type of existence they are born into with their different bodily forms and emotional temperaments to the degrees of pleasure and pain they experience. All such things form part of one's own personal makeup, a personal destiny for which each of us must take full responsibility. We must each bear our own burden. We must accept the good and the bad, the pleasant and the painful experiences that come our way, for no one has the power to disown these things. The karmic law of cause and effect is not a judicial law. It is the law of our very existence, a law which each one of us creates independently. Why have you asked me this question anyway? This remarkably robust response, which I heard about from Atsari Aman, as well as from a monk who accompanied him on that occasion, was so impressive that I have never forgotten it. Questioner Please forgive me. But I have heard your excellent reputation praised far and wide for a long time now. Monks and lay people alike all say the same thing. Atsariya Man is no ordinary monk. I have longed to hear your tamma myself, so I asked you that question with this desire in mind. Unfortunately, the lack of discretion in the way I asked may have disturbed you somewhat. I've had a keen interest in practice for many years, and my heart has definitely become more and more peaceful throughout that time. I feel that my life has not been wasted, for I have been fortunate enough to encounter the Buddha-sasana, and now have paid homage to a renowned teacher revered for his excellent practice and superb virtues. The clear, precise answer you gave me a moment ago exceeded my expectations. Today my doubts have been allayed, at least as far as is possible for one still burdened with kilesas. It's now up to me to carry on with my own practice as best I can. Atsariya Man the way you phrased your question prompted me to answer as I did, for in truth I am neither hungry nor deluded. What else would you have me search for? I had enough of hunger and delusion back in the days when I was still inexperienced in the way of practice. Back then, no one was aware of how I nearly died striving in the mountains and forests before I felt secure in my practice. It was only later as people began to seek me out that my fame started to spread, but I didn't hear anyone praising me at the time when I passed out unconscious three times and barely survived to tell about it. This renown came only long after the event. Now everyone lauds my achievements. But what's the use in that? If you want to discover the superior qualities latent within yourself, then you must take the initiative and practice. It's no use waiting until you are dead and then invite monks to chant auspicious verses for your spiritual benefit. That's not what we call scratching the place that itches. Don't say I didn't warn you. If you want to get rid of that itch, you must hurry and immediately scratch the right place. That is, you must intensify your efforts to do good in order to get rid of your attachment and concern for all material things of this world. Possessions like wealth and property do not really belong to us. We lay claim to them in name only. 
In doing so, we overlook our true worth. The wealth we accumulate in this world can be used wisely to bring us some measure of happiness, but if we are very stupid, it can soon become a blazing fire that completely destroys us. The venerable individuals who transcended Dukkha in ages past did so by accumulating virtuous qualities within themselves until they became an important source of refuge for all of us. Perhaps you think they had no cherished possessions in those days. Do you honestly believe that wealth and beauty are something unique to the present day and age? Is that why you're so immoderate and self-indulgent? Is our country so lacking in cemeteries to cremate or bury the dead that you figure you won't have to die? Is that why you're so rashly overconfident? You are constantly worried about what you will eat and how you will sleep and how to keep yourself entertained, as if the world were about to vanish at any moment and take everything with it. So you rush around scooping up such a mass of useless stuff that you can hardly lug it all around. Even animals don't indulge themselves to that extent, so you shouldn't assume that you are so much more exalted and clever than they are. Such blind ignorance will only make matters much worse. Should you fall on hard times in the future, who knows? You may find yourself even more destitute than the animals you disparage. You should start laying the groundwork for a proper understanding of this matter right now, while you are still in a position to do so. I must apologize for speaking so harshly. But it is necessary to use harsh language to persuade people to abandon evil and do good. When nobody is willing to accept the truth, this world of ours will see the sasana come to an end. Virtually everyone has done a certain amount of gross, evil gamma in the past for which they must inevitably suffer the consequences. People who still do not understand this are unlikely to see their own faults enough to remedy the situation. Instead, they tend to fault the teaching for being too severe, and so the situation remains hopeless. At this point, the author would like to apologize to all you gentle readers for having been so presumptuous and indiscreet in what I've just written. My purpose was to preserve for posterity the way that Atsariyaman taught Dhamma on certain occasions. I tried to present it in a manner that reflected his speech as accurately as possible. I wanted to record it for the sake of those wishing to contemplate the truth of his teaching. Being thus reluctant to reduce the forcefulness of his remarks, I tried to disregard any qualms I had, and wrote precisely what he said. Wherever Atariyaman sojourned, people constantly came to see him about Tamma questions. Unfortunately, I cannot recall all the questions and answers that have been recounted to me over the years by monks who were present on those occasions. I noted down and remember only those answers which especially impressed me. I have forgotten those that failed to make a strong impression, and now they are gone. After a suitable interval, Atsariyaman left Nakon Rachasima to resume his journey to Odoantani. When his train pulled into the station at Korngan, a crowd of local people were waiting to invite him to break his journey there and stay in Korngan for a while. Since he was unable to accept the invitation, his devotees in Korngan were disappointed at missing the opportunity to meet with him. Finally arriving in Odoantani, Atsariyaman went to stay with Chao Kun Tamacheri at Wat Bodhisompon Monastery. People from the provinces of Nongkai and Sukun Nakon, as well as Udon Tani, were waiting there to pay their respects. From there he proceeded to Wat Nonni Wet Monastery, where he remained for the rainy season retreat. Once a week on observance day, during the rains retreat that year, Tsao Kun Tamateri took a group of public officials and other lay supporters to hear our Tsariyaman's Tamma talks in the evening. It was, of course, Chao Kun Tamachedi himself who had taken so much trouble to invite Atsariyaman to return to Udontani. He had trekked through the thick forests of Chiang Mai to personally offer that auspicious invitation. All of us who met Atsariyaman and heard his Tama after he arrived in Udontani owe Chao Kun Tamachedi a sincere debt of gratitude. Chao Kun Tamachedi was always keenly interested in the way of practice. He never tired of talking about Tamma, no matter how long the conversation lasted. He was especially appreciative when the Tamma discussion dealt with meditation practice. He felt great respect and affection for Atsariyaman. Therefore, he took a special interest in his well-being while he stayed in Udontani, constantly asking people who had seen Atsariyaman recently how he was getting along. In addition, he always encouraged people to meet with Atsariyaman and get to know him. He would even tirelessly escort those who did not dare go alone. His efforts in that respect were outstanding and truly admirable. During the dry season following the rains retreat, 
Atsariman preferred to wander off into the countryside, seeking seclusion where he could practice the way of Tamma in a manner most suitable to his character. He liked to stay in the vicinity of Ban Nong Nam Kem village, which was located about seven miles from the town of Udon Tani. He lived for long periods in this area because it had pleasant forests that were conducive to meditation practice. His presence in Udon Tani during the rains retreat greatly benefited both the monks and the general public from the town and surrounding districts. As news of his arrival spread, monks and lay people from the area gradually began to converge on the monastery where he resided in order to practice with him and hear his tamma. Most of these people had been disciples of his from the time he lived in the area before going to Chiang Mai. Upon receiving word that he had returned, they were overjoyed at the prospect of seeing him again, offering him alms and hearing his advice. He was not very old yet, being only about seventy then. He was still able to get around without much trouble. By nature he tended to be quick and agile anyway, always ready to get up and move on, never staying too long in one place. He much preferred to wander with no specific destination, hiking through the mountains and forests where life was peaceful and undisturbed. Past Lives In Udontani, just as they had in other places, the local people often came to Atsariaman with questions. While some of their questions were very similar to the ones that he had received many times before, the more unusual ones arose from the views and opinions of certain individuals. Among the more commonly asked questions were those dealing with past life associations of living beings who have developed virtuous qualities together over a period of many lives, and how such inherent character traits have continuity in their present lives. Other questions dealt with the past life associations of husbands and wives who had lived together happily for many lifetimes. Atsari Amun said that people had more doubts about these questions than any others. As for the first question, Atsari Amun did not specify the exact nature of what he was asked. He merely mentioned the question of past life associations in a general way and gave this explanation. Things like this must originate with the establishment of volitional intent for that determines the way the lives of specific individuals become interrelated. The second question was more specific. How is it possible to determine whether the love between a man and a woman has been preordained by previous association in lives past? How can we distinguish between a loving relationship based on past life connections and one which is not? Atsari Amun replied, It is very difficult to know with any certainty whether or not our love for this person or our relationship with that person, has its roots in a mutual affinity developed over many lifetimes. For the most part, people fall in love and get married rather blindly. Feeling hungry, a person's tendency is to just reach out and grab some food to satisfy that hunger. They will eat whatever is available as long as it is sufficient for their day-to-day -day needs. The same can be applied to past life associations as well. Although such relationships are a common feature of life in this world, it is not at all easy to find genuine cases of people who fall in love and get married simply due to a long-standing past life association. The problem is, the kileses that cause people to fall in love don't spare anyone's blushes, and they certainly don't wait patiently to give past life affinities a chance to have a say in the matter first. All the kileses ask is that there be someone of the opposite sex who suits their fancy. That's enough for passion to arise and impulsively grab a hold. Those gileses that cause people to fall in love can turn ordinary people into fighters who will battle desperately to the bitter end without respect for modesty or moderation, no matter what the consequences might be. Even if they see they have made a mistake, they will still refuse to admit defeat. Even the prospect of death cannot make them abandon their fighting style. This is what the gileses that cause people to fall in love are all about. Displaying themselves conspicuously in people's hearts, they are extremely difficult to control. Anyone who wants to be a reasonable, responsible person should avoid giving these gileses their head, never permitting them to charge on ahead unchecked. So you must exercise enough self-control to ensure that even if you know nothing about your past life associations, you will still have an effective means of reigning in your heart, a means of avoiding being dragged through the mire and down a steep, dark precipice. Unless you are an accomplished meditator with an aptitude for perceiving various types of phenomena, you will find it very difficult to access knowledge about your past lives. Whatever the case, you must always have enough presence of mind to maintain proper self-control. Don't let those offensive kileses burst their banks, 
pouring out like floodwaters with no levee to contain them. Thus you will be able to avoid sinking deep into the great quagmire of unbridled love. Questioner What should a husband and wife, who have lived together happily in this life, and wish to remain together in the next life, do to ensure that they'll be reborn together in the future? Is it enough that they both hold the same desire for meeting again in future lives? Acharyaman that desire merely creates the prospect of achieving one's intended objective. But if that desire is not accompanied by concrete action, it will not bring the expected results. Take the example of someone who desires to be rich. If that person is too lazy to go out and earn his wealth, then there is no way he'll ever be rich. To stand any chance of success, an intention must be supported by a concerted effort toward reaching that goal. It's the same with a husband and wife who wish to maintain their loving relationship, living together happily in each successive life. To avoid being separated, their viewpoints must be analogous, and they must remain faithful to each other. They must refrain from taking advantage of each other, because this destroys their mutual trust and leads to dissatisfaction. They must cherish virtue, behave properly, and trust each other. By establishing a mutual understanding about their partnership, and then making a sincere effort to foster their future together by doing what is beneficial to it, they can expect to fulfill that desire, for it is well within their power to do so. On the other hand, should the opposite hold true, with either the husband being good while the wife is bad, or vice versa, with one or the other doing only that which pleases him or her, then no matter how many hundreds of resolutions they make together, they will all come to naught. Their very actions will perforce undermine their desire. And what about you? Do you cherish the desire to be together with your wife above all other wishes? Questioner. I desire nothing more than the fulfillment of this wish. Wealth and all its trappings, rank, title, royal status, heavenly bliss, or spiritual attainment. None of these would mean anything without my wife, who is my one true love. This is the major focus of every person's desire, so we must wish for a loving mate first of all. Then other desires can be considered in due course. That is why I had to ask you about this matter first, although I was embarrassed and afraid you might scold me. Such is the reality of the world we live in, though people are often too shy to speak about it. Atsariyaman laughed. That being the case, you have to take your wife wherever you go, right? Questioner. I am ashamed to say that it's really concern about my wife that has prevented me from ordaining as a monk all this time. I am worried that she'd be awfully lonely with no one there to advise and reassure her. My children just bother her for money to buy things, making a nuisance of themselves all the time. I don't see how they can offer her any security or peace of mind. I can't help worrying about her. There's another thing I don't understand. The Tamma teaches that the heavenly realms are inhabited by both male and female devas, much like the human world. Beings there live a blissfully happy existence, enjoying a variety of pleasures that make it a very inviting place to live. But unlike here on earth or in the heavens, it seems that no distinction is made between male and female beings in the Brahma realms. Doesn't it get kind of lonely there? I mean, they have no one to cheer them up or humor them when they get in a bad mood, and Nibbana is even worse. There is no involvement with anything whatsoever. One is absolutely self-reliant in every way. Without the need to depend on anyone or anything for help, there is no need for one to become involved with others in any way. One is truly independent. But how can one possibly take pride in anything there? Ordinarily, someone reaching an exalted state like Nibbana should expect to be honored and praised by the other beings who live there, at least in the world, a prosperous person who has wealth and social status receives praise and admiration from his fellow human beings, but those going to Nibbana find only silence. There's no question of receiving praise and admiration from their peers, which makes me wonder how such total silence can truly be a state of happiness. Please forgive me for asking such a crazy, unorthodox question, but unless I find out from someone who really knows the answer, this dilemma will continue to trouble me to no end. Atsariyaman. The heavenly realms, the Brahma realms, and Nibbana are not reserved for skeptics like you. They are reserved for those who can realize their own true inner worth, 
Only such people realize the value of the heavenly realms, the Brahma realms and Nibbana, because they understand that the value of each successive realm increases relative to the virtuous qualities inherent in those who would attain them. Somebody like you can hardly dream of attaining such states. Even if you wanted to, you wouldn't be able to go as long as your wife was still around. Were she to die, you would still be unable to stop yearning for her long enough to start wishing for a heavenly existence. The way you feel, even the exalted Brahma realms and Nibbana cannot compare with your wife, since those states cannot take care of you like she can. Thus you don't want to go, because you are afraid that you will lose the one who takes care of all your needs. Acharyaman and his questioner both laughed heartily. Then Acharyaman continued, Even the kinds of happiness we experience here in the human world vary widely according to individual preferences. It is comparable to the way our sense faculties, which coexist in the same physical body, deal with different types of sensations. For example, the eyes prefer to see forms, the ears prefer to hear sounds, the nose prefers smells, the tongue prefers tastes, the body prefers tactile sensations, while the mind prefers to perceive mental objects, each according to its own natural bias. They can't all be expected to have the same preference. Partaking of a good meal is one way to find pleasure. Living happily married together is yet another form of pleasure. The world has never been short of pleasant experiences, for they are an indispensable part of life that living beings everywhere feel obliged to pursue. There are forms of happiness experienced here on earth. There are others experienced in the heavenly realms, and still others in the Brahma realms. Then there is the happiness of Nibbana, which is experienced by those who have totally eradicated the vexatious gilesas from their hearts. Their happiness is something entirely different from the worldly happiness of those with gilesas. If the happiness you receive from your wife's company is really all you need, then why bother looking at sights or listening to sounds? Why bother eating or sleeping? Why bother developing virtuous qualities by giving donations, maintaining morality, or doing meditation? All you need to do is live with your wife, and let that happiness be the sum of all happiness you would otherwise receive from these sources. You could save yourself a lot of trouble that way, but can you actually do it? Questioner. Oh, no, sir. How could I possibly do that? What about all those times when we quarrel with each other? How could I make all my happiness dependent on her alone? That would just complicate my life even more. Atsariyaman said this man had a rather bold, forthright character, and, for a layman, he had a very keen interest in moral virtue. He was deeply devoted to Acharyaman, who usually made an effort to give him special attention. This man used to come to see Acharyaman and casually start up a conversation when there were no other visitors around. Normally, other people could not bring themselves to ask Acharyaman the kinds of questions he did. He was extremely fond of his wife and children, while his fond devotion for Acharyaman made him a frequent visitor at the monastery. If he came and found Acharyaman with visitors, he would simply pay his respects then go off to help the monks with the air of someone who feels quite at home in a monastery. He chose those occasions when no visitors were present. He chose those occasions when no visitors were present to ask the questions that intrigued him, and Acharyaman was kind enough to oblige him nearly every time. Acharyaman was exceptionally clever at recognizing a person's basic character traits, and treated each individual according to his assessment. Whether speaking casually or giving a discourse, he always tailored his remarks to fit the audience, as you can no doubt see from what I have written so far. While Atsariyaman lived at Wat Nonibet Monastery in Udontani, numerous monks came to seek his guidance, and many spent the rains retreat under his tutelage. In those days, Wat Nonibet Monastery was a much quieter place than it is today. There was very little traffic back then, and very few people came to visit. By and large, people who did come to the monastery were those with a genuine interest in making merit and developing virtuous qualities. Unlike nowadays, when people tend to come and disturb the monks' peaceful environment whether they intend to or not. Back then, monks could practice as they pleased without disturbance. Consequently, many monks developed themselves spiritually, becoming a source of contentment not only to themselves, but also to the local people who looked to monks for refuge. Atsariyaman instructed the monks in the evening. He usually began with a general explanation of moral virtue, followed by samadhi and then wisdom, going briefly through them stage by stage until the highest level of absolute freedom, the essential goal of tamma. He then went back and gave a comprehensive exposition 
of how a monk should practice to attain the various stages of tamma that he had outlined. For monks engaged in meditation practice, he always emphasized the vital importance of mindful adherence to the monastic code of discipline. Only a monk who is firm in his discipline and respectful of all the training rules can be considered a full-fledged monk. He should not transgress the minor training rules merely because he considers them to be somehow insignificant. Such negligence indicates someone who feels no shame about immoral behavior, and it may eventually lead to more serious transgressions. A monk must strictly adhere to the monastic code of discipline to make sure that his moral behavior is not punctuated with unsightly blemishes or gaps. In that way, he feels comfortable and confident living among his peers. He need never be concerned that his teacher or his fellow monks will be critical or reproachful. For the inner monk in your heart to reach perfection, starting from Sota Panna and progressing to Arhant, you must be steady and relentless in your effort to attain each successive level of both Samadhi and wisdom. If you persevere in this manner, these faculties will arise and continue to develop until they are able to scrub clean that filthy mess of defilements in your heart. A monk's conduct and speech should be absolutely above reproach. His chitta should be absolutely superb by virtue of the tamma qualities that he develops step by step. Samati, banya, vimutti, and vimutti nyarna dasana. A monk should never be dreary or sad. He should never appear undignified, shunning his fellows because a guilty conscience is eating away inside him, troubling his heart. This is contrary to the way of the Lord Buddha, whose splendid internal conduct and external behavior were irreproachable. Following in his footsteps, a monk must muster the resolute courage to abandon all evil and do only good. He must be a man of integrity who is honest with himself and his peers, while being faithful to the tamma and the discipline. He will thus be supported by his exemplary practice everywhere he goes. The brightness of his mindfulness and wisdom will light the way, as his heart will be suffused with the taste of tamma. He will never find himself trapped in a state of delusion with no means of escape. Such are the characteristics inherent in a true disciple of the Lord Putta. Study them carefully and take them to heart. Adhere closely to them as the basis for a bright, trouble-free future, when you can claim them as your own valuable personal possessions. This was how Atsari Amman usually instructed practicing monks. Monks who had doubts or questions about their practice could consult individually with Acharyaman during the day when the time did not conflict with his daily routine. His daily life had a regular pattern that he tended to follow without fail wherever he stayed. Rising from his meditation seat early in the morning, he walked meditation outside his hut until it was time to go on alms round. After collecting alms food in the village and eating his morning meal, he again walked meditation until noon and then took a short rest. Once rested, he sat in meditation for a while before continuing his walking meditation until 4 p.m. At 4, he swept the open areas around his residence. When he finished, he bathed, and again practiced walking meditation for many hours. Upon leaving his meditation track, he entered his hut to do several hours of chanting. Following that, he again sat in meditation late into the night. Normally, he slept no more than four hours a night. On special occasions he went entirely without sleep, sitting in meditation until dawn. When he was young, he displayed a diligence in his practice that none of his contemporaries could match. Even in old age he maintained his characteristic diligence, although he did relax a bit due to his strength, which declined with each passing day. But he differed significantly from the rest of us in that his mind showed no signs of weakness even as his health gradually deteriorated. Such was the life of a great man who set a perfect example for us all. He never neglected his personal responsibilities, nor did he relax the relentless effort which had been such an important source of strength, spurring him on to that gratifying victory deep in the mountains of Chiang Mai, as we have seen. As human beings, we all possess attributes that should allow us to duplicate Atsariyaman's achievement. In actual practice, those able to achieve the kind of unqualified success that he did are far and few between. Despite the fact that the world is now grossly overpopulated, very few people indeed will see their hopes fulfilled by attaining this exalted goal. In the present age, such an attainment is very rare. The outstanding difference between someone like Atsariyaman and the rest of us 
is the degree of diligence and determination he applied to the pursuit of knowledge and understanding, an effort firmly grounded in the four ittipada, chanda, virya, citta, and vimangsa. And when the causes are so different, the results are bound to be radically different as well, so much so that it's almost unbelievable how varied they can be from one person to the next. But the good and bad results that people receive from their actions are evident everywhere in the world around us, and they cannot be denied. We must acknowledge the obvious, that a mixture of goodness and evil, happiness and suffering, arises in each and every one of us. There is no way we can divest ourselves of them. Among modern-day Acharyas, Acharya Man's life story is splendidly unique. A rich story, it flowers and bears fruit from beginning to end. Magnificent every step of the way, it is a life worthy of everyone's heartfelt respect. He is now revered.